the state government as well. And he does up the house, right? You see people do this. They buy a house and then they remodel. So he had the inside and the outside worked on. Uh, on the outside, he put on the cupola so that, you know, that little square thing on the top of the roof line. Um, he put on that portico in the front and he paints it yellow. Uh, he also puts on the porch, which at the time he called a piazza because it was supposed to be Italianate, right? All these little features that he's adding. And he adds the fence and the hedge. It was an extensive piece of property. So about three acres on this side of the street and a 10 acre meadow on the opposite side of the street. Uh, next door, the following year, he builds another house for his son, Austin, who married Susan Gilbert, who was a friend of Emily's and Lavinia's and Austin's. And so they marry and they move next door into a brand new house called the Evergreen. So an Italianate built from scratch. This has a whole like bell tower in the middle. And the Evergreens, Austin and Susan, you know, they gardened, they landscaped in the latest style. And there is a path and there was a path that connected the two houses behind the fence and hedge. So it was like a family compound. Here's a little map to kind of place you. Uh, I love old maps. So the circle is around the homestead and next door is the evergreens and we'll get there. Here's the Dickinson Meadow. Uh, you can see to the bottom left, there's a factory. So within easy sight of the Dickinson home is the hat factory. They manufactured palm hats. Uh, you can also just make out the train tracks. Uh, her father was instrumental in bringing the train to Amherst, which was very important at the time. And then if you look to the top, you can see that cemetery I mentioned. And where it says Mount Pleasant, that would go in on the left-hand side to where their old house was uh, on North Pleasant Street. And there's the evergreens. And again, it's just a brief walk to town. The town was the town center is just off the map there. Uh, her father added to the now uh, kind of old new house a conservatory for the for growing plants in the winter. It wasn't to be a four season greenhouse. This was really for the cold weather months. Uh, Emily loved this little glass room. She called it the little garden off the dining room. And it actually, um, it's on top of a, a dining room window that you would open to keep it heated in the winter. And there's a doorway that comes through her father's study. Uh, Dickinson wrote about some of the plants that they grew there. She loved to force bulbs. Again, I'll hold up. You know, now is a good time of year to be forcing bulbs. These are some paper whites, um, but she especially liked to force hyacinth bulbs, uh, which are not hard to force either. But her niece later recalled her uh, her Aunt Emily forcing hyacinths and then bringing them up to her bedroom windows and having sort of a rainbow of fragrance, if you will. In describing the conservatory, Dickinson once wrote to a friend, I have but to cross the floor to stand in the spice aisles, right? And if you think about walking into a greenhouse, uh, in the winter. Uh, it's just that wonderful redolent smell of plants and sort of moist soil. I love that, you know, to stand in the spice aisles. And she grew doxalis and fuchsia and all sorts of things uh, in the winter. And then the plants would go out onto the piazza for the summer. Uh, and she's always loved geranium. So more of those scented geraniums. 
And then they gardened on the long slope that extends to the east side of the house. Uh, it's different today. Uh, unfortunately, there are no pictures or drawings of what the garden looked like back in the day. So we just do the best we can. Uh, that big oak tree that you see that sort of overhangs the garden uh, was planted by her brother. So it's, you know, what, 150 years old. So it's quite quite big and does also throw a lot of shade. Uh, on the right hand side, I noticed some peonies which are up. Um, I'm not sure if they're the original peonies. Chances are they could be. Uh, also, there are lilacs on the property because they both last really forever unless you dig them up and throw them away. So we like to think so anyway. Here's a short poem. My garden like the beach denotes there be a sea. That's summer, such as these, the pearls she fetches, such as me. And so again, her garden uh, poetry is often metaphorical. You know, are, are these uh, pearls, are they poems? Are they people? Are they flowers? You know, or are they all three? And that's part of the fun of poetry. Of her favorite flowers, I would say probably the rose. It certainly appears more often than any single uh, flower in her poems and letters. And her niece left a list of the various kinds of roses that they grew in the garden. So we've been trying to add those back in, you know, get them from antique rose suppliers and get them going again. We've had great success with the blush noisette. Uh, it came from an online supplier and came basically like a stick with a few roots on it. Uh, and within a season or two, we had to put up that pyramidal trellis and this, it blooms and blooms and is quite fragrant. So if you want to try one old garden rose, try to find the blush noisette. Now, Emily Dickinson was also a baker, uh, and I also like to bake. I actually baked a batch of cookies this morning, and this was one of her recipes. So if you're looking for instructions, uh, you're going to be disappointed. This was for a coconut cake. Um, I worked <laughs> with a woman, and we did a workshop on pressing flowers and making the, one of the Dickinson cakes. She made this coconut cake, and I will tell you to hand grate a coconut, a fresh coconut is a lot of work. Um, but uh, she, this woman who was the, the baker of, of us, she said, you know, uh, some of Dickinson's poems are like recipes. They just have this list of ingredients. And here's one example where she writes, to, take, to make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee one clover and a bee and reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few. Now, of course, she did not live on a prairie. And this, if you're a pollinator person, this isn't actually true, but I think it's still a lovely little poem. Now, she didn't live on a prairie, but she did have a meadow across the street. So th this is looking in another direction across the Dickinson Meadow. Uh, so you don't see the hat factory, but you do see Amherst College. So again, from Emily Dickinson's bedroom, which was at the front of the house facing Main Street, she would have seen Amherst College every day and seen this meadow. And so one of the neighbors wrote this, the meadow was always full of birds and bees and butterflies, uh, especially when they hadn't just hayed it because that's what the meadow was really used for to cut hay for the livestock. The Dickinson homestead had a barn that no longer is, is there. And you know, you have to think of it also as fairly farmy. There was also a really extensive vegetable garden. 
At any rate, it's pretty in all seasons. Uh, Dickinson wrote poetry about all of the different seasons, uh, about autumn, about winter. This is a period photograph that's in the Yale University Library of the Evergreen. So this would be looking toward the homestead, towards you know where Emily Dickinson lived, from where her brother lived. Uh, and it's a lovely picture and gives you an idea of the landscape at the time. And here's one Dickinson winter poem. Winter is good. His horror delights italic flavor yield to intellects inebriate with summer or the world, generic as a quarry and hardy as a rose, invited with asperity, but welcome when he goes. I always feel that way about winter, too. I like it, but I'm happy when it goes. Now, later in life, uh, really toward the end of her life, Emily Dickinson met a new friend whose name was Mabel Loomis Todd. Um, Mabel was married to a professor um, of astronomy at Amherst College. So they moved to town. He's going to take up a teaching post. And she gets friendly, they both get friendly with the Dickinson family as a whole. Uh, she is, she, Mabel, is very talented. So she writes, she paints, she plays the piano and sings. She was quite pretty. Um, and she would come to the homestead and play the piano. They, they had a, a nice piano. Uh, Emily played the piano as well. Uh, she would sing. She and Emily never met face to face. Uh, Emily would not come in the room when Mabel was there. By this time of Emily Dickinson's life in the 1880s, she, hit, she was now quite reclusive. Um, really, only saw you know the family and the household staff, um, and. Yet they did correspond, even though they essentially lived across the street from one another, uh, and they exchanged things. So uh, Emily Dickinson would send Mabel you know, flowers. She would send her a poem or a letter. Uh, Mabel sent Emily Dickinson this picture of Indian pipes. Indian pipes, there's a, a photograph of Indian pipes. You may have seen them. They're, they're a strange little saprophyte, so it's a kind of like a, you know, a fungusy thing. I, um, it, so it doesn't photosynthesize. It's not green, but it exchanges, um, you know, nutrients with the roots that it grows on from other plants. And when Emily Dickinson gets this, she writes to Mabel and says that without suspecting it, you should send me the preferred flower of life seems almost supernatural. And she talks about finding Indian pipes when she was a child. She writes, I still cherish the clutch with which I bore it from the ground when a wandering child an unearthly booty, they do look sort of unearthly, and maturity only enhances mystery, never decreases it. And, you know, it just, I, that almost gives me shivers. <laughs> now, Emily Dickinson died in the 1880s. Uh, on her death certificate, it says that she died of Bright's disease, which is a kidney disease. Um, you know, no one is really sure. Uh, she was buried in West Cemetery, so basically just behind the house, the uh, Irish um, sort of workers who worked on the property carried her coffin up to West Cemetery to be buried. And after the funeral, uh, her sister Lavinia had been asked by Emily to burn all of her papers. And Lavinia goes back and burns all of the letters Emily Dickinson ever read. So those are all gone. We only know half of her correspondence, the ones she sent. Uh, and then Lavinia finds about 40 little booklets, hand sewn, handwritten, of poems. Now, they all knew Emily Dickinson wrote poems. She shared them with people readily, uh, but they had no idea of the volume of poems. There were something like 500 poems that Emily had carefully copied out and again, sewn together into books. 
And Vinny said, I got this Joan of Arc feeling that, you know, she had to get these into print. So she starts taking them around to people and eventually goes to Mabel Loomis Todd of the Indian Pipes. And Mabel, who is, again, pretty and vivacious and very convincing, goes to Thomas Wentworth Higginson of the Daylilies and convinces him that they should do a volume of Dickinson's poems. And so the first volume comes out four years after Dickinson's death. Uh, note the Indian pipes on the cover. Remember, Mabel has edited po the poems. She actually transcribed them all from Emily Dickinson's handwriting, which is not great, on a little old-fashioned typewriter. And they're published. They are popular. And so two more volumes follow, as well as a couple of volumes of Emily Dickinson's letters, which Mabel also starts to collect from people that sh knew Dickinson. And so that is how Emily Dickinson became known to the broader public. It was all after her death. Now, should you get up to Amherst and one of these days we will all, you know, be vaccinated and get out there and go back to museums, uh, it, there's a lot to see at the Emily Dickinson Museum. It includes both the homestead uh, and now the newly uh, restored conservatory as well as the evergreens. So the conservatory was demolished. It was probably kind of falling down in 1917 by uh, the family that bought it uh, from Dickinson's last surviving niece, the last member of that extended family. Uh, they took it down uh, in good New England fashion, they reused the windows in a garage that they built on the property and they stored the old doors in the rafters of that new garage. So to a great degree, the restored conservatory uh, you know, is uh, put back together again. And so now you can step through uh, Mr. Dickinson's study and step right into the conservatory, or as she called it, you know, in the, into the spice aisles. And they've put out uh, a lovely selection of plants uh, that Dickinson knew and grew. Uh, and they are all potted up in uh, a Connecticut potter's uh, pots. His name is Guy Wolf, and he's very famous for doing these reproduction pots. The bedroom, uh, so again, her bedroom is at the front of the house. It's a very bright room. But when I first went there and, you know, for a couple of decades after that, it was papered in sort of a beige paisley. It was very bland. Uh, and it kind of looked like a room that someone who wore white would be sitting in. And they did a reconstruction of the bedroom, took it down to the studs so that they could move the doors back to where they had been when the Dickinsons lived there. And underneath a molding, they found a scrap of the original wallpaper and had it reproduced. And look, it's as if she was writing in a garden. So she may have worn white, uh, but she certainly had color and flowers all around her. Uh, there's the side of the house. That's Austin's um, big white oak tree. And the garden, we do the best we can. I try to go up there every year, sadly not last summer, uh, and help them. And we organize a group of volunteers um, and uh, divide the plants and plant annuals. And, you know, you can see I do not wear white when I am gardening. I don't know if Emily Dickinson did. <laughs> and I'll just close with this poem. Uh, it's about Clematis or Clematis, depending on who taught you how to say it, um, and about the seeds of Clematis. And it goes like this. Tis customary as we part a trinket to confer. It helps to stimulate the faith when lovers be afar. Tis various as the various taste. Clematis journeying far presents me with a single curl of her electric hair. 
Uh, and if you look on the left, that is um, the seed pod forming. And it is sort of like electric hair. I just uh, think that's marvelous. And so with that, uh, I will again thank the Darien Library. Uh, there is the daguerreotype in its case. You often don't see the case, but it, there is a little leaf uh, embossed in the velvet. Uh, that uh, daguerreotype is in the Amherst College uh, rare book collection. So I'll just stop my share there and see what kind of questions you have. You can put them right in the chat if you have any questions you'd like to ask. From Barbara, did you grow your Christmas roses indoors or are you in a warmer climate? My light just went off. I'm looking <laughs> for ways to extend the season and garden indoors. My hellebores won't show up until April in my garden. Okay, so there are two kinds of hellebores. Uh, the ones that I are probably the kind that you are growing, which is the Lenten rose. Uh, there's a different species that's the Christmas rose. So they're both Helleborus, and one of them is Helleborus orientalis, which is uh, the sense oriental, right? That's the April blooming one. This one that I'm, is in bloom here, and it's outdoor bloom, is Helleborus niger. And that's called the Christmas rose because if you have a fairly warm um, early winter, it will bloom at Christmas, which always seems astonishing. In fact, it's, it's in my little front garden and I always think it looks somewhat fake because, because there are these white blooms coming up out of the ground. So just try to find a Helleborus niger. Uh, this one is the, the variety is called Joseph Lemper. Ask your nursery if they can get you some. And that should help. Also, I do have some early snowdrops that are in bloom. Uh, but you just, again, you have to get different varieties and some of them bloom earlier. I garden in Chatham, New Jersey, which is solidly zone six. So I'm not sure. I think Darien's zone six as well. Uh, there's also a comment from Barbara. It occurs to me that white would have set off her red hair. So not such a colorless woman, perhaps, question mark. Okay. Yes, and, uh, you know, if you read her writing, and uh, I would very much suggest, in addition to poems, read some of her letters. She was far from color colorless. Uh, you know, she had strong opinions, uh, and she had um, strong expectations that her friends would keep in touch with her in a, you know, in a certain way, and, and in, you know, regularly. Uh, a, a friend, a mutual friend of uh, she and Vinny had written a joint letter, you know, addressed to both of them. And Emily Dickinson responded, a mutual plum is not a plum. You know, like, don't be sending me like a joint letter. I want my own letter. <laughs> there was another uh, comment earlier from Sharon. I went to Amherst and you couldn't really avoid Emily Dickinson. That is true. Uh, I and it's also true if there are any Mount Holyoke uh, grads in the, in the audience, because uh, Emily Dickinson did attend Mount Holyoke for one year. So she is one of their famous alums. Um, I have a question. Do you think the house is open now or we'd no. just have to check? Oh, it's closed. Okay. No, it's not open. Um, the programs I've been doing with them since the onset of the pandemic have all been virtual. They did their um, uh, poetry festival was virtual, uh, which includes every year, if you're interested in Dickinson, they do a Emily Dickinson marathon and read 18, all 1800 wow. plus poems. Um, so this year it was all online and it was actually wonderful because there were people from all over the world uh, that read poems uh, in a virtual room. Um, normally it's at the homestead and so you, you have to physically be there and take turns and you know you have a book or borrow a book. Um, 
but this really worked out well um, and they have a lot of interesting programming too so they do a lot of you know they do new poetry as well so uh, when the museum is open if you are a writer or an artist you know a creative person and want to um, it sounds a little funny to say it, but if you want to rent Emily Dickinson's bedroom <laughs> you can you can arrange to sit in the room they set up a card table and a you know a kind of card table type chair uh, and you can sit in the room for an hour and work which I've done it's a it's a marvelous thing uh, and just have an hour of time to meditate or work um, that sounds delightful yeah uh, we also have a thank you from Allie uh, just saying she received this book as a gift and thank you for the event Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. And I'm sure that the library has a copy that, you know, that will circulate as well. Yep. Um, so. Yep. And one more thank you from Andrea. So I think you've been well received this morning, as has Emily. And thank you for sharing your morning with us. They're always so interesting. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. All right. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening at Darien Library to explore Untermeyer Gardens, which are located on the, above the Hudson River in Yonkers, New York. Uh, built in 1917 by Samuel Untermeyer, by the 1920s, the gardens were considered the most spectacular in America. This evening's program will examine the magnificent design of the garden, the fascinating history of Samuel and Minnie Untermeyer, and the story of the garden's periods of glory, ruin, and rebirth. Leading us on this evening's tour is Steve Byrne, president of the Untermeyer Garden Conservancy, which he established in 2011. A graduate of Princeton and Columbia, Burns was a founding partner of BKSK Architects. He was appointed by Mayor Bloomberg to the land to the uh, commissioner of the New York City Landmark Preservation Commission, and he also served on the board of Wave Hill. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this, as well as our collections, available to the community. And I hope everyone's ready to visit the extraordinary beauty that is the Untermeyer Gardens. I'm now going to pass the mic over to Steve. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to uh, be, here be here before you, not in Darien, but in spirit. Um, I started the Conservancy uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I have been had been practicing architecture for 30 years at the time. Uh, five years ago, I left my firm uh, and am running the Conservancy full time uh, in Yonkers. Let me just push this button here. There we go. Uh, the Conservancy works in a public-private partnership with the city of Yonkers, which owns uh, the property. Uh, this is an article from a Baltimore newspaper in the 1920s, in which it was called the most spectacular garden in America. 
Uh, at the south end of the property was a gigantic stone mansion built during the Civil War by John Waring, who was the largest manufacturer of hats in the world. Unfortunately, he went bankrupt about 10 years later, and it was sold to uh, Samuel Tilden. Tilden was the governor of New York. He ran for president of the United States and won the popular election, but was denied the presidency through the Electoral College. As a result, he withdrew from public life uh, and lived here until his death. Uh, in, uh, then it was purchased by Samuel and Minnie Untermeyer in 1899. Samuel Untermeyer was born in Lynchburg, Virginia in 1858. Uh, his father died right after the Civil War and his mother, who was therefore the widow, had a little bit of money, and she moved with her children up to New York City, where she bought a tenement on the Lower East Side and ran a kosher, kosher boarding house. Um, Samuel was one of her kids. Uh, he was kind of a of small stature, but larger than life, brilliant, high energy, very ambitious. He graduated from high school when he was like 15, from college when he was 18 and then from law school when he was 20. In fact, he had to grow a beard to make him look older than he was because he wasn't legally able to practice law at age 20. Um, by 19... Uh, uh, 12, well, let me, let me go back to, to Minnie for a second. So in, in, um, in the 1880s, uh, he met Minnie. Uh, Minnie uh, was Lutheran. Uh, so he was Jewish and she was Christian, and this was a totally taboo relationship back then. Uh, in fact, they had two children out of wedlock, but they really loved each other and they got married and then proceeded to have a couple of more children. Uh, he became one of the most successful lawyers in America, the first lawyer to make like approximately a million dollar fee in around 1905, which was a lot of money back then. And as brilliant a lawyer as he was, he may have been even a better investor, so became fabulously wealthy. In 1912, uh, he had made so much money that, uh, and he had a mansion on Fifth Avenue, that's where he lived in the city, so the Yonkers property, which is 150 acres, was a country house. Um, uh, uh, by 1912, he had made so much money that he decided to do more work on behalf of the people. And he was named the lead prosecutor for the Pujo investigation, which was a congressional uh, investigation into how certain very, very wealthy robber barons were controlling and manipulating the economy to their benefit. So as a result of this, um, he interrogated John D. Rockefeller on the left, who was so brilliant that he was successfully able to evade Untermeyer's questions, probably the only person in history who was able to do that. He very much respected Rockefeller. And then also the man on the right, J.P. Morgan. Uh, J.P. Morgan, like a lot of Christians back then, was a pretty anti-Semitic guy and did not like this Samuel Untermeyer. In fact, they'd had a long-standing rivalry. Uh, Unter uh, uh, Morgan was very proud, among other things, of his pet collies, his dog collection, and he bred them and, com and competed them and often won the blue ribbon. Uh, so Untermeyer decided he also was going to raise collies to compete against Morgan. And this went back, you know, eight, ten years before the Pujo investigation. And there was a national uh, competition between the Untermeyer and the Morgan Kennels. It was covered by the national press. There was a bubble in the pet collie market, you, a, a, a very high quality uh, collie would cost the equivalent of like $50,000 today. And Untermeyer started winning the prizes. So they knew each other when <laughs> they had this hearing in DC and Untermeyer really lashed into JP Morgan, who was in his older age, he was maybe 70, 72 years old and said some things that probably she shouldn't have said and the national press just leapt on him and really accused him of being this, really this horrible ogre. And he was very rattled by it and uh, decided to leave the country with his wife to get away. Uh, and they went to Rome and where he died uh, two months later. And the Morgan family in, in fact held 
uh, Samuel Untermyer responsible for the death of J.P. Morgan. And no sooner did Morgan die than Untermyer got rid of his collies. He really had no interest in the dogs whatsoever other than to beat J.P. Morgan. And so as a result of uh, the, uh, the Pujo investigation, the, the uh, Federal, Federal Reserve uh, Bank was established, as well as the Sherman Clayton Act. So some very important uh, economic reforms. And you'll see time and again, uh, Untermeyer was sort of a progressive figure, very independent minded, along with his wife, who was often um, on the right side of history. Um, uh, the man on the left is another uh, notorious anti-Semite named Henry Ford. And the man on the right is Herman Bernstein, who was a well-known journalist. And uh, Henry Ford had a newspaper in which he accused uh, Herman Bernstein of being in, in league with the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was a falsehood that held that the Jews uh, we're going to take over the world through the banking system and through the media. And um, uh, so he sued Henry Ford. Uh, Untermeyer was his lawyer, and Ford had to shut down his newspaper. Here's Minnie. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Minnie and he were married, we think, in what is now Central Synagogue. They must have been a very liberal rabbi. Um, she was a very interesting person in her own right um, and uh, an important figure in New York cultural circles. In 1909, she and a handful of other people uh, ha helped save the New York Philharmonic. I, uh, excuse me, I'm going to uh, not talk about that. I'm going to talk about this. Uh, in 19... 10 or right around then, uh, the suffrage movement had really picked up speed in New York State. And um, it was a very, very expensive uh, 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 enterprise. And Samuel Untermeyer was one of 10 people, uh, 10 men in New York who helped uh, finance the movement. Uh, Minnie wasn't so sure that she wanted the right to vote. And he said, no, honey, you do want to vote. So she joined the movement when she did. Uh, there was a big article in the New York Times, Mrs. Samuel Untermeyer, you know, joins the suffragettes. So another example of them being sort of ahead of, uh, ahead of their time. Um, so again, back to the New York Philharmonic, uh, Minnie was uh, one of several people who brought in Gustav Mahler to be the conductor of the, of the orchestra. Um, he only was there a few years, uh, uh, and he, uh, they, they really established a very warm friendship. Uh, he became very sick, uh, and she, it was she who took him and his wife to the harbor, to the docks in New York, where he mounted a ship to return to Europe to die. And he sent her a beautiful letter saying, of all the people he had known in New York, he was going to miss her more than anybody. Uh, she was president of the American Society of Poetry. Uh, there are poetry readings that took place at the garden. She was uh, also a patron of modern dance uh, and, and progressive music. So in 1916, uh, Untermeyer bought an adjacent mansion and decided he wanted to build a garden there. And what does he do? He goes to William Wells Bosworth, the architect who had designed Kaikat for the Rockefeller family, both the house and the garden. The Rockefellers, of course, were the richest family in the world. And so he hired their architect to outdo the Rockefellers. And there is a letter in the Rockefeller family archives from Bosworth to John D. Rockefeller Jr. many years later saying a man walked into my office named Samuel Untermeyer and he asked me to design the finest garden in the world. So this is a plan of the garden. Um, the Hudson River is at the top. Uh, the mansion uh, was on the left. So the property sort of over the years grew to the north, to the right, and he owned a lot of the land across the street as well, totaling about 150 acres. So the mansion was on the left. You can see what was a Persian garden on the right. We'll talk about that. Off of that was a long skinny staircase going down the hillside called the Vista. Uh, next to the Vista was a series of terrace gardens called the Color Gardens. At the bottom of the Vista was a, a chain of gardens going north, which were the Rose and Dahlia Gardens. And then finally, at the far north was a series of five terraced gardens going down called the uh, vegetable or Italian gardens. 
Uh, you can see uh, that there was a carriage trail that went up from Warburton Avenue at the top. It swirled up towards a lower gatehouse then continued back and forth with various switchbacks to the mansion. The main entrance to the mansion, however, was on North Broadway at the bottom. Uh, uh, you can see uh, to the, near the mansion was the Temple of Love, a sundial, and a rock garden. This is what it looks like today. Uh, the mansion is gone. Um, you can see the retaining wall. If you look at the little circle in front of the mansion, remember that for later, a cardiac hospital was built on the left, which would later became a children's home. On the far right is St. John's Hospital, which is a large hospital, and then where the, the Italian or vegetable gardens were, a nursing home was built. So there have been some significant losses. However, there's still a lot that remains. Uh, so the walled garden, uh, as I mentioned, is a Persian garden. Persian barred gardens go back thousands of years, at least to the time of Cyrus the Great, who is the first great Persian emperor. He built this garden in Iran around 550 BC. It's based on the idea of paradise, and the word paradise comes from a Persian word paradisa, which means surrounded by a wall. So they were rectangular enclosures, which and had water kind of flowing in channels around it. Um, in, in this particular one, it had a water channel going from right to left, and a, a, and a cross axis, probably just of trees going in north south. There are various palaces around and pavilions around the garden, so you can look out. Uh, at the garden. So this is the oldest garden for which we have any archaeological evidence. Um, uh, uh, about 800 years later, uh, Muhammad was born, and this land goes from being Zoroastrian, which was the religion of the Persian Empire, to Islamic. And so this is a uh, hypothetical archaeological reconstruction of a garden at Shiz, um, which was built in the very early periods of the Islamic uh, you know, conquest. And uh, you can see it's surrounded by a wall, which is crenellated. Uh, the circular pool is not a feature of Persian gardens. It happened to have been one here. But behind the circle, you can see these crisscrossing water canals. And that is what you look for as being very typical of Persian gardens. And behind that, a great sort of arched entrance. At Untermeyer here in Yonkers, you can see the crenellated wall. Uh, the, the corner turrets are um, a sort of a later evolution with the Indian gardens, but again, you see the main central turret. And at the main central turret is a relief of Artemis over the front door. What's fascinating is that Cyrus the Younger, who was Cyrus the Great's grandson, also built a garden. Um, that has long been lost, but there's an ancient description of it that survives. And, Art and, and Cyrus the Younger placed a relief of Artemis over the front door. Most people think of her as the Greek goddess of the hunt. She's associated with nature and fertility, but before she was a Greek goddess, she was a Persian goddess. So when you pass through those gates, you imagine that you're passing into the gates of paradise. When you go through those gates on the left, uh, you can see an interesting formation in the stone, a horizontal block of stone and a triangle on top of that. That is a reference by Bosworth to the Lion's Gate in Mycenae. So this is in Greece. And what's interesting about the garden is while the, the primary inspiration of the garden was Persian or, or Indo-Persian as, as Bosworth called it, um, there's also kind of a, a, a Greco-Roman overlay. So it's sort of like an east meets west idea. So on the right is this Mycenaean gate, which is pre-Hellenistic around 1200 BC. Uh, the, here we're looking to the main gate uh, with the crisscrossing characteristic water uh, canals in front of you, and these two magnificent weeping beaches on either side, uh, which have this sort of curtain of, of foliage dropping down, almost like an arboreal waterfall as you enter. It's very, very magnificent. Two of the most beautiful trees you will ever see.
Um, so when uh, uh, these gardens, which uh, originated in Iran uh, and then became Islamic gardens, when, when Islam spread around, it went west, of course, across the top of Africa into Spain, into uh, in, uh, in the, one, of the, one of the greatest gardens in Europe is the Alhambra. And this is uh, one of the, the gardens of the Alhambra. It only has a singular sort of canal going down, but you can see the, the crenellated tower beyond, and in the foreground, uh, a stone basin, which would be the source of that canal or river. And so these rivers um, uh, symbolize, under Islam, the uh, rivers of life, uh, which are milk, water, honey, and wine. Uh, but the idea of paradise, which would have been more Zoroastrian, uh, over time uh, uh, morphs into the idea of the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden is described in the book of Genesis uh, and is a Jewish, Christian, and Muslim belief. And in the, uh, the Bible, uh, it describes uh, four rivers in the Garden of Eden, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Gihon, and the Pishon rivers. So the four canals symbolize the four rivers of paradise, the four rivers of life under Islam, the four quadrants of land that are defined by the four rivers symbolize the four elements, uh, uh, earth, air, fire, and water. They symbolize the four cardinal directions, uh, symbolizing the availability of paradise to the whole world. Um, and the, the shrubs, actually, that we have planted, the rhythmic planting along the canals itself, symbolize the souls of the saved peoples whose roots are nourished by the rivers of paradise. So there's this whole cosmic understanding and, and, and universal understanding of the Garden of Eden. So again, in the foreground, you can see that source of one of the rivers, which is a, a quotation from the Alhambra. And what's interesting to me is I like to say that this is the finest Persian garden in the Western Hemisphere, because until recently, it was the only Persian garden in the Western Hemisphere. So it's a very unusual type of garden. And but Samuel Unterbar was a very unusual type of climate client. He was Jewish. And if you look at the great gardens that were built in America at the turn of the century, you know, probably 99% of them were built by Christians. So the Jews were, you know, they were assimilating, they were beginning to acquire wealth, they mainly lived in the cities, they were not really into gardens so much. So and Bosworth had a very unusual uh, client uh, in Samuel Untermeyer, and he gave him a very unusual garden. And to me, what's interesting, and it's totally my interpretation, no one else's, but if you were Jewish in the 19th century, uh, late 19th century, your synagogue might likely have been Moorish-style architecture, because for the Jews, that period of history of, of medieval Spain, uh, 8th century Spain, was a rare moment in time, a golden age, when the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians all got along. So it was a time that was very happy for them, and they built these Moorish-style synagogues. And really, you could say that what Bosworth gave to Untermeyer was a Moorish-style garden. So uh, Islam spreads east from Iran into what is now India, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, uh, the, the is, uh, you know, Islamic parts of, the, of that world. And of course, the most famous of the great Mughal gardens is the Taj Mahal. Here's a comparative plan analysis of the two gardens. The Taj Mahal is on the left, and you can see the crisscrossing canals. The four quadrants of land are subdivided into four. It's surrounded by a wall, and at the corners you can see the four turrets. You can see the central entrance tower at the bottom, and at the back, uh, there is no wall. It's only surrounded on wall by three sides. It looks out over the river, where and in front of it, of course, is the tomb. At Untermeyer, on the right, there is no tomb, uh, but at the back is um, an amphitheater, and it is surrounded by walls on three sides, but the open side is on the left, looking to the Hudson River. And there, there is a a, a circular temple at the base of which is a ziggurat shaped pool and more on that later. So this is a view looking down uh, at the at the amphitheater. You can see these sculptures, the paired columns, uh, 
excuse me, I'll skip that for the moment. Uh, As I mentioned, Samuel Untermeyer had 60, uh, he had 150 acres, and he had 60 full-time gardeners, as well as 60 greenhouses. It's kind of easy to remember. The photograph on the upper left uh, was probably taken during the height of the Depression because there are only about 35 gardeners there. Uh, so a lot of people, he opened his garden to the public one day a week for 25 years. And a lot of people went. And I Googled the New York Times archives, and I found this article, October 29th. A crowd of 30,000 persons today visited the Free Flower Show in Yonkers. The superintendent revealed that many of the visitors came from foreign lands in distant parts of the country, as well as from the city, to see all the flowers. Additional policemen were necessary to facilitate the movement of traffic of the Albany Post Road and the movement of sightseers in and around the gardens. So 30,000 people came here in one day. This is one of his regular open days. Uh, There were fabulous parties that took place uh, at, at the garden. This is an article from the front page of the New York Times top left column where he gave a party, a dinner party for 1,800 people after the Democratic National Convention concluded. And there was a huge monsoon that hit and it was a total catastrophe. Um, but anyway, it was an amazing event. Uh, as I mentioned, there's this Greco Roman overlay for the garden. As you may know, the three orders of classical architecture are the Doric at the top, Ionic in the middle, and Corinthian at the bottom, which is the most ornate. Uh, At Untermeyer, there's a beautiful small pavilion on the right, which is beautifully planted with tropical plants in the summer, uh, and it has uh, Doric columns. Uh, At the back of the garden, um, there are paired columns where the amphitheater is, and here we have a reference to the Boboli Gardens in in Florence. Uh, In Florence, they're capped with statues of Capricorns, uh, and at Untermeyer, they're capped with uh, uh, sculptures of of sphinxes. This is a view in the amphitheater looking toward that circular uh, temple that overlooks the river. The sphinxes were carved by Paul Manship, one of the greatest sculptors of the day. Um, in addition to the two stone sphinxes, there, are, there were two bronze manships, also by uh, Manship of Diana and Acteon. Uh, these sculptures are now in the collection of the Hudson River Museum. And of course, Manship was the sculptor of the Prometheus Unbound at Rockefeller Center at the ice skating rink. The stage of the amphitheater on the left is in mosaic. And the mosaics in the garden were, uh, by reputation, the largest outdoor array of mosaics in America. Uh, And these mosaics were based on another Mycenaean design from a temple in ancient Mycenae 1200 BC, which you can see on the right. There was just a fragment of a fresco which survived. Uh, Also in the garden, uh, so Bosworth never went to Iran. He never went to India. However, he had a book that had recently been published by a woman named um, uh, Constance Villiers Stewart, who lived in India. Her Her husband was in the Foreign Service from Great Britain, and she fell in love with the Mughal Gardens and wrote, I think, the first book in English about them, and she did the illustrations in watercolor. And this is an image of of, um, Shalimar, which is in Kashmir, and it shows the emperor sitting, uh, the Mughal emperor sitting on a throne with sort of a sheet of water flowing from him into the pool. And at Untermeyer, um, there is a slot where unfortunately the water isn't flowing as much as we would like. We will eventually remedy that, but that is a reference to Shalimar that you see there. The garden has been beautifully planted with um, 
uh, aquatics in the foreground. This is a historic picture of uh, the garden in the 30s during Untermeyer's day. You can see the, the crenellation of the uh, amphitheater. Each had a planter with sort of a waterfall of chrysanthemums. He did three major plantings a year, a spring planting, a summer planting, and a fall planting. And this is um, in the foreground is the wall on either side of the stage, again, with more um, chrysanthemum. So it was, you know, this is what the people came on October 29th, 1939 to see. Um, so this is what it looks like now with the beautiful uh, uh, aquatic plants. And what we planted last year, uh, which you can see are um, sort of weeping black-eyed Susans on either side, which give you that effect of the of the the curtain of, of flowers coming down. Uh, if you see here, these this is taken in the fall, but you can see some of the vertical plants, um, which are kind of straw colored. That uh, later in the year uh, is the color it turns. Uh, is, a, is papyrus. And papyrus, of course, in the ancient world is what you make paper out of. And in the ancient world, they rolled the paper into scrolls. So we wanted to relate the horticulture to the architecture because the ionic capitals are derived from scrolls. In a Persian garden, you're supposed to be overwhelmed by the beauty of nature. You're supposed to see the fish swim. Here are the goldfish in the pool. You're supposed to hear the birds call. You're supposed to smell uh, the flowers. So all of God's creation is celebrated, and people love seeing the fish in the canals. Uh, one year, we planted uh, marigolds. Every year, it's something different, but we planted marigolds along the canals. They were spectacular. The Wall Street Journal wrote a huge article about it. It was in, in homage to Indian culture. Indians love marigolds. They have big garlands of them at weddings and special occasions. Uh, at the Temple of the Sky are more mosaics. Uh, this is of a mosaic of Medusa. Look at the way the colors are shaded from darker to light as you go in. Uh, I get, uh, Bosworth picked Medusa because she was the offspring of two marine gods. And for Bosworth, this symbolized the Hudson River on one side and the four rivers of paradise on the other, the two great water features of the garden. But I was giving a tour one day to a woman uh, who was a classicist. Uh, she taught classics and she said, had I ever heard of Medusa and the Aegis? And I said, no. And she said, well, often uh, in Roman shields that soldiers would carry, there would be an image of Medusa. And she was so ugly. Of course, she if you looked at her, you were turned to stone. So she protected the soldiers. But the, the uh, Aegis it's sort of like a collar, or it's like a circular image that goes around that of Medusa. And it was a symbol of power and strength. And what she was saying is that what's very interesting uh, is that uh, the uh, image of Medusa is on the pavement and it, the, the temple has no roof, it's open to the sky. And the god of the sky is is Zeus. And this Aegis was a very powerful symbol to Zeus. And so she, this woman, was interpreting that the ring of the temple was almost like the Aegis, uh, the circle that goes around Medusa. And this sort of symbolized the union of the heavens and the earth, and that this sort of symbol of power and, and, and the center of energy for the whole garden, the sort of Caput Mundi, the center of the of the universe. Very interesting image. Uh, so on either side of the temple, we now have beautiful plantings. Uh, you can see on the lower left what it looked like when we started. There was virtually nothing there, just a couple of scrubby junipers. Um, uh, in, on the on the lower left, in Untermeyer's day, and that would be the spring planting. He planted, you know, like a hundred thousand tulips. Uh, on the the main image is what it looks like later in the fall. One of the corner turrets in the distance. Um, another picture lower right would have been. This is an Untermeyer period in the '30s, planted thickly with uh, uh, chrysanthemums, and the primary picture what it looks like during the peak of the summer for us with hydrangeas and other roses and plants. This is another shot of the, Chris, of the uh, 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 marigolds. We have a beautiful atlas cedar, uh, which 
spreads like a cedar of Lebanon, this magnificently uh, horizontal spreading, looking very much like a tree you would see in a Persian garden. When you go down the steps, you go down to a lower level. This is taken uh, showing the full color. Those stairs are based on stairs at the Doge's Palace in the courtyard in Venice. Uh, and what we've done is planted a beautiful planting of hydrangeas, which are really looking great now, intermixed with other plants. This is a picture of that temple when it was new. Uh, the pool in the foreground uh, was a swimming pool, uh, and um, it was lined with magnificent mosaics, over-the-top magnificent mosaics. Unfortunately, this is what it looks like today. It's in very, very bad shape. Uh, we uh, plan to rebuild the pool. We're going to raise the bottom, and it's going to become a reflecting pool starting next year, 2022, and then replace all of the mosaics exactly as they are in 2023. The, uh, and this is, the, the, there, there's this beautiful, on the lower right, you can sort of see this, a whirlpool eddying swirl of water in mosaic into which are inserted uh, many, many sea creatures. Uh, so this is just a little glimpse of, of the sea life that's in the mosaics. Uh, the pool itself uh, is a ziggurat shape. Uh, so it's not really a classical shape. It's a ziggurat shape, um, more Persian. So again, it's this sort of east meets west. This is a picture of a party that took place in 1922 on this lower terrace. You can see all the the um, the guests in the background in formal attire. There's a uh, an orchestra on the right, you can see the conductor standing uh, and directing them. And in the foreground, dancing in bare feet on the grass are the Isadora Duncan dancers. So this is really the beginning of modern dance in America. This is another picture of them in the amphitheater. This is 1922. So what's interesting is when you come down to this lower level, that's where the, they were standing watching the, the dancers. Uh, when you come down, and you look at the river, the whole garden is sort of bordered by a wall, and you can't get out. And you're kind of wondering, where, what do you do? Where do you go? And so what Bosworth does is he's sort of manipulating you, drawing you here. You don't know why, but you see um, these columns, and you see these wide stairs, and a blank wall behind you. And what's interesting is that the Untermeyers went to Europe every summer to go look at gardens and they went to england they went to france and they went to italy and they stayed at a fabulous hotel on lake como called the villa d'este which is still a fabulous hotel and they saw a feature there that they really liked and samuel untermeyer asked bosworth could you design something for me like this and bosworth of course said yes and so what he does is he draws you to these columns and then you you're compelled to make a left and you squeeze through this little tiny gate and then boom, he blows you away. So on the left is the view at Lake Como lined, this, uh, lined with uh, Italian cypresses with the lake and the mountains in the distance and the anchors on the right. Uh, this Japanese cryptomeria with the Hudson River and the Palisades in the background. Uh, when we started work on it uh, 10 years ago, uh, it was completely overgrown. This is actually looking kind of better because during the summer, the weeds were six feet high on either side. You really couldn't see the river. Uh, we had to bite the bullet and cut down all these invasive trees and replant it entirely. And this is what it looks like now. So the Japanese cryptomeria are back and it is absolutely drop dead spectacular. Uh, it was Samuel Untermeyer's favorite feature, uh, likely because he was the one who suggested it. And it has been called the most monumental garden feature in a private American garden. At the bottom of the vista, it's called the vista. At the bottom of the vista are these columns. And the columns, ladies and gentlemen, are ancient Roman columns 2,000 years old. These are the greatest ancient columns in the Western Hemisphere, and each is made of a single block of Cipollino marble, so they're monolithic. 
Bosworth's columns that held the sphinxes were also monolithic uh, and also Cipollino, but not nearly as big as these. He wanted his modern columns to speak to these ancient columns. They were imported to America by the great architect Stanford White. White was murdered in 1906. We don't know how they left his estate, but they um, Bosworth must have heard about them and persuaded Untermeyer to buy them. So they are this stupendous, uh, you know, climax to this stupendous garden feature. And here you can see it is this beautiful sort of gray-green veining of uh, Cipollino, which is almost uh, semi-precious marble. Uh, so parallel to the vista was a chain of gardens called the color gardens. And these were six terrace gardens all in a row, each planted in a single color. So there's a white garden, a blue garden, a pink garden, etc. Many of them had fountains uh, and uh, they were um, reached by gaps in the wall uh, as you would go down the vista. So as you went down the vista, all of the cryptomeria would be grown solid as a wall, but there'd be these little tiny uh, apertures where you could you might hear the splashing of water and you know what is that sound you can't see anything but you kind of go through a little archway and then you see another world and then these terraces descend down from blue to yellow to yellow white whatever and you could actually weave back and forth from the vista to the color gardens uh, two of the color gardens are owned by the city of Yonkers. The rest are owned by the hospital, and they are totally trashed, literally and figuratively. Um, one of them is under a road. Uh, I went up to one of them, uh, and I dug down, and at the photograph on the right, I unearthed uh, the rim of one of the fountains. Uh, we're in negotiations with St. John's Hospital to effect a land swap where we would get three color gardens back and relocate a parking lot. And we hope to restore five of the six color gardens. So the lowest color garden, uh, which is owned by the city, looked like this when we started. It was completely overgrown. You could sort of see the remnants of a fountain uh, and barely discern some stairs below. In the summertime, you could not see the river at all. Uh, we've cleaned it all up. We cut down a couple of trees to open a Hudson River view. There's no flowers there, but you can clearly see uh, where there had been a garden. And then looking out from that curved wall down below, uh, you initially saw this. And this was just, again, more jungle. The part on the left uh, had reverted to a swamp from all the leaking fountains from above. So there's swamp grass there. The, the vegetation and, and the, the bushes were so high, you could just barely see the tops of the columns of a pergola. Uh, we sort of cleared it out uh, and uh, we uncovered a wall, uh, which you can see in the background. Uh, there was another garden beyond there that was almost a thousand feet long and then a very, very, very steep uh, slope going down the hill where we found all of these fragments of stones that were plinths and pedestals for garden ornaments uh, that had been vandalized, just tumbled down the hill, and we brought them back. And you can see them sort of hypothetically placed on the wall. Um, in the last uh, few months, uh, or last year, I should say, we had student interns who uh, unearthed uh, the parterre layout. Uh, in this area, it was, uh, the paths were too narrow for a public garden and the, and the beds were very, very, very small. So we adapted the pattern to have wider beds, uh, more suitable for a public garden. We simplified the uh, bed pattern, but those circles were very much part of uh, the original design. Uh, you can see in the distance, uh, the two uh, ancient columns. Uh, this is the summer interns on the uh, on another part of it unearthing the original pattern where we're going to be planting an orchard so this is uh what has become of it uh the area to the right um, will become an orchard uh, we've now uh, built a beautiful cedar trellis on top of the pergola and the area to the left is now planted in a cover crop next year will become an ornamental vegetable garden um, so it's really coming together very nicely. And again, the area behind that wall, in fact, if you look closely, you can see stairs in the foreground and to the right, you can see some other stairs and those had a huge tree 
growing right on top of the stairs. And I mean, I mean, the trunk of the tree was 30 inches diameter, growing right on top of the trees, uh, on top of the stairs. And we knew that there were stairs under there. So we very surgically, carefully removed uh, the tree to reveal those stairs. Um, and this is what was there originally. So this feature that I'm talking about that ran north-south was almost a thousand feet long. And this is what we would have called the long garden. So the, the ancient columns are hidden behind trees in the background. And if you look in the foreground, you can see one flight of stairs, then you see a second flight in the middle ground and the very back, a third flight of stairs. And that third flight of stairs is what you just saw in the previous slide. So we will eventually restore the long garden. What we do with it, I really don't know. The, um, uh, the Italian gardens or the vegetable gardens were the final ones on the north end. The two pavilions at the top were very similar to pavilions at Kaiket. There were these five terraces planted with vegetables with that magnificent view looking up river to the Tappan Zee. Uh, in the 90s, I explored these gardens, which still uh, remain totally, totally in ruined form. Uh, and I dug up uh, you can see in the middle of one of the, the top uh, terraces a rill, uh, which is like a long straight fountain uh, with a shallow flow of water. Uh, there's no water there, of course. It was buried in, in earth. Uh, the water would have been like one inch thick, but it was lined in cobalt blue tile. And at each end were white marble fountains, so it had sort of a blight, a, a blue and white uh, uh, color combination. Um, unfortunately, these gardens were destroyed uh, around 2000 uh, for the construction of a nursing home. So there's nothing that can be done to restore these. They are gone forever. Um, so what's interesting is that the garden, um, you know, the garden that I showed you, which will become a vegetable garden and orchard, those were the lowest gardens going down the hill, historically speaking. But now <laughs> the uh, Croton Aqueduct, which is sort of toward the bottom, is a state park, which it was not back in Untermyer's day. So we actually had a garden entrance down there. The garden was never designed to be entered from below. So we had to figure out how are we going to get people to climb up to the historic garden. So on the right of this picture, you can see there is a gatehouse. And in, the, and in the main shot, you can see there is a kind of an oak grove with various trees. Samuel Untermeyer had the largest collection of rhododendrons in America, like 20, 30,000 rhododendrons. They're all gone. So our high school interns planted them uh, two years ago. Uh, and this will be the rhododendron walk, which is again, sort of an easy way to climb up the hill. Further down, as I mentioned, was the gatehouse. When we uh, started our work, the, the, there had been a huge dead tree that had fallen on top of the gatehouse. It was completely covered with ivy. The building was covered in graffiti. We removed surgically that tree, discovered the gatehouse was about ready to collapse. We had to do an urgent uh, stabilization of it uh, to prevent it from being destroyed. Then we had what you see in the foreground, just collapsing masonry in these two old sculptures uh, of a lion on the right and a headless horse, what we thought, on the left. So um, I was talking to the vice chair of the Conservancy, Barbara Israel, who is one of the leading antique dealer, garden antique dealers in America. And she said, Steve, I think that the Headless horse might have been a unicorn. A unicorn is a mythical creature, which is half goat and half horse, and it has a cloven hoof. And so I said, thank you very much, Barbara. I hung up the phone and I ran down the hill to look at what we had. And yes, lo and behold, we had a cloven hoof that proves uh, you know, conclusively that it was a unicorn. Um, not a horse. And so we rebuilt, uh, resculpted the head of the unicorn. And what we decided to do was just to put a stub of a horn on it um, because we later discovered one photograph from Untermeyer's day in which it did not have a horn. So it must have broken off. And Untermeyer thought that he had a horse, not a unicorn. You can see on the right, um, we... Uh, 
uh, cleaned off the lion as well. And what was interesting is um, the lion and the unicorn uh, uh, embellished the uh, the coat of arms of Great Britain and the and the and the royal family. The lion symbolizes uh, Great uh, the England, and the unicorn symbolizes Scotland. So we cleaned off the outside of the the uh, building of its graffiti. However. Uh, there was all the graffiti on the inside. We excavated all of the soil and we decided we're going to leave the graffiti on the inside as a, as a, a, a record of the destruction and, and the desecration of the garden. I say it's almost like the sack of Rome, what happened uh, to the garden in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But we decided we would create a garden in the ruin. It would be a ruin garden. You know, you go to great English gardens and they have ruins. They build, you know, uh, pyramids, they'll build temples, and they'll be, you know, they'll symbolize mortality and the passage of time. But those are fake ruins. We have a real ruin here, so we didn't have to build a ruin. And here it is as a ruined garden. So we kept the graffiti and we planted it exotic, exotically. And it is a spectacular, one of a kind type of garden. It's very, very compelling. And people really like it. There's an interesting back alley behind it. Uh, and in, in which there is, we planted a, we we created a little grotto in an underground room. Um, so back to the carriage trail. So this shows it what it looked like when we started. Here you can see that lion before it was cleaned up, and the the carriage trail was about a mile long that led up, swept up the hill towards the mansion. This is a picture of it near its conclusion, where it would have been approaching the mansion, and was there was the Temple of Love, uh, which was totally buried under, uh, you know, ivy and and wild shrubbery and and trees. We cleared that out and we restored the Temple of Love. This is an image of it in the winter overlooking the Hudson River. Temples of Love were popular features in American gardens. They were circular temples with wrought iron domes. Um, uh, there is a series of cascading waterfalls at the top. We we're wondering, you know, exactly. Water hadn't fallen in there, fallen there in, in nearly 75 years. And we had an idea of where the water might have fallen given the way it, the, the rocks worked uh, but there were no photographs and I was googling Isadora Duncan and Untermeyer and I saw some a reference to Irma Duncan so I clicked Irma Duncan and this picture came up and all of her dancers took her last name and the Isadora Duncan dancers returned here in 1933 for a benefit performance and Arnold Ghent the famous you know, art photographer took this picture of her standing at the base of the Temple of Love. This is the only known photograph showing uh, the waterworks there. And so now we've restored them. There's water flowing down in many, many directions. It is absolutely pouring rushing water. This doesn't give you any sense of the volume of water that's coming out of it, including from the very top cantilever. But I think that uh, Bosworth was very influenced by the Temple of the Sibyl on the right, which is in Tivoli in Italy, which was an ancient circular temple built on a cliff with a waterfall uh, flowing through it. That's a drawing by uh, Fragonard. Uh, so when you're at the top of the Temple of Love, this is what it looked like back in the day. So it was just totally wild. You can see sort of a, uh, a pool at the, at the base, but there was a whole waterworks going down, which was totally hidden to sight. Uh, this is what it looks like now. We've uh, we had to rebuild them all as the cascades, and it's lavishly planted with asters and beautiful plants, just absolutely magnificent. The bottom area, which is now uh, mowed, uh, is a daffodil hill. We've got like twenty five thousand daffodils there. That's the spectacle in the spring. Um, this is a picture of it in in the late summer, where you see the grasses and the asters in bloom, and the and the uh, the cascades cascades coming down. Here's another picture of it. And we planted some weeping uh, trees like this is that's a weeping larch, I believe they're weeping uh, hemlock and we play, weeping uh, Japanese maples all to kind of play on the, the idea of the, the cascading water weeping down the hill. <clears throat> 
So near this was another feature called the Rock Garden. And Untermeyer, uh, Untermeyer built this later on. This is post-Bosworth in the 1930s. And I went to Washington, oh, maybe eight years ago, and to the Smithsonian Archives of American Gardens and saw all these pictures of Untermeyer. And there are a lot of them showing a rock garden. And, you know, I had no idea where it was. Um, uh, I thought maybe the slides had mis been mislabeled. There was some, you know, estate garden in Greenwich or whatever. But our head gardener, Timothy, uh, maybe the next winter, uh, ran into the office and said, Steve, I think I have found the, the, uh, the rock garden. He could barely discern through the jungle a pattern of rocks. Uh, so this is a picture of the rock garden in the 30s at the Smithsonian uh, Archives. This is what it looked like uh when we started you know totally hidden then timoth uh this is another picture of it uh in the 30s where there's this weird um kind of gnome on a column with these two funky uh, uh benches behind but beautifully planted so timothy unearthed it he found fragments of the benches uh, that little triangle in the foreground is where that column was that held the gnome and basically discerned the pattern of rocks. This is another picture uh, in the Untermeyer days showing that these are not big waterfalls. These are sort of smaller waterfalls uh, back in the 30s. This is uh, after Timothy had dug it out. We sort of found the rocks. Uh, this is after we rebuilt the rocks. Nothing has been planted yet, but we turned on the water for the first time, and that was pretty exciting. And then this is what it looks like uh, now. So it is this spectacular rock and stream garden. And we planted like 5,000 herbaceous plants last year, and they, they're really growing in absolutely spectacularly. So this goes down the hill, and it merges with the Cascades from the Temple of Love. So the, these two great water features roaring at you from two different directions, and, and quite spectacular thing. And in, in between the two uh, features is a, a uh, bowl. We call it the cherry bowl. You can just sort of see a little grass, and it's beautifully planted with cherry trees. So yet another feature that Untermeyer built in the 30s is he loved the fact that 30,000 people came in one day. He would, in fact, follow people and eavesdrop on them and listen to their comments. And he would correct them if they misidentified a plant and he would give them the correct Latin name. So he was the rare, you know, rich guy with a magnificent garden who knew his plants backwards and forwards. He was an expert in horticulture. And this is a picture he built. So what he did is he wanted to build another gimmick. What would be another way to bring people in? And he said, I'm gonna build the world's largest living horticultural sundial. So he had this not a gnomon made out of evergreens and the the um uh the numerals are uh picked out in flowers and here is a picture of him setting his watch by the sundial which he said was set to daylight savings time so he had kind of a nice sense of humor so uh um in 1921 uh 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 uh, Albert Einstein came to America to raise money for uh, Israel and for Hebrew University. And Untermeyer was the head of the committee to introduce him to the wealthy uh, Jewish uh, population in New York City, which showered him with money for uh, Israel and for Hebrew University. And um, unfortunately, this is 1921, unfortunately, Minnie, his wife, died in 1924. So three years later, Minnie dies. And, you know, Untermeyer is brokenhearted, and he makes a major gift to Hebrew University uh, of an amphitheater. Uh, and it was called the Minnie Untermeyer Amphitheater. It still exists to this name, to this day. It has a different name. It overlooks the Dead Sea, probably the only uh, element at Hebrew University named after a Christian. Um, so, um, uh, so he established this um, friendship with 
uh, Einstein in 1921. Uh, Untermeyer received a letter from Einstein later that year saying that he was very worried about what was happening in Germany and could he wire some money to Untermeyer to invest for him in America just in case, and which he did. And so when the Untermeyers went to Europe uh, every year, they would often see the Einsteins So and they became friends. So fast forward uh, 12 years to 1933, Adolf Hitler comes to power and and, you know, the world is starting to shake. And, you know, most Americans and Europeans are in a, you know, the, the economy's in a depression. We've come out of World War I. No one wants to get involved in a war. Um, and uh, Untermeyer winds up becoming the president of something called the Non-Sectarian Anti-Nazi League, which was devoted to try to cripple Germany through an economic boycott that no one would buy or sell anything that was manufactured in Germany. And Untermeyer traveled all over the country to speak against Nazism. Uh, he financed the movement almost single-handed. Um, and the British press called him Hitler's bitterest foe. The Nazis were very worried about what Untermeyer was doing. He had to have a, a bodyguard. He went to his many of his closest friends to uh, Jewish friends to stand against Germany, who did not stand with Untermeyer, uh, did not want to boycott Germany. Uh, he went to Einstein, uh, who had just gotten the job at Princeton in 1933, he said, you can speak to the world about what's happening in Germany, how this is, poses grave consequences for human civilization. And Einstein said no, he wanted to ha help humanity with his science, and he helped on certain refugee issues, but he didn't want to take a, mu a really muscular stand. Uh, Untermeyer had to have a bodyguard, um, and so he was kind of isolated, uh, but he, he was really, and he was old. I mean, he was like, you know, 75, 76, 77 years old. Um, most uh, men in America died probably at age 64 back then. He lived to be 72. He died in 1940, so he never lived long enough to see um, what would happen. But anyway, there's a rift that developed between Untermeyer and Einstein. And uh, sadly, um, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, well, maybe fortunately, Untermeyer died before he really saw how right he was. Uh, and here is Einstein visiting Untermeyer shortly before his death, uh, probably in 1939, I think probably trying to mend fences uh, with, with his friend that he had sort of betrayed. Um, uh, around the same time, 1939, um, <clears throat> Uh, Untermeyer knew that he didn't have long to live, and he thought that his garden was a national treasure, and he wanted to give it to New York State. Uh, he met with Robert Moses, that you can see here, to give it to become a state park. Uh, Moses said no, it was too sloped, he couldn't put in parking lots or football fields. He tried to give it to Westchester County as a county park. They wouldn't take it because it was too ornamental. Then his last option and least option was to give it to the city of Yonkers. They said no, because all of the land would have gone off the tax rolls. So he died the next year, they opened up his will, and again it offered it to the state, they said no, the county they said no, and then offered it to the city. The city took six years from 1940 till 1946, World War II was going on, and ultimately they decided to accept 16 acres and the rest of it was sold off. Uh, the hospital was built at the north end, another hospital built the south end, all the land across the street was developed as garden apartments. Um, thankfully, there was a huge chunk of land that uh, was on the south end that uh, the cardiac hospital sold to a developer and a series of developers bought and sold it for various schemes that all backfired. And thankfully, uh, some environmentalists got involved and they were successful in returning it to public ownership thanks to the Open Space Institute. So it went from being 16 acres now to 43 acres. 
Here's uh, the front page of the New York Times, Untermeyer dead in his 87th, 82nd year. There's a wonderful quote from Herbert Lehman, who was the governor of New York. Lehman would have been a generation younger than, than Untermeyer. Um, of course, part of the, you know, our crowd, the German Jewish aristocratic crowd in New York, he said he'd known him since he was a little boy and that one of the most, one of the, our bravest and most courageous men in America has passed from our midst, which was true. So, you know, uh, like a lot of great men, I don't think that Samuel Untermeyer was necessarily one of the greatest fathers in the world. He was pretty strict with his children. I think they believe that he loved his garden maybe more than them. So after he died, they just wanted to get rid of everything. They all lived on Fifth Avenue. They were living very well, but they had no interest in Yonkers. Uh, so pretty much everything was sold. However, in front of the mansion was this beautiful fountain. And remember when I mentioned on the site plan where the mansion had been, it had been torn down, and there's a little circle in front, that was the fountain. And it was called the Dancing Maidens, which the Untermeyers bought in Berlin, you know, in the early 20th century. Uh, and the children gave that fountain to the city of New York, and it, it was placed in Central Park where it is today in the Conservatory Garden. If you go on 105th, 104th Street and 5th Avenue, you go through the Vanderbilt Gates, you descend a flight of stairs, and you go to the right, and, and, and this is one of the most beloved fountains in Central Park, and it is called the Untermeyer Fountain, and it used to be in Yonkers. Uh, there is a wonderful article, which is in our website, um, uh, that was uh, published uh, by The New Yorker a few months after his death about Samuel Untermeyer, his mansion, his gardens, his lifestyle, uh, which were just spectacular. Of his belongings uh, by Park Burnett. Park Burnett. Uh, one of the books was of uh, garden-related ornaments. Uh, this is on the right, an important Greco-Roman sculptured marble torso of Aphrodite, 3rd through 2nd century BC. She was on the left in that Doric stoa that I showed you where all the tropical plants are now. Uh, so this was auctioned off as well as a lot of other things. Other things were stolen. So this is a magnificent and very important uh, imperial sarcophagus relief uh, that was on the left side of the amphitheater. This is a picture. Uh, the little boy here uh, now is probably 60 years old. He's there with his mother uh, admiring this um, major, major quality. Uh, it was either stolen or vandalized, but it, it just disappeared. Uh, this is what the gardens looked like in the 70s. The canals were a total ruin. You can see one of the marble basins on the right was used as a planter. Thankfully, the city did a, a, a pretty significant restoration of the garden in the 70s, which kept it alive. Otherwise, it would have been demolished probably for a football field because it was in such bad shape. Unfortunately, the garden went right back hill, went downhill again in the 80s, 90s, into the aughts. So again, uh, by the turn of this century, um, they were in very, very bad shape. The fountains were not working and the garden was uh, sorely, sorely neglected. And that's when I came on the scene. So um, I, I, I say during the 60s and 70s, that, that was the hippie period of the garden. The low point of the hippie period was David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, who hung out at the garden. There was a whole satanic cult that followed him. No one was murdered at the garden. The high point of the hippie period was this period when uh, a famous photographer, rock and roll photographer named Bob Gruen came with his girlfriend and they invited John Lennon to come and here he is standing at the temple of love. Uh, so when I started the Conservancy 10 years ago, uh, I had been on the board of Wave Hill, and the man on the left is Marco Polo Stufano. He spent his entire career at Wave Hill, making it the great place that it was. He retired in 2001, and so when I came to him in 2010, saying I'm going to start this Conservancy, uh, Marco 
pretty much became the dean of American horticulture and still is to this day. He's in his early 80s now. I said, would you help me uh, on a pro bono basis going forward? And he said, absolutely. You know, this is one of the greatest gardens in America. I want to be a part of it. And so he recommended the man on the right, who's Timothy Tillman. And Timothy was a protege of Marcos. He worked at Wave Hill. And mark my word, uh, I believe that Timothy will become the next dean of American horticulture. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, I want to say that you can see that Untermeyer Gardens is not just about pretty flowers. It is a place that operates on the highest level in terms of aesthetics, garden history, architectural history, American history, even spiritual meaning. The fact that a Jew married to a Christian created an Islamic garden based on the Edenic idea of peace and brotherly love carries quite a wallop. This alone is incredibly interesting, but there's much more to it when you look at the lives of Samuel and Minnie Untermeyer. <clears throat> From economic reform to women's suffrage, American anti-Semitism and anti-Nazism, Samuel Untermeyer was consistently and progressively on the right side of history and Minnie was doing her part to advance American culture. There is a congruence between the lives that the Untermeyers led and the message of this garden. Form and content are marvelously intertwined. How lucky we are that these gardens survive in Yonkers and in the fullness of time can possibly stand as a symbol of harmony for the world. Thank you very much. Steve, this has been fabulous um, and really fascinating. Um, and so, Pete, you're getting a lot of people saying thank you, thank you, and how informative this was. Um, and for some people who have been, um, they're also saying that they were fabulous. Great. So I hope everybody gets there. And Steve, thank you so much. This was really wonderful. And we will see you at the gardens. All right. Look forward to it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Welcome to the first webinar in our Healthy Yards series. There's going to be four total. So if you like this one, I hope you keep coming back. But my name is Karina. I'm the member communications specialist at Save the Sound. And before we start, I just wanna go over some things, cover some stuff. Uh, the first thing I wanna do is kind of a uh, tech side PSA. We are recording this webinar so that people can go back and watch it later if they're missing it or so you guys can go back and watch it later and share it with your friends. So please stay on mute for the entire presentation. Uh, if you do not stay on mute, there is a chance that you'll show up in the recording. So just make sure you're staying on mute. If you have questions, please type them into the chat. If you look towards the bottom of your screen, there should be a chat button. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please throw them in the chat, we'll answer them at the end. But as I said, while the presentation's going on, please try to stay on mute. Um, that's about it for the tech side. So before we dive in, just a little bit more about Save the Sound. If you are new to the organization, Save the Sound leads environmental action in your region. We fight climate change, save endangered lands, protect the sound and its rivers, and work with nature to restore ecosystems. We do this in a lot of ways. That's what makes us a little unique in our region. Uh, we work through legislative advocacy and legal action through engineering and environmental monitoring, and then through our hands-on volunteer efforts. And together we restore and protect all that impacts the Long Island Sound region's environment, 
from rivers and shorelines to wetlands and forests, and from the air we breathe to the waters of the sound itself. We've been doing this for over 40 years, uh, ensuring that people and wildlife can enjoy the healthy, clean, and thriving environment they deserve today and for generations to come. And all of that work is possible because of supporters like you. So if you are able and you enjoy this webinar and want to support our work, please uh, consider making a donation at savethesound.org slash donate. When I'm done talking, I will pop that link in the chat so that you don't have to search for it. I will also pop a link into our Say Engage page where you can find all of our upcoming events, including the other three Healthy Yards webinars. So that will be there. And then before I hand the mic over to our wonderful speaker, I just wanted to give everyone a little bit more information about him. So we are incredibly happy to have Tony Piazza joining us. Um, he grew up in the rural settings of upstate New York in the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains. He's innately informed by nature and natural settings because of that. So after receiving his former formal education at Cornell University and honing his design skills at various companies, he founded Piazza Horticulture in 1998 and because of his reputation as a first-class plantsman with a strong eye for design, the firm steadily grew to what it is today, a pioneer in the field of environmentally sound design and maintenance practices. Leading a team of 30 members in the field and office, as well as a stable of proven related service providers, he approaches all projects with confidence and pride. Tony lives and gardens in Southampton Village and is deeply involved in his community as the award-winning designer of the East Hampton Village Bioswale Project, a groundbreaking public awareness project that was one of the first public-private partnerships, creating a model for other villages to aspire to regarding water quality issues. He also sits on many boards and committees, including the Longhouse Reserve Garden Committee, um, CT NOFA's Certified Organic, Organic Land Care Practitioner, and uh, Perfect Earth Project. He's a board member there as well. So we're very excited to have him. He has a lot of great information to share with you guys. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to him. Thank you for that amazing um, introduction. My head's a little swollen from that, but I'm really just a down to earth garden geek at heart. Um, again, I'm Tony Piazza, and uh, I was one of the first people in Eastern Long Island to start maintaining landscapes without any chemicals. And I don't know if many of you know where I live, but I live in this place called the Hamptons. And it's not known for people kind of relaxing and letting go and letting nature take its course. So um, in the beginning of things, it was a little difficult to convert our clients, but um, 22 years later, here we are in kind of the, the it company as far as environmental concerns concern goes but today i'm here wearing my hat as a board member of the perfect earth project um which is a nonprofit that was organized and dedicated to promoting toxic free lawns and landscapes for the health of people their pets and the planet This is a photograph from Marsh House, which is my friend Edwina Van Gaal's house in East Hampton. She literally lives in a marsh. Her house is on stilts, um, was built a very long time ago in the 60s. Um, something that wouldn't be allowed to happen in this day and age, but it, this house and the marsh in front of it couldn't have a better steward because Edwina is extremely dedicated to making sure that her property is taken care of without toxins. Um, she started Perfect Earth Project in response to the greater public awareness to the dangers of chemicals and fertilizers we use in our landscapes and water quality issues. It's, it's kind of a funny story. She was um, in the dentist's office and she had her mouth, mouth kind of full of dentist hands and this guy lived on the water and he was saying to her, you know, I don't, I don't feel comfortable putting all these chemicals down on my lawn. What should I do? And she was kind of struggling to answer him, but she didn't really have a good answer. And if anybody knows Edwina, she made sure that she found out the answer. And the result of it is Perfect Earth Project, where um, we're basically doing everything we can to promote toxic-free landscape maintenance. 
Non-agricultural landscapes, that's our homes, our parks, public spaces, use three times more chemical inputs than agricultural land does. That's per square foot. The homeowners aren't regulated the way we use these chemicals because we don't eat what we're putting them down on. Um, but in spite of that, we walk, roll around in them, breathe the air around them, and, and these chemicals are entering our water supply. American homeowners use 66 million pounds of pesticides on their property per year. That's not including what the professionals are using. The danger of these chemicals to human health is manifested in many ways. Cancers, endocrine disruption, renal failure, just to mention a few. And they're especially dangerous to the most susceptible of us, our children and our pets. Not only are these chemicals dangerous to human health, <clears throat> but they're also contaminating our watersheds. This is a picture of Georgica Pond in East Hampton with the most beautiful shade of blue-green. But um, as a lot of us know, that's actually a highly toxic blue-green algae that um, produces a cyanotoxin that it can, is very, very dangerous to um, mammals. It's this, this pond is actually kind of famous for one of the residents' dogs dying from drinking the water there, and it, it really kicked off a major campaign to clean up that water body. 30% um, of all nitrogen pollution that causes toxic blue-green algae blooms is from residential landscape runoff. So how did we get here? So reliant on chemicals to manage a natural system. It was sort of after the war, when the war ended, ended there were a lot of soldiers returning that um, what we know not today is PTSD. Um, they, were returning, they were returning home and they, they sort of found comfort in order and tidiness, basically military life. There were lots of chemicals left over from the war and of course Madison Avenue got involved in um, sort of find out figured out ways to use these leftover chemicals and market them very wisely as you can see in this vintage advertisement DDT is good for me um, and then this was also the time of easy living through chemistry and of course the whole family could get involved another vintage advertisement um, it, you know, the, the, they were coming up with products that were very easy to use. So it was part of American leisure time. Get the family together, make that lawn perfect with as little energy as possible. Sadly, the dandelion, the dandelion was used as um, the target for promotional reasons. To this day, dandelions in a lawn are sort of a sign of an unkept property and not celebrated as the earliest pollen source for honeybees that they are. Garden designers at the time were introducing exotic plant material from around the globe that was easy to maintain and had relatively few pest problems. And that makes a lot of sense because they left all their pests in the countries that they came from. So we didn't have natural insects in this country that were that evolved with these plants so they were easy to take care of but really offered nothing to the natural landscape as far as wildlife service so what we were left with is the current state of the american landscape basically sterile completely disconnected from its natural surroundings but Humans are really good at kind of messing things up, but we're also really good at fixing them. So what can we do about this? I think number one, what we're talking about today is definitely stop using toxic chemicals and water soluble, fer water -soluble fertilizers, that's a mouthful, in our landscapes. The landscape can be a well-balanced natural system that doesn't need any inputs. Think of a forest. 
if you walk into a forest, nobody's out there fertilizing it, certainly not killing any insects. Think about a meadow, um, very minimal input. Usually most meadows are just grazed by wildlife. Sometimes meadows are mowed once or twice a year by a farmer, but for all intents and purposes, they're surviving on the soil conditions that they were given in natural rainfall. So I'm gonna just quickly run through some very specific things that you can do to help your lawn transition in your landscape tr tr tradition from a traditional you know, high input maintenance to low input maintenance. Mow high and mow sharp. What I mean by this is to keep your grass at about four inches high. So what we say is grow to four, cut to three and a half. And a really um, easy way to measure that is to take a traditional credit card and put it the long way up in your lawn and that's about how high you want your lawn to be after it was mowed. And by mowing sharp, it's, it means using um, mower blades that have been sharpened. They do less damage to the ends of the leaf blades and um, thereby like cutting down the amount of diseases that can enter the grass plant through an open wound. Um, Mulch, mow, mulch mowing basically is a, a, a mower that doesn't pick up the clippings because you want to leave the grass clippings on the lawn. Grass clippings are actually the best fertilizer for your lawn because if you leave them there, they'll fall into the soil profile and earthworms and other insects and, and beneficial funguses will um, decompose them and take the nitrogen that the plant used to grow and put it right back into the soil. And um, the same thing with leaves. We like to promote leaving the leaves in the fall, if, if at all possible. If you can mow your leaves into smaller particles and leave them right on your lawn, they do the same thing as grass clippings do. They decompose over time, um, build organic matter in the soil, and just take those instead of taking away from the system they're putting everything all the energy back into the system in the form of organic nitrogen and organic matter um if you think about it if you're using a fungicide on your lawn you're also killing all the beneficial funguses in the on the plants and in the soil and it's all about soil health we want to encourage people to love clover um Clover is an essential part of an organic lawn because it is a legume, which is capable of, it's a plant that's capable of actually pulling gaseous nitrogen out of the air, fixing it into its roots, and, and then um, allowing that nitrogen to go into the soil to feed the turf grasses. It's, it's also very um, beneficial for pollinating insects and honeybees. So um, clover is almost an essential it is an essential element of an organic lawn and you know a lot of people say that it's so clumpy and it, it, it is the clover loves cool weather so it's apt to come up sooner than the turf grasses in the spring so while the turf grasses are still dormant the clover is going to emerge sooner and the lawn will have somewhat of an uneven look but usually by late May, everybody sort of caught up with each other and the clover sort of just disappears into the profile of the lawn. And um, it actually recedes a little bit from the heat in the summer and then comes back like gangbusters again in the fall. And the flowers typically, typically get mowed off each time you mow. So um, if, if you don't want to see clover flowers in your lawn, they generally disappear with each mowing and it's very easy to seed clover into a lawn. We advocate for watering seldomly and watering for a long time. So, you know, in, in the Northeast, our rainfalls are typically like large events where, especially in the summer, you'll, you'll get an inch of rain at a time and then you'll go for a week without any rain, hopefully, if you want to enjoy summer. So the best thing to do with an irrigation system is try to mimic that 
natural rainfall. So rather than setting your irrigation system to run every day or every other day, it's better to water once a week and water very heavily where you would put down a couple inches of water a week to, to water the lawn. That's going to force the grass roots to go deeper into the soil to search for, for moisture which will give the grass much more resiliency in warm periods of time and, and in drought periods. So um, water, water long and water deep. And the other thing I want to talk about is if you don't have an automatic irrigation system and you use a sprinkler, just do the same thing. Just water once a week heavily. And if you do have an automatic irrigation system, we're encouraging people to set up their um, controllers, their time clocks, on uh, the new Wi-Fi time clocks. They're relatively inexpensive, and you can run them from an app on your phone that is tied into NOAA, and it, and it sort of um, monitors rainfall in your area. It'll help you determine what your lawn actually needs for water. So it takes a lot of the guesswork out and puts the control of the irrigation in the palm of your hand rather than having to run into the basement or run out to the shed. Um, and if we get a pop-up storm and the irrigation is supposed to come on that night, you can you can just put it on rain delay and, and then just put it back to the normal setting after that storm has passed. Um, we also advocate maintaining biomass. So um, when you think about it, your, your landscape is a very large garden, so to say. It's producing leaves, it's producing twigs. In traditional landscape maintenance, a lot of that material would just be taken away and put into a landfill. So if you're leaving the clippings on your lawn, you're not removing any of the biomass from the lawn. If you're if you're saving the leaves um, and, and clipping those up into the lawn or putting them in a compost pile, you're leaving biomass. But if you have a property that is larger in scale and you can afford the space to do things like hay mounds and log walls, all of that carbon, if it could, if it could stay on your property, is good because it provides um, compost for the soil, builds healthy soil, and also it has really good benefits for wildlife. All sorts of critters, good critters, would want to live in that log wall and, until it slowly decomposes. And definitely start composting. Um, anything that comes out of your kitchen that's organic and anything that comes out of the garden, your, a vegetable garden or an ornamental garden, and definitely leaf all can be composted. And it can be done on any scale. It could be done at this scale. Oops, sorry about that. I guess I forgot a slide. It, it could also be done at a larger scale if you have a large property. Um, I happen to live on a very tiny property. It's less than a quarter acre in the village of Southampton here. And I found these great terracotta pots that were cylinders about four feet tall. And I have them dotted throughout my garden. And I just throw all of my, you know, garden clippings and kitchen waste into those throughout the summer. And it's just a very small vertical compost pile that I invert every fall right into some of the garden beds and just spread that material out. So comp composting can be done at any level for any size property, and it's highly recommended. We want you to mine the mulch. This is what we call a tree volcano. Um, a lot of reasons not to do this. Most importantly is that uh, the root flare of this tree is no longer exposed. So um, that mulch basically has a chokehold on the trunk of the tree, which is not good. It's robbing it of um, air and oxygen that actually would be at a certain level for the roots to use. Roots, people don't realize that even though they're underground, they they need air. So the roots have to be at a certain level in the soil. And um, when you disturb that, it puts the tree into distress, which then sends out a signal for all the bad insects to come in and feed on it because they know that it can't really build up its natural defenses. So mulching, we kind of stay away from. The other part of this is for people that don't do their own lawns and hire professionals to do it, 
I would say 98% of the professionals out there have no idea how to do organic landscape care. So it's going to, some of the onus is going to be on you to educate your landscaper as well. And there um, are a lot of courses out there that you can recommend. But this isn't going to change until the consumer puts pressure on industry. So the more people that are saying to their landscaper, we want you to truly go organic. Here's how you can get educated. The, the faster this is all going to turn around. And I think one of the biggest things to think about in organic land care is letting go and relaxing a little bit. Um, we've, we've, we've sort of taken the tidiness of our homes, the inside of our homes, out into our landscapes. And it's, it's not always the best thing for a landscape. So consider initiatives that where you could maybe reduce lawn and put in more garden. If you have a larger scale property, you could do a meadow area rather than a mowed area. Sort of letting go and relaxing and letting nature come back into the landscape. And the basic idea would be to make every um, landscape a refuge for you and for wildlife. Again, it's about connecting your property and yourself to your natural surroundings. Oops. So that brings me to um, another thing that Perfect Earth is working on. We've just launched an initiative called Two Thirds for the Birds. Um, it suggests that two thirds of the plants in your property be native plants. We're, we're facing an incredible bird loss to the point where if it goes on much longer, it's not going to be reversible. And Doug Tallamy has done some amazing research and has sort of, to make a long story short, calculated that if we could get two thirds of the plants in our landscapes to be native plants, that'll support the native insects and habitat that these birds need to turn around their populations. And how can you help? I'm, I'm going to talk a little more now about helping the birds, but it's also part of organic landscaping. We say share generously. If you see plant leaves that have been nibbled like this, it, it should be celebrated um, because that means some insect has been eating them and that insect becomes food for these guys. Um, so there's no native pest that's going to defoliate a tree. So if there's a little light nibbling, it's good. It's actually sort of intentional by nature because as the trees are, are full of leaves and heavy throughout the summer, toward the later part of the summer, when these insects, insect populations are at their highest, the, inse the insects that eat them actually start alleviating weight, making the trees more resilient to storms. And it's also the beginning of the decomposition process of the foliage that would fall off of a tree. Habitat piles, again, any size property could have a habitat pile. A habitat pile could be a, a two by two pile of twigs, but you'd be surprised what that can do to help birds that need a refuge to get away from a hawk or chipmunks. And it's also, again, part of keeping the biomass on the property. The dead wood, we, we talk about dead wood as an endangered habitat. You know, we've become so accustomed to removing every single dead tree and dead twig and dead branch off of our plants in our landscapes and not realizing that they're actually homes for insects and all sorts of cavity nesting birds. So again, it kind of goes back to relaxing a little bit, maybe leave any dead wood in a tree where it's not in a dangerous position, like where it could fall on someone and even consider leaving a dead tree up. They're called snags. Um, Birds will nest in them like crazy, and it can give you a lot of enjoyment in your landscape just as much as flowers would. So if you're out in your garden, you saw something like this on one of your plants, you might be apt to say, Tony Piazza, you're crazy. I'm going to run to the store and get some insecticide and kill that ugly thing because it's very scary to me. But this little guy in 21 days turns into this guy. So we all know and love ladybugs. They do a lot of help for us in our garden. This ladybug is feeding on aphids. 
that looks like it's on a, a looping leaf or something. Um, so again, let nature take its course. Let the native bugs do their thing, learn from them, share it with kids. And then another thing that we talk about is designing for independence. This is a project that we did right here in the Hamptons where we brought the metal right up to the edge of the pool. No reason to have lawn on all four sides of your pool. It kind of makes you feel like you're in nature while you're in the pool. And then also designing for resilience. This photograph shows a, a very well-planted buffer zone at the agile water body. So any water runoff or sheeting from the lawn that's on the upper part of the property is slowed down and absorbed by these wetland plants before it actually hits the water body. So this is Edwina's dog, Clover. She actually named her dog Clover when she started the Perfect Earth Project. And Clover and I would like to ask everybody in the audience if they could make a commitment. Um, and that would be a commitment to trying to getting reconnected with your natural surroundings and consider switching your landscape to toxic free management because it's important for all of us. It's important for us, it's important for our families, and it's important for the survival of our fragile planet. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. And usually this presentation is much more about the question and answers. So I'm ready, ready for you whenever you are. Bring on the questions. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna start at the beginning and just kind of go through them there. They're a little all over the place, so we'll just go in order. Um, the first question is, how can I get rid of Phragmites on my waterfront property on Great South Bay? I just have small areas now without using Roundup or Rodeo. Okay, that's a great question. And it's something that we, we deal with every day. Um, and I have a lot of experience with it. Phragmites is very difficult to control if it's actually in the water. I mean, if you can't get in there with a out and then revegetate, the only thing you can do is cut, cut, cut. And the timing of those cuts is very important. If you can cut it, if you can't let it, if you can cut it and keep it shorter than 12 inches every time you cut, it will eventually die off. And if you can get it covered with water, it, it actually can't live drowned. Like if water comes into the stems, you'll most likely kill it. So it's basically... It could be a multi-year project, but you just have to keep at it. But please don't use Roundup. Awesome. Uh, the other question, or another question, uh, are cedar oil applications to control mosquitoes damaging to other insect populations? They are. Um, the, the cedar product that is on the market is called cedar side in, in Latin that c-i-d-e the root of that is to kill so if it's going to kill mosquitoes it's going to kill everything else um mis you know mosquitoes are a tricky one especially with waterfront properties you know airflow is super important it's one of the things that'll help and i mean i come i'm from, from a different neck of the woods but when we have parties here we have people that put out big fans and just keep the air moving to keep the mosquitoes away um it, it, you know, it, it, it's not a foolproof thing, but encourage bats, put up bat houses. They eat gazillions of mosquitoes every night. But the, any, any, any insecticide that you use to kill mosquitoes is going to kill beneficial insects as well, to answer the question. Do you have suggestions for eliminating, controlling, or managing an extensive spread of Japanese knotweed? Yeah. It's, it's sort of the same um, the same practices you would do for Phragmites. It's just cut, 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 or excavate it out and bring it, some, bring it somewhere where somebody else will have to deal with. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> any plant needs a photosynthetic area to survive, so it needs leaves to build up its root system, build up its reserves so that it can actually grow. So the more you cut it, 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 it will eventually disappear, but it, you just have to be tenacious and, and keep cutting. Awesome. Um, so many questions. 
Uh, okay, Donna wants to know, so she lives in Western New York on a one acre monoculture of grass with clay soil, very high deer pressure and many wet spots. Um, in parentheses, she wrote butterfly garden place, question mark. Um, no pesticides used. What do you suggest? It has to be inexpensive. Okay, so I'm not sure what Donna's asking in the first question. What to do with the lawn? Like how to reduce that lawn? Maybe. I, okay. if, if Donna right. wants to unmute and clarify, she can do that. How does she reduce it? Okay, I just saw that. Donna. Okay, so if it's, if it's clay soil and it's wet, you've got the perfect situation for um, a wetland garden, basically. I would just reduce the lawn area and then seed it with plant material that can handle that heavy clay soil. And you said you're in Western New York, so that's probably a zone four or five. There are plenty of things that you could grow, eupatoriums that are native and can handle heavy wet clay soils, mallows, um, hibiscus machatus, which grows in the wetland areas around here, if you introduce that, also very easy to grow from seed. Seed is gonna be the least expensive way to do it. And as far as getting rid of the turf, probably the best way to do that is to plan ahead and do the cardboard newspaper trick and just actually put the he heavy layers of cardboard and paper on the ground in the shape of the bed that you want and put some mulch on top of it. And in about three months, you'll have killed off the turf and a lot of that cardboard will actually have decomposed to the point where you can mix it into the soil and give it a little organic matter. Donna just yeah. said something about the deer, which I forgot about. All those mm -hmm. plants that I told you about, Donna, forget about it because the deer are gonna eat them to the ground. You have to use grasses. So you would wanna introduce carex, anything in the carex family, anything in the panicum family. Um, Equisetum would do well in wet, but you want to use grasses that, and when I say grass, I'm not talking about a turf grass, I'm talking about a native grass, any of those grasses that can handle wet situations. So panicums um, and carexes predominantly. Okay, next question. Uh, Japanese maples, are those, are those leaves okay to decompose in the fall? Um, they don't have any toxicities or anything, do they? They don't. And they're fine. Awesome. Um, this is the question I was dreading because I don't know how to pronounce this word. Um, Linda says she has mostly zoysia grass. You pronounced it perfectly. I did it great. Awesome. Um, if I leave it, it sits on top of the lawn and never gets down into the soil. Any thoughts on that? Okay, so just so everybody understands, zoysia grass is like a semi-tropical grass that in the 50s was very popular because it's bamboo underground and it's it's super drought tolerant and needs like zero fertilizer so um it answered a lot of questions the only the, it does have one drawback it goes dormant very early in the summer and it wakes up very late in the spring because it's a warm season grass but you know i know that it sits on top but it those blades should in the heat of the sun curl up pretty quickly and get crispy where they'll find their way in. You might need to take a rake or a broom or even an electric blower and kind of distribute them a little bit, but I wouldn't I wouldn't take them away if you could, if you can not do that. Okay. Um, Linda lives on a lake. One of your neighbors is a heavy chemical user. The other has left the yard to overgrow, allowing everything seedable invasive to proliferate. Um, do you have any ideas on what she might be able to do? And lead by example. I, I, I know it, we, we can only control what's under our control and um, there's nothing you can do about that. It's you, you, I, you know, we, it, we, have these, we have these great signs at the Perfect Earth Project that says toxic free landscape, perfect landscape. And sometimes by putting that out, I, I have one out in the front of my house and all my neighbors were like, what's that all about? So I started explaining it to them and they now they call me Mr. Perfect. But I was surprised that two or three of them started kind of adopting some of the principles and stuff. So I think the only thing to do is lead by example. This, this is Donna, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is a question. Is there a sustainable renewing forage for deer for a flat, 
heavy clay wet soil in the midst of a monocultured neighborhood renewing um i don't know I, i'm not a forestry expert so okay. i don't know i don't know what could be done for the deer the, they're they're eating the problem with the deer again it's a natural system out of balance their right. their populations are out of control they are so they're eating more than they should and they're not allowing the natural food that they would eat right to regenerate um so that deer are a whole <laughs> other topic that i really uh, you know we could that's a whole other seminar but okay. they, they need to be managed as they were through the millennia with yes. coexisting with human beings yes so i don't it's have like anything living, it's like living with a herd the whole yep. lawn is like hoof prints <laughs> yeah okay. So, okay thank you sure i switched computers okay Okay, so sorry about that, guys. Um, let me find where I was. Let's see. So many good questions. Um, how do, okay, how do you address concerns about the risk of ticks in naturalized habitats? Okay, good question. It comes up and every, every time I do this talk, it comes up. So the, the basic, my basic message with ticks is that they're uh, they're out to get us and there's no perfect answer to your question except I could tell you a million and one things to help repel, t repel ticks and I, I'll give you a few examples but the most important thing to do is self-check because you can leave your protected area and go to the beach and pick up more ticks than you would have in your protected area so um, ticks don't like cedar they they loathe cedar so if you do have mulched paths or something use cedar mulch if you're if you are sort of decreasing lawn and you want to maybe have paths through a mulch meadow minimum six feet wide i like to tell people eight feet wide so that you're far enough away from those tall grasses ticks need they need humidity they need moisture humidity and tall grasses pretty much to survive so if you are, are mowing your lawn weekly a, a mowed lawn is one of the least likely places to get a tick i'm not going to say that you'll never get a tick on a mowed lawn but it's one of the least likely places so stay out of the tall grasses in the natural areas and definitely self-check one of the um most brilliant things i've ever heard for the self-check with ticks is a lint roller the old fashioned, like remove your lint from your sweater, just all over your skin, all over your legs, and you'd be surprised. And even, it, it even picks up the little larval ticks that um, can be a real problem in the late summer. And, you know, I would say that helping wild, like increasing wildlife on your property, there are certain birds that go after ticks too, so. Awesome. I've also um, used cedar oil on my boots. I, I wear high boots all the time, and I actually put cedar oil on my clothing and on my boots, so I'm just like reek of cedar. <laughs> and it seems to help a little bit, but there's no perfect cure for that. Okay. Um, what is a good way to combat weeds in the lawn? Is corn gluten an acceptable solution? Okay, that's a great question. Boy, I love this audience because you're hitting on all the right things. <laughs> corn gluten is not an acceptable option, mainly because it's, it's relative, it's, its efficacy is minimal and it's adding nitrogen to the system. It's adding nitrogen at a time of year when you don't want too much nitrogen in the system. So the mowing high is probably one of the best things for reducing if the turf stand is healthy enough, it will shade out the weed situations. And it can take a couple of years for this to happen. It can, especially with crabgrass, but mowing high and watering properly are probably the best way to combat weeds in the lawn. Um, oh shoot, I lost my train of thought because there was another thing about weeds in the lawn. Mowing high, corn gluten. Okay, it'll come back to me. <laughs> There's a lot more questions, so okay. plenty of time for it to come back to you. Um, how do you eradicate Asiatic bittersweet? Um, that's a, also a good question. We 
the only way we do it it's it's hard to it's almost it, it's with us forever the hardest the way that we eradicate it in established areas like if we take on a project that's where there is a wooded area that's been neglected and has some very mature vines we just cut them because those vines grew at a time when they weren't shaded that's a vine's job is to grow up to the sky as fast as possible by whatever means it can get there to absorb light so if you let's say you have a, a forested situation where there are stands of cedars and maybe oaks and stuff if you cut those major vines the the plant will most likely die because it just can't re-sprout it won't have enough light to really get going enough to get back up to that canopy and then you know i i even on my little tiny lot here i find seedlings all over the place the birds are spreading it but um we cut the vines right to the ground and we don't pull them out of the trees we leave them to just dry and fall out on their own but that's the best i can do for oriental bittersweet okay um can you address the importance of decreasing your lawn size since it is a biological desert um yeah do it i mean <laughs> it's super important um there it, because it you know you know i like to use this analogy wall-to-wall -wall carpeting is out area rugs are in so you, you don't need a lot of lawn really it, you know parks are in athletic fields need a lot of lawn but homes don't really need lawn you, you'd be surprised how much of your lawn you actually use and enjoy so why not either let it be a taller grass meadow or a native plant planting it's it's super important and, it, and it's less input that you need as far as water and all of that just to keep the lawn going you know i forgot to tell everybody there the perfect earth project has a handbook for lawn and property care it's called the perfect handbook and i think it's available on our website so if anybody's interested in this a lot of the things that I talked about are, re are really well outlined in here if you didn't take good notes. Awesome. Um, and this is being recorded, so you can also watch this again, just right. so everyone knows. So all these great questions, you can re-listen to them over and over. Um, okay, Donna wants to know, she uses a product that's a deer fence. It's composed of putrid eggs, thyme, et cetera. Is this okay? It's fine. Yeah. Awesome. Easy questions. Um, okay. So the next one I'm also really interested in. Somebody said they would like to see your terracotta compost bins. Is there a cover on them, a hole in the bottom? Um, do you have a rodent problem? I have a small yard in the city and I'd love to compost, but I assumed I didn't have enough space. Should we take this show on the road? Let me see if I can yeah. do it. Let's see if it works. Ugh. This has I been work? a lovely webinar. I'm so glad you're all here. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can rotate the screen. Cool. So this is my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> this is my yard. It's really tiny, the backyard. So these are, were really intended to be pocket planters. Can you still hear me? Yep, okay. I can still hear you. There's one. You're breaking up a little bit. You're probably a little uh, too far from Wi-Fi. Okay. Ground in front of it. Oops. Okay. Better. Uh, a little bit better. Yep. Am I back? Yep. Okay. Did anybody, did everybody see that? It showed up on my screen. So, yes. I think everybody got a chance to okay. see it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, that's one of them. Um, you know, I just, I just want to... It's spring, so nothing's blooming here. But after we started two-thirds for the birds, I installed this planting last year. That was... Um, it's Clethra, Ilex reticulata, and some calicanthus, all native shrubs that are butterfly and bee plants. Okay, let's see. All right, next question. All right.
funny. Yeah. So I'm going to pause just because it's 1255 and some people have said they have to go back to work. We're going to continue. We will definitely get to all your questions. But if you guys um, need to hop off, thank you for coming. I hope you got a lot out of this. I know I loved it. Lots of great tips here. Um, some people in the chat are saying they didn't get a chance to see the terracotta bins. And yes, posting a photo, I think, is a great idea. Tony, if you would be willing to send me a photo, um, we we will send a follow-up to everybody who registered for this one webinar, okay. and we'll throw it in there. So sure. you will all get a chance to see those photos. Um, and like I said, thank you for coming. Please feel free to check out savethesound.org slash stayengage for all our future upcoming events. And thanks. Now we'll get back to the questions for everyone that can still can stay with us. Um, okay, so we covered the terracotta bins. Um, okay, Jennifer says that she hates crab grasses and she wants to know how she can reduce them without commercial lawn treatments. All the things that I talked about in the lawn care section Water wisely, mow high. Um, but you know, I, something I forgot to talk about is overseeding your lawn is kind of important to every fall. Do an overseeding, and that will help boost the populations of the beneficial turf grasses and, and give it a chance to push out the crabgrass. Crabgrass needs warm soil and it needs light to germinate. So, and it doesn't, it's a warm season grass, so it doesn't really start doing its thing until the summer. So if, if you can get your turf stand happy and thick enough, it's really gonna push out a lot of crabgrass. Awesome. All right, I love this question too. Any landscaping tips for attracting owls and bats? Oh, um, Yes, actually, um, I should, I should flip, I'm going to flip the screen again, because I, <laughs> I put up owl houses and bat houses, that's the answer. Let's see, there's a, so can you see that, that tree back there? In the corner, there's a, a birdhouse on it. Yes. That's actually an owl house, and that is occupied with uh, screech owls as we speak. They're nesting. Um, so, see, I practice what I preach. Um, <laughs> wildlife housing is really important, and it's hard to find the good stuff. So, I, I'm, I know I'm not supposed to promote products, but one of the best suppliers for bird houses is a company called Schwegler. It's it's a German company and the Europeans are light years ahead of us as far as taking care of their wildlife. They have a house for just about everything including hedgehogs. Um, but the, the Schwegler houses are made with a mixture of concrete and um, cellulose fiber so they kind of recreate what a tree trunk would be for nest cavity nesting birds and they last forever. And I've had some for so long that they're actually encrusted with lichens and stuff now, and I forget that they're in the trees. But super, super, I mean, they just work really well. The birds love them. And the, the diameter of the hole, the entry hole on a birdhouse is what determines the type of bird that'll nest in that house. So the, the Schwegler birdhouses have different diameters for different birds. And the, the best place that I know of to get Schwegler bird houses in the States is a company called Kinsman Company. They don't have the owl house, but um, you can Google Schwegler owl houses and there are a few people out there that sell them if you want to try to get the screech owls into your garden. And, and screech owls will live in the, in the smallest village garden. They're all over. I am typing that name in the chat because we got a request for it. <laughs> oh, great. Schweigler. Okay. There's that name. Um, a few more questions. Let's see. I'm in the part of the chat where everyone's talking about my sound. So, okay. Um, how about composting Norway maple leaves? Nothing grows under the tree except saplings, so it makes me think the leaves may be toxic. 
Um, okay, so um, that that toxic situation is called alleliopathy. It's a long word, and Norway maples are not alleliopathic. They don't secrete a chemical that kills plants, but what they do is um, they outcompete anything under them because they use up so much water. Their roots are so high on the surface that they just nothing can get a root hold under there because there's never any available moisture and the norway maple is a great example of an invasive exotic that it's not native to the states but it sure is happy here and it has almost zero um wildlife service so we're we i i went i did a project on shelter island a couple years ago that had a lot of very large Norway maples and i told them we were cutting them all down and replacing it with replacing them with native trees and it was tough for the client but they bought in because they were so dedicated to um you know changing the environment of their it was a waterfront property but norway maples are definitely a problem their leaves are fine for composting it's just it's just organic matter but nothing eats their leaves and um they don't allow anything to grow under them so it makes it a very difficult plant in the garden Awesome. Um, mayor Kurt Lang, he's the mayor of Hamden. He's here with us. So thanks for joining us. Glad you could come. Um, he says, as a community, we work in Hamden to really minimize pesticides, but I haven't heard a solution um, to poison ivy without chemicals. Do you have any ideas? Um, again, it's hand removal. And I know that sounds horrible, but um, <laughs> poison ivy is actually a really good plant in the landscape as far as wildlife service birds love it um and a lot of insects feed off of it but the, the only way to do it, it to eradicate it is um hand removal or mechanical you know with a machine there's no and you know yeah i can't think of any other way to do that other than shading it out you have to wear tyvek suits and double glove it's not fun it doesn't sound it. No. Um, okay. Uh, can you address butterfly gardens? Should you put in a wet space? Would milkweed and butterfly weed work in it? Um, yeah. I mean, you can put a butterfly garden in any soil situation. It just depends on the plant material that you use. So there, in the in the milkweed family, the butterfly weed family, there are that's the Asclepias family. There are Asclepias that grow really well in wet soil. That's Asclepias incarnata is the the swamp milkweed. But then the um, the one that grows in really dry meadow areas is Asclepias tuberosa, which is the orange one, the pretty orange one. But definitely pollinator anything you can do to help pollinators as far as um, flowers go is good. And there's a plant for every situation. Awesome. Um, can you recommend an overseed for grass? How about overseed for a meadow? Okay. Um, uh, there are two different, very different situations, but turf grasses, I actually have to look at the perfect handbook because I don't have it memorized, but you should always use a blend you should have a blend of, well, as little bluegrass as possible, but bluegrass, bluegrasses, rye, and um, fescues. Um, and you know what? There, that mix is available online, that, that those proportions, but you should always overseed with a mix. And then as far as a meadow goes, they're, once they're established, they're sort of self-sustaining. They kind of seed themselves every year. You, the, the key is not to mow a meadow until the, until this time of year, you want to leave all of the tall grasses up so that they have a chance to drop their seeds. And they also, there are a lot of um, endangered native bees that actually overwinter in the stems of native grasses. So don't cut meadows until late spring. But if you, if you really want to give your meadow a little extra help, I would always recommend throwing um, little blue stem Cezacrium seed and Aragrostis spectaculus, which is purple lovegrass. Panicum can be a little bit of a bully in, in a meadow, so you have to be careful with it. 
I wouldn't see that in unless it's already occurring there. But if you want to overseed a meadow, the best thing to do is identify the, season, the, the warm season grasses that are in the meadow and put down more of those seeds. Cool. Um, we are down to our last two questions, so we're, we're almost there. Um, the next one is, um, I thought you had to clean birdhouses every year. Is that true? It is true. Um, usually late winter, I go through and take out last year's nest and let them start fresh. I don't, I don't clean the owl nest, though. The owls, they'll lay their eggs on a stone if, if it's in the nest, so... I usually, when I hang an owl nest, I fill it with some wood chips at the bottom and then just never touch it. They're fine with that. But other cavity nesting bird houses should be cleaned every spring. Do it in the late winter before they, they start nesting. All right, so our last question. Um, we want to plant a meadow in place of our lawn, but we have a large oak tree that makes dense shade. Is it worth it to get rid of the tree? I have read that it attracts about 500 different pollinators. It's a lot of pollinators. <laughs> if you cut down that oak tree, I will hunt you down. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> oak trees, you're right, oak trees are the best tree for our, our native wildlife. So I would work with that oak tree and you're going to have to work with plants that can coexist with it. So it, again, the Carex, it's the Carex Pennsylvanica. It's not the most exciting grass in the world, but it will live in the shade of an oak tree. They, it, it naturally occurs with oaks. And if you don't have deer pressure, you can use some of the native ferns, lady fern, Hay scented fern does really well in a, in a dry shade area and it spreads like crazy once it's happy. Um, and then some of the ephemeral wildflowers would be good. You could introduce trilliums, um, maybe some uh, bluebells, some mertensia. It's not really native to this area, but it will be in a couple more years of global warming. So might as well start now, right? <laughs> All so, right. Yeah. That was our last question. So do you Great. have any final thoughts or final things you want to get out before the end? No, I, 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 just hope, I just hope that it was inspiring. And I just want everybody to know that there's help out there. Just email us at the Perfect Earth Project. Or there are a lot of organizations that are, are popping up around these issues. And um, just have fun with it. Let, let go. Have fun with it. And get reconnected with your natural surroundings. Awesome. Well, thank you, Tony, so much for joining us. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us. I had a great time. I wrote like a full page of notes and I live in an apartment, so I don't even have a real lawn to myself. So I hope you all learned a lot too, because I'm excited. Um, but we'll wrap up. And like I said, we will send a follow-up email. It will have this recording so you can go back and watch it. Um, and we'll throw in some useful links and different things that was said. I'll make sure the terracotta compost pots get in the email so that we all have that. Um, and a fuller description. Yes. Okay. They definitely want to hear more about the terracotta uh, compost pots. Okay. So it's, bas it's basically a, a terracotta cylinder. You could use chicken wire and make a cylinder. It's just something that's compact and enclosed to hold all that stuff together and give it enough depth to decompose. But I'll definitely send pictures of my terracotta pots yeah. for everybody mm -hmm. to try to recreate. We'll make sure you get the information you need. So thank okay. you everybody for joining us and have right. a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye guys. Bye.
building committee to order. Um, before we do anything else, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence. Darien, the Darien com uh, community lost two of our residents last night, and I'd like us to just take a minute to honor that, please. Before you go any further, do we tell t TV 79 we're on? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to approve the meeting minutes from the meeting on March 24th, 2022? Mr. Riley, second. Mr. Martin, all in favor? Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, I'll open it up to public comment. I understand we have two folks here. Please, just step up to the podium, say your name and address. Um, I guess, I guess you can probably just yeah, just come come right yeah, up. The only mics come here because the only mics we have are right here, and we want TV seventy nine to get you. Stand. You no, you can sit, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Doug Bora, and I live at um, thirty eight near Wardle Lane in Darien, which is located two houses south of Henley School. Uh, I'm here with my neighbor Tom Ross of Nine Pastor Lane in Darien, and we are budding property owners with an aligned interest. My purpose in speaking to you tonight is to make sure that the building committee is aware of a Hindley School storm water runoff problem that has damaged our properties, my property and Tom's property, and several other residential property owners in our neighborhood. <coughs> Hindley has um, below grade storm pipes that were installed around 1947, they're very old, to the then existing standards. Uh, when it was built, the, its water engineering uh, consisted of four catch basins that served as conduits for surface water runoff and roof water runoff. Um, according to the town maps, uh, those four catch basins, there are now 11 catch basins, and they are feed the same single 12-inch pipe that was installed 75 years ago in 1947. Um, the volume of, what, of surface water at the school has significantly increased since then due to building expansion, uh, parking lot expansion, installation of three portable classroom buildings, which you're going to have to demolish, um, uh, increased impervious surface added for asphalt playground areas. And now there's a larger footprint contemplated. Um, and this old pipe I want to just bring to your attention is overburdened and dumps a significant amount of water of the school's runoff outside its property onto the neighbor's properties. And it simply can't handle it. It's just an old overburdened pipe and we're getting runoff from the school. So our properties as a result are frequently deluged with water runoff caused by Hinley and it's been getting worse, the world being what it is with these storms these days. Uh, the runoff remains as standing water on our properties and EPC regulated properties which actually abut the two of us as property owners. Um, and it can become a breeding ground, and we're nervous about it this summer and every summer with mosquito infestation because it's staining water. It's something we've got, I've got kids and grandchildren. Um, so given the climate change and it, with more frequent rainstorms hitting Darien, it's appropriate to address what we think is functionally obsolete um, civil engineering problem that was created 75 years ago. Really, it's the time, why now? It's the time to do it now. Um, we've previously brought this to the attention of the town, both in writing and in person, and it's now time to really address this because you're going to be talking about renovating and expanding the school. So our requested action plan, um, we'd like to make, ask you to respond to, the, uh, to upgrading the school's poorly maintained water management infrastructure with three uh, solutions, immediate, short term, and long term, for you to consider. The immediate is to hire a civil engineering firm to perform due diligence on Hindley's water runoff to corroborate our assertions to you this evening. You have to check that on your own, and I, I would ask you to hire a professional civil engineering firm to do so. Number two, short-term fix. Uh, I'd like to ask the building committee to ask the DPW, Department of Public Works, to, this is the in, uh, incorrect term, but to rotor rooter the existing water runoff that discharges water from Henley onto our properties. It's really a problem. I'm going to leave pictures with you. You'll see it. And I invite any of you to come look at our property at any time. Um, it, it, it discharges water 
two parcels and three parcels south of the school. It goes actually under Pastor Lane where Tom and I live and goes onto our properties. It's quite evident. You can see it clear as day. I can show you videos that go, but we've done it for several years now, and you can just show you videos, and you're going to, in two seconds, recognize there is, in fact, a problem. So that's the short-term fix. The long-term fix is to ask, to ask you to direct your committee's architect to include costs for upgrading the civil engineering to divert Hinley's water, off-site water runoff by installing a lateral pipe from the southern border of the school directly out to near Water Lane. That would circumvent all the water runoff that gets spilled on our property in pipes that bring it down to our lane and it sits there. It's been going on for years. It's now getting increasingly worse with he more frequent rainstorms and heavier rainfalls within them. To, do, to put a lateral pipe in uh, makes a lot of sense. There is an existing lateral pipe that was put in, I believe, by um, probably about 10 years ago for another uh, catch basin in the same area. So I think it has a precedent of putting a lateral pipe directly to near Water Lane. We'd ask you to consider doing so. So um, I'm attaching a photo of Hinley's water runoff onto our yards and EPC regulated uh, land, which I will give to you. Um, I'm also attaching a map of um, the original civil engineering in 1947 that comes from the town zone, from town hall. We got it from town hall. It's your map. Okay. And you can see there were four uh, catch basins put in when the school was, was in there. Tom uh, is a graduate of Hinley School, as are my kids. My mother went to the original Hinley School. You don't even know where that was. No. <laughs> no. It's across the street where the fire station land is. That was called the Hinley Annex. Oh, really? She went there to graduate in 1941. So. Interesting. Cool. <laughs> yeah, and, school. Yeah. Um, and then the third map I'm going to leave with you is Hinley's uh, current civil engineering right now. And I've color coded, uh, there's 11, by my, uh, my review of this, there's 11 existing catch basins on Hinley, uh, Hinley's property to catch all this water from impervious surface. We're going to expand the school, that's great, but we want you to be conscious of the civil engineering that really is 75 years out of date and really needs to be addressed. You don't want standing water on the school site with you know little kids and you don't want it neighbor's site. So I, I want to just thank you very much for listening. I'm going to leave this with you and hope you take this seriously and hire a civil mm -hmm. engineer. Uh, thank you for bringing, thank you for, give that, yes. give that to Joe. Okay. Thank, uh, you. thank you for bringing thank that forward. Much. This is uh, this is the exact right time for us to know yep. about this. This is not well. something that I've heard of before, but yeah. we are in the process of getting the properties surveyed and uh, now is the right time to uh, check into this and we can, at a bare minimum, we can get in touch with that Genteel and find out what, you know, DPW uh, and can do and uh, co coordinate with Jeremy Ginsburg to, uh, to check on the maps. Let's at least uh, let's. Or at we can help you if we need to. Yeah, let's yeah. let's let's, let's, yeah. let's at least sure. investigate yep. investigate it as the as the committee uh, to see what we have. Great. Well, thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate it. Can you uh, get back to us at some point? Just yes. Put on this? Yes. 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 Thank okay. you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so for our chair report, um, most of what I would have to say we're going to talk about later in the meeting. Um, Dave will talk about the appropriation request. Ray will talk about in just a second about our, our discussion with the state and his work. Um, and of course, we have our RFQ and our RFP out, and those are all agenda items. Um, so I can tell you, Chris has been very busy, as has everyone else on the team. Um, thank you certainly to Mr. Rin to Mr. Mr. Rinch, Mr. Lynch. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Rinch. <laughs> uh, Kate Bush, Karen, and and uh, and um, Linda for all the work that they've been doing behind the scenes to get us up and running. We are we are taking off. So you too, Randy. I know you've been hard at work. Um, okay. With that, um, let's start with with you, Ray. The update from ONG and the report on the meeting with state and the Office of School Construction Grants and. Okay, I brought some, some handouts also. We had a good meeting with the state. Uh, Michelle and the group up there were, were very helpful. Thanks. I'm going to pass that around. Yeah, sure. Roger. Thanks. David, also, the, the front page there is the schedule that oh, great. we'll load up. I'm okay, thank you. Perfect. Sarah, you you'll you'll oh, have we'll this. Yeah. Okay. I'll load it up to thank your you. schedule program. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay. Thanks, thank you. Here. That gives you an idea what what we're looking at. Okay, great. I wasn't able to load it up, so I'd pick it up right here, bring it tonight, give it yeah. down. 
So some of the issues that Michelle brought up and, and the crew brought up down there were A, was the resolutions. Well, let's start through the, what I gave you here. Now the project type, we're talking about doing a, we as a group here are talking about doing extension and alteration. One of the comments that came up is maybe we want to do a, a renovate as new. I think that's something we need to talk a little bit further about. I can talk to Mike a little bit further about that. Uh, about whether it's worthwhile or not. The difference in the in the categories uh, is, is purely money. Uh, an extension is purely you're adding on space, which is what we're doing, taking out the the, the portables, we're putting a new space in for the library and on each one of the projects. Uh, the other option was uh, uh, alteration. The alteration projects are typically you go in to change a school to what you need or you update certain portions of what you need. Uh, the issue that comes into play there, not everything's eligible for reimbursement. So if you're running new voice and data lines down the corridor and you have to pull out your ceilings, they'll let you replace the ceiling pads right where you're doing it, but all the rest of the pads never look new. So every time I've done that kind of a project, it's always been, well, we should have done this. And I'm not suggesting we go that route, but that's what we're looking at right now. The other option there, which was a renovate as new, uh, the funding's a lot easier. Everything becomes more eligible. And what you're doing, you're upgrading your facility to the, to the current standards as well as extending your useful life. Uh, there's everything in the renovate as new, or most things in the renovate as new, are considered eligible. When I talk about algebra, I mean the state will pick up their portion of the, of the bill. Where if you're looking at a, an alteration, they tend to be a little more nitpicky, where you can paint that wall, but you can't paint this wall. So what's the downside to the renovation is new? The downside of renovation is new? Uh, you've got to go through a different process. Okay. Okay, they have to make a determination before the grant goes in. We have time to do that now. So meaning they decide if it can be they eligible decide. for renovation is new, but as far as we're concerned, there's no con of us going, no negative of well, us going well, that way. There is there less reimbursement or something, or a lesser percentage or something? It, the percentages stay the, chain, the same, whether okay. it's a reimburse, whether it's a alteration, a renovation or an alteration. It's still 20.3%, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that doesn't change, but what becomes eligible and not eligible, that changes. But the downside, why would you downside, not renovate? Okay. Downside, and anything that you've renovated in the last 50 years uh, becomes ineligible if we touch it. Can you explain but that? The advantage yeah, so what, is, uh, what does that mean, right? I think your last that, renovation what is, was in what, 19... What, is, what, is, what does that mean if you, it becomes ineligible if you touch it? For reimbursement at roof, all. Roof, for example. Okay. So you know, we're not touching the roof in any one of our ed specs here. So, but, to, but we won't need to either. So renovate is new. If we went back and decided we're going to replace the roof, mm -hmm. that would become ineligible. All right, but if uh, okay. for what about things like one of the things that popped into my mind during the conversation was uh, the one from Hartford mentioned you'd have to like upgrade the windows, right? So would it, would there be things in the projects that were not previously spec'd to be included that would be drawn into the project as additional? Because we're trying to qualify for a renovate, yeah, yes, there would be, there would be, and right. they could, they we're, could we're looking, could Mike, I'm just looking, looking for a little support on what's not there because I'm not familiar with the schools as much. Like the HVAC system, we're looking to upgrade mm -hmm. as part of an indoor air quality, uh, provide air conditioning, and, and right. do that. That's in the basic project. That's in now. the ba that's a, yeah. Right, the your life safety stuff. Your your schools are all sprinklered, so we wouldn't be touching that. Right. <clears throat> Uh, what about like windows, Mike? Are there windows. places where windows would, we would have to, to the talk? Windows, um, well, Hindley, the windows are all brand new. Um, Royal and Holmes, the windows are 26 years old. So we did, so that But would, they're, they're double paying with screens. They're not, so you know. They're looking at a 50 year useful life. Okay. So anything we can do to bring it up to a 50 year <clears throat> useful life is, is probably, it, is is good but it's also your downfall too so it's, it's, it's so like your win or like uh if you have a system that's out there it's been out there 10 years mm -hmm. and now it's going to have to be 50 years 
Okay. So, 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 that, so the biggest drawback may be that we may incur additional costs. There may be additional elements above and beyond what was previously expected. Yeah. To be but in so order to be more design. eligible for reimbursement, is that correct? We're, it's we're a matter of other what projects because we might be more eligible for reimbursement. Is that correct? Well, well the comment came where your alterations uh, is, is limited scope wise. Okay. And they don't let you expand beyond that, that scope. So if you have to run a line down the, the, the wall mm -hmm. and, and paint that wall, mm -hmm. okay, you get to paint the wall. You don't get to paint this wall, this wall, or the wall behind you. But if we went the renovate as new way, we would be able to do, we'd get reimbursed potentially for the rest of it, but if, Correct. say, our windows are not up to spec, now we, we just started and added to the project by now having to do windows. Right. Well, so right. The plus it's, is you get everything brought up to Right, but it's yeah. not all eligible for reimbursement. The, the so downside is you increase your time you're going to be on the project. Mm -hmm. You know, and from so the simple, it takes yeah. and the cost. more disruptive. So four times as long to paint four walls as it does to paint one wall. Okay. And, um, then, and you also will have a, a substantial cost increase. Right. Does this affect, so you, sorry, go ahead. You have, you have to weigh cost and time versus what are you going to get as a reimbursement factor. So yeah. a lot of school districts that are, they, they get a tremendous amount of aid, you know, I mean tremendous, anything more than we get is tremendous, you know, 30, 70, right. 60. It makes tremendous sense. Right. So who but we do not. That? And so. The, the state does. The, the state does. My concern is something you of said. What the pro or con is? No, no, as far as what, if we submit for renovate as new, yeah. they'll come back with a determination. Of this what else we would have to do, what are the costs we may incur. So what I'm asking is, who evaluates yeah. if we would actually have to do windows or all these additional things to bring it up to, to spec? How do we know what our cost so cost I, benefit I is? I think there were two things that they said at, at the state. The first is she wanted to, she actually herself wanted to go talk to Kermit. I'm not sure what Kermit's title is. Ker and Kermit's one of the reviewers. One of the reviewers, and they wanted to look at the the project as it stands to determine how they would what, what they would assign Got from their point of view, right? Okay. I'm um, just trying to define the two categories. Got yes, it. yes. Um, and then and then I think it sounds like you're also recommending that we would do a consideration amongst ourselves here at the table, right. um, probably in concert with what we hear from the state about what we think the yeah. best direction is. Is that your? Uh, yes. Yeah. You have, as the building committee, you're going to have to make a determination. You know, is it worth it to do all these other things, or is it not worth it? So that was my. I guess maybe the question is, how do we know who determines yeah, what is going to have well, to be the done? State, to the state pushes. The state come back to us the and state say, pushes no, renovate as new. But wouldn't you want like a two financial sort of two pictures of financial pictures? What what would the financial picture be like if you renovated it new? It sounds yes. like you're going to have to do a lot more work yes. to bring yes. things to the years in time. The thing from the state is the state doesn't want um, school districts to throw a lot of money in really poor condition buildings. Yeah, and so that's that's part of their evaluation. Okay, they're going to look at our schools and say, you know, is is Royal Hindley and Holmes, are those buildings separately or together worth um, you know, offering aid on this type of a project, or are they not? Is it better that you start fresh, or you leave the 96 edition and everything else goes? So it's, you know, they're, they're going to look at all of that. So is it even our choice at that point? Or does the state well, determine? Well, well yeah, well, it's always it your choice. It depends on the reimbursement rate. If we, I mean, it makes, and we have to look at the two different amounts. Yeah. You know, the amount, what would be projected for the uh, renovate is new, and then the um, extension that, and alteration. Can, can is I, that true? Will it be the, the renovation? The, no, 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 no. It's the rate you. itself stays the same. But the, 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 the scope is what we need. To the scope, scope is yeah. what you need to look at. We okay. So what, some so there's may no change, but they prefer that you do renovate is new. They do. Got it. Okay. So, so the other question. Hang on, Sam. Oh no. Yeah. One of the things that you said just gave me really quick pause. We are doing a project where we're renovating Royal's roof, and it's there's a new roof being put in. Right now. The entire new roof. Um, does that affect that reimbursement rate? Does that affect that project at all? No. It well, it might from the point of view that they say, you know, overall condition of what you're telling us you're going to renovate. Right. You know, and, and do some work on and add on to. Is it is it in good condition or is it not in good condition? Right. But we would assume because. 
Be yeah, so they're going to look at, you know. Okay, I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure. Oh, they did masonry that. repointing. Like, oh, they just changed all the windows. Oh, this has a new roof. Oh, these boilers are only 10 years old. Right. They're going to look at all that stuff. Right, okay. You know, and. Correct. Oh. Your roof will replace every 20 years. Right. Uh, so it becomes a. When, the, when they process. come back to us after she speaks with Carmen and they come back to us and they say, for each school, we think this project is, you know, an extension and alteration, you know, uh, renovate is new, or when they, will they, if they, let's say for example, they came back to us and said, all three of these projects in our mind are extension and alteration projects. Will they tell us what other things we would have to do in order to get it to the renovation category? Kermit will tell us what we need, what we would need to do to get to the renovation. Okay, because what I'm just spitballing here, but if the projects, if the projects were to all come back as extension and alteration, and then he says, okay, for Henley you need to do these two extra things, for Royal you need to do this extra thing, for Holmes you need to do that <coughs> extra thing, we could do a get Mike to help us come up with a rough cost estimate for what those extra things would total to and then factor in reimbursement to come up with some way to evaluate. Does that sound about right? Yeah, yeah and I guess part of my question is to so say they came back with that. Is that our only option to get reimbursed from them or we come back to them and say no we want renovation is new and they say oh, okay we'll do that. It doesn't sound like that. It sounds like whatever Kermit comes back with that's what that's going to be that's the only option. That's going to be a our direction. So then even if we don't really have to evaluate anything. This Kermit comes back and tells us you can't go renovate this new here, mm. that, that's a dead issue. Oh, so we're just waiting on them to tell oh, us what we can but, do or not. But wait, wait, wait. So his choice is already comes back and says it's an extension alteration. There's no way you can get to renovation at all. That's one choice. The other choice is he says it's an extension alteration. But if you do X, Y, and Z, it could be a, it could qualify as renovated as new. There would be discussion. Okay. So then we would need a budget for what would extension alteration look yeah, like. So, versus what yeah. So yeah. So so it sounds like we're waiting on Kermit to give us some input first, yes. yeah. and then and then we'll have to juggle all those pieces to right. to figure it out. Okay. So we're waiting for them to tell us where they want to see renovated as new. Our, our process that we're going forward is now. We don't need to wait for him to do anything. Okay. Okay. We need to make a decision June thirtieth. Right. Whether we go renovate as new or extension and alter it. And we'll have the cost. I'm confused then because I thought we were just waiting yeah. for Kermit to come back to us and say it's, it's, this is what you qualify as. That is correct, but that's nothing to do with your approval process. So then, why do we have to wait for what is it? That's just his opinion. I'm not sure I follow. It, 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 has to, it has to do everything with the funding process because it makes a difference between whether I go to the uh, go before the boards and say that our, our all in cost is seventy million dollars no, or all I understand that, but if, if Kermit comes back and says Correct. yeah, it would you gotta do extension because that's what I then that's what we go with. How do we make our own decision on June thirtieth if he's already telling us what we each need to project, do? That's why each project will be evaluated separately. No, I understand that. When he comes back, he's either going to say you can only do an extension and alteration, or you could upgrade that to a renovation if you add these additional features in. Yep. And it will be one of those two. Okay, so that's, so that's when we'll we are waiting for him to say something. We are waiting for him to say something. That's, 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 that's when we have to evaluate. But we can't, so we can't proceed on our own and just say, the heck with what he says, we're doing renovation as new because we want to. We still have to wait for him to we give us We have to what wait to tell him if the building will are. be eligible to be yeah, considered okay. for renovation under any circumstances whatsoever. Okay. He will tell us that. He will Correct. tell us that. And that will affect the dollar amount, though. It will affect the dollar. Yes, because if you go to renovation, you're going to have to add more dollars in. Right. More of those dollars will qualify for reimbursement at right. the twenty percent rate. Yeah. Right. But it's a, it's the ratio of how much more right. more dollars are versus right. how much you yeah. recoup from what more dollars qualify, and that's you know there's there's no way to do that now. How much destruction you're going to see? There's, there's a lot of factors at play. Well, yeah. For example, the the, uh, the the school district may may say, you know what, 
that's great that we can qualify for renovate as new, but it means we're going to have the kids disrupted for another entire school year and there will be ongoing construction and we'll have to be juggling classes and teachers and sections and whatever and it's too much disruption they may not want us to do that that's correct okay. um, but it, it also it may be a larger list or it may not be right we have been keeping up with our buildings so um, I think let's let's wait and hear from let's Carmen wait and see what, he says, what, yeah. what he what he sees People based on what we've yeah. and you have to keep up with your buildings so you're mm -hmm. you're yes Alteration may not be a big deal. That was the impression I got from your comments on that. It's already, I think you said this, but it's it's not that the reimbursement rate would change. It's that more, if you renovate as new, more of the costs are, are reimbursable. Or eligible right? for that rate. Correct. Okay. Correct. The rate is fixed. The rate is fixed. Rate is fixed. Rate is fixed. Yeah. 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 Correct. And right now, the architects and the RFP are all just going off what's on the website. Correct. Which is base case scope. Yes. None of this potential add-ons. Which is existing add and Extension rather than alteration. Yeah. For now. It, it, it won't affect your what you're doing right now with the architect. Well you later know. on if the scope increases. It will later on if the scope increases. Mm -hmm. Um Okay. Uh next item. Oh, sorry, Mac, do you want to add anything to that? No, I was just saying the scope always increases. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so next thing we talked about at the state um, was a the actual resolutions that we presented to them, we showed them what we had. Uh, they were not very impressed or happy with what we gave them. So they gave us the sample, which is just next page, from what I gave you. This is a sample of what they gave us. But this is what they want to see in their in their uh, in our resolutions. Okay. They want to see the exact wording. The next page is what I wrote up and put in front of her, and she was very happy with us. Keep in mind, David, that number four wouldn't happen until you get the approval of your dollars. Right. Okay. But they do want to see that it's approval for the, the whole fund. Okay. Yeah. Not, not just, just like the, just like the, just remember the line funds the Rich. Mm -hmm. So do we I just modify this for the governing body that's making the resolution or passing the resolution? Mm -hmm. You can add things to it, but no, not the word. No, 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 no. It has to pass through different bodies, so it's yes. not just the RTM. So we need to go before the board of selection and the board of finance. So that's cool. So we would replace representative town meeting with the appropriate there body are or no? Two different sets of resolutions. This is the resolution to authorize the project to be done. The resolutions that go for funding are yep. drafted by bond council. Okay. And it's a separate resolution, a okay. completely separate document from this. Okay, got it. So, okay, so this doesn't change any of the resolutions this that we already approved? No, it, no. The, it doesn't change the resolutions that were approved for funding purposes, no. Fantastic. And the resolutions for, for the exception of the building committee, and, and right, and the resolutions you already have on, on on your docket already, right, are are totally acceptable. It's how you want to regulate your body here, okay. And the state doesn't care, okay. So long as they can see these four they resolutions, okay, somewhere in that in verbatim, somewhere yeah. in that information. That's Got what it. we need to do. Ray, I know you've run it by here, but my recollection was that it was the Darien superintendent who was, or the district who was to apply to the commissioner of administrative services for item one. That was, that's the first one. Yeah, item one. She, she is it, is it that she wants the board of Darien board of education or the Darien? Well, it's superintendent by, meeting. the representative by the, the board of education typically is super, superintendent. Understood. Actually, I, just, I think the regulations do talk about superintendent. Yeah. Um, so I do, you, should it read board of ed or should it read superintendent was my understanding? We can put superintendent. Okay. Instead of I ran these past Michelle. Instead of representative. Instead of board of education. Board of education. The first one uh, authorized Darian Board of Education to apply for the grant. Because it's yeah, actually say Darian superintendent. Oh, got it. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So we'll get revised once a week. Okay. Thank you for preparing. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. And the way to was warehouse. That's that's fine. What you have already in place. Perfect. When this all says RTM, it should say board of selectmen, right? So that's what Sierra was asking, um, whether or not we have to go back through our internal process to the board of selectmen first, because it's just it, it's just the why because because you're saying because this is reform it's sort of formulating the building committee, and the schematic drawings just has to come from yeah the town the state wants certain language precisely what they want right. but 
the legislative body is is the board of select. No, the legislative body is your RTM. RTM. It would be the RTM. They make the final decision, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. There's one type of. The issue, I think, is that all <laughs> engineer, come on, give me a break. three or four boards are involved in some of these decisions and pass these resolutions. So I think that I'm just curious do we need to have all three or four bodies? Why don't you pass these the resolutions to yeah. your board? And yes. Ask how they want to be involved in this process. This is the minimum requirement to right. go to the RTM. This is, I need the exact wording of the RTM. <laughs> yes, okay. yes. How we get there, I, I, yes. so I assume you you'd have to go through Absolutely. the Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Um, and Ray, just to confirm, the only one who needs to approve us to prepare schematic drawings as far as the state is concerned is the RTM. Correct. It still blows my mind that I can't wrap my head around why the RTM has to approve the development of schematic drawings. It's part of the building process. It has nothing to do with uh, the, the governing body status or the funding status. Yeah. It's an administrative function of the building committee. Uh, I'm not going to argue with that. It's just what the state wants. Next page was just a continuation. I put it in there twice. We get down to space standard, which was the next thing they want to talk about. So what you do in the space standard, you take your, which is the next page, you take the highest enrollment period for that school and you fill in this matrix. Keep in mind that uh, you get this is basically giving you the allowable square footage for your building. So if you look at the, the matrix, the state standards space specifications for a school is 351 to 750 kids. Uh, for everything from pre-k all the way up to fourth grade you're allowed 120 square feet. For the fifth grade, you'll have 152 square feet. If you do the math, you'll, you'll find that two of your schools are over square footage ones, and one of them is under. Which two? In Lane was over, I think 10%, Holmes is over 18%, Royal Oil was fine. Right. So Royal was under like two, 2,000 square yeah. feet. So we'll be watching enrollment. Um, we won't get an updated and we, we could, might get an informal one, but we won't get a full enrollment report until the fall. So we'll have to submit with the enrollment numbers more or less as they are, even though we do know we still have Parklands and the change to, uh, which one, David, the, which one's just Sarah, which one just changed their housing mix? You mean the uh, uh, Palmer? Palmer. Palmer just yeah. changed their yeah. housing yeah. mix. So those two things could certainly affect our enrollment and it's an, it's an eight year number, right? An eight year number. Yes. So we'll be watching in a moment, and Ray, correct me, the good news is that we have time for that, if that enrollment number does increase, we have time because they will, the reimbursement will happen through the life of the project, right? So correct. So if, if, if we hit a high some, at some point during the project, that could just increase our eligibility. Yes. yes. Okay, it, it comes into play at the end of the project. Okay. So if you're over your square footage, they take that much away. Within 10%, right? Within 10% within ten percent. The, the auditor does have some leeway there, okay. but so he's usually pretty pretty black and white. So the eligible reimbursement could decrease at the end of the life? Yes, if your enrollment goes down. And they did... Your enrollment goes down or up? If you're oversized. If, yeah, if the building is too big, so enrollment goes down. For example, New London, uh, a few, quite a few years ago, actually about 10 years ago, uh, they were projecting out having more Navy involvement in the school system. Yeah, you mentioned They that. didn't. And their involvement went down quite a bit. So by the time they went for an audit, they lost a lot of money. Yeah. I think, you know, it's a, it's a discussion we'll have. The building committee will have it on an ongoing basis. We're not going to decide anything tonight or in the near future. Um, but I think important to note um, that the, the Board of Ed used uh, classroom utilization model to figure out how many classrooms we need. So our building, we may have buildings like homes may have just have more square footage because of how it was put together. Um, so even with keeping the library the way it is, we're looking to hit a minimum number of classrooms. So we may be able to do something with architect to affect some of, some of this number, but we may not because we're trying to hit classrooms. And I think we want, make, want to make sure we build the right school. Um, the other advantage we have also, all these schools are uh, the original schools are 
pre-1950. Mm -hmm. So that square footage right there gives us some extra square footage. I asked Mike to break that out for me. He's going to get me those numbers oh, relatively soon. And even though I am the numbers guy, I will say I'm more concerned with building the right school for our town. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, if it's if it's a little bit less economic, then that's just something we should do. we should just do it. Yeah. And that's a decision the town we'll have to can make. Yep. And at this point here, it really is it's really just a, a consideration. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see this impact you into the audit, okay. which is four or five years down the road. Okay. Right. Thank you for including this question. I just want to give you the information that yeah. I had and I knew it was relevant. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Those, those were the bulk of it. There was a very positive meeting, though, yeah. overall. Good. I think everybody was happy and they know where we're going. They know where we want to go. They have copies of our Ed Spec. Mm -hmm. They have copies of the NNC, NCC, NCA. NCA's mm -hmm. report. Mm -hmm. So they've got all their information they, that we have at this point. Okay. So they should be good. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank you. Item five. Um, update on second appropriation requests. So certainly we have a lot to celebrate. Short, Mr. Martin. Yeah, short, short and sweet. Yeah, it's been approved through the Board of Selectmen, uh, the Board of Finance, and even though the schedule says April 6th for the RTM Finance and Budget Committee, uh, that was approved last night. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the body that, uh, uh, that's the final determining body for spent capital spending in town. Uh, so it's their responsibility to, you know, convince the broader RTM that it's the right thing to do. And then Monday night is the RTM uh, Rules Committee, which would be responsible for getting it on the agenda for the whole RTM uh, to vote on on the 18th. Uh, and the RTM Education Committee, which opines on the project from an ed spec and, uh, you know, uh, overall educational aspects of the, of the project as well. So I think Jill and Chris and I will probably be on both of those on Monday night as well. But other, other than that, everything is on, on, on schedule and uh, uh, I've had several conversations with Mr. Davis from F&B and uh, we expect to be able to, to get it past the RTM as well. Good, great. And Ray has agreed to come with us to rules sure. on Monday in case there's any questions about the resolutions and how that works with the state Thank and the RTM. Yeah, yeah. So. that'd be great. Yeah. We have to do this right, like the first time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Painful enough. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Um, just quick update on the R architect RFP responses. We're certainly getting them. Mike, you have been uh, hammered with questions. <laughs> a lot, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Today yeah. there was one was like, what, 17? That's, yeah, yeah. That, that's this one. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Um, the, I, I said to Karen, who's been posting um, up on the town website, um, the three questions, they've all come from the three finalists for Arch Ridge. Yeah. Including today's? There was one at the end, <clears throat> but from another firm that was not, but the first three. Okay. Those were the three finalists. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. For, for Ox Ridge. And it's, except for changing the names, it's the same RFP. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? This. Okay. Uh, the so, thorough. Yeah, but you know, they have all the answers. They're up there. I, my, my question was usually these firms and stuff, they know to keep going back to the yeah. website to keep looking to see if there are updates. To, but we haven't put any of these in as an addendum. Okay. So I don't know if that's something. Okay. I'll follow up. You know, do you want me to follow up with mm -hmm. Kate next yes, week? I'm more than happy to. Yes. Cumulative questions for everyone? Yeah, you could say yeah. like, well, each each set of questions asked could be addendum one, mm -hmm. or you could just have addendum one and list, you know, there, there's a total of 28 questions that have been received from various firms. Here are the questions, here are the answers. I mean, some of them are repetitive, mm -hmm. but I just didn't want to be the one that, you know, well, yes. where's my question? Yes. You, you know? Yes. So. Yes. I think that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. 
Um, so if you all have been up on the website, you can see it up there. We actually, everybody knows we have our own, the town, the darienct.gov, we have our own website page yep. and actually we have, there's a category for bids and RFQs and RFPs and it's up there. So um, all the documents are up there, the expects the MCA document, it's all there. Yep. Is the five year, someone asked me about that, is the five year strategic plan. building condition survey? I don't know. Up there. I will ask. I think it is though. No. Let me find out. Um, the school district strategic plan I think is up there separately and it's also up there in the budget document. Okay. Okay. Um, back to you, update on the vendors and the surveys we sent out. Um. I got the uh, hard copy uh, for the surveyor okay. from Redness and Mead. Okay, great. And um, I sent that, I think I emailed that to Chris and you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, that's that's the firm. Um, okay. and, and then I followed it up because there was a the question of the, the stream mm -hmm. under the field. It's identified on the plan as 24 inch reinforced concrete pipe. Yeah. Um, you know, they don't have any knowledge that that's a stream, so okay. they're not going to say that. Okay. You know, they're going to say it's a 24 inch reinforced concrete pipe. Okay. Um, so, so, but but they have that. I, I walked the site with the guy from from the company, from Redis and Lee, and, and he made notes all over the place and, and on each of the plans. Mm -hmm. And and then um, he knows our time frame. Mm -hmm. um, Hygienics uh, wants to come out and look at all the buildings during the April break and then get us the environmental price. He does have all the data on, um, you know, the, the hazardous materials in each of the buildings. He just wants to put his eyes on it one more time before he comes back to us, and he doesn't want to be poking around when people are in the buildings. Um, and then I received the two traffic estimates that you guys have also. So. Okay. So you're waiting to hear back from us on who to hire. Yes. Okay. That's really good. I, yeah. I think on that, yeah, that on traffic. It'd be worth like if you and I kind of sidebar and, and line it up next to the Oxridge proposal yes. and proposals that were received just to make sure that everything's going to be covered. Yeah. I remember there was like an OSTAT uh, process we had to go through with the state <clears throat> DOT. So Yeah, that was something with the size of this building or yeah, the amount know. of kids that were going to be there. There was something that tipped that. It was a, you know, I think it was right. It was like once something got over 100,000 square feet or something like that. Yeah. Or, but anyway, we should do that. Yes. Um, so we'll make an effort to do that this coming week. Thank you. And there was a third company that had asked about um, the traffic proposal. Okay. Um, that I have to get back to. Okay. Um, I told you we'd already, you know, we were getting proposals from two companies. Okay. But I'd let her know. Okay. Yeah, might as well. Back on the survey, given the public comment earlier, do you think that um, that information is that already flowing through to Redness and me? Plans. It is. Yeah, okay. they, they know um, where all the eleven different yeah, catch basins I think, are. I think one of the catch basins is uh, it's abandoned. Okay. Um, it's up under where the garden is in the front okay. corner of the building. That was abandoned when they did some of the additions there, um, but they did add catch basins and uh, you know a solid separator and and um, you know the long and the short of it is that there's a uh, an easement that the uh, the town has where the drain pipe runs from the last catch basin it runs between the first and second house on on um, pasture lane mm -hmm. and it comes out to pasture lane where it goes into a catch basin and goes under the road when it goes under the road, it's the town. Mm -hmm. And the town is familiar with the issues with the neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that the man spoke about, there was a catch basin that went to a dry well in the front corner of the building. And it had just, it was always a pond every time we had heavy rain. Mm -hmm. So we put it, we raised it up a little, put a catch basin in to catch surface flow only. Yeah. 
and we got permission from the town to go out to the catch basin in the street. But I don't remember what size that pipe is okay. in the street, really. And, and up there, you're not catching a lot of water runoff like you would as you get further down near Water Lane. Mm -hmm. But Ed is, is the civil engineer. I'm not, he would know better what those flow capacities are and things like that. Okay. I will check tonight because now that you said that it actually is a pasture lane town related issue, I know that Ed has uh, current engineering studies underway for three areas in town that uh, not the not the normal Stony Brook area type thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but he's doing the Tilly Pond to Grove Street uh, section. He's doing Salt Box Lane, and there was one other. And for some reason, I don't think it's past. You don't think it's past your lane? <laughs> no. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it's. See, when it comes out from under past your no. lane, the water goes to daylight. Right. There's no more drainage structures. Right. And it sits. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to remember if civil and mechanicals were kind of subcontracts. I'm talking about engineering and design of the architectural, or if they were standalone on Oxford. Do you remember, Mike, or anyone? They were. They were under the purview of um, of, of the architect. Okay. Um, he had a company, or they had a company um, that did their civil engineering. Yeah. Um, separate firm that they, they was working with them when they started construction and they kept hitting groundwater. So part of this process on the RFPs is they'll come back with their team. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Do we have any other known issues that we should be looking at this also for homes in the Royal? No. We, you know, homes, the, 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 the water runoff goes, most of it goes down. Um, Surface flow through our property mm -hmm. down to the lake, down yeah. in the back there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, and Royal, it's uh, it drains out to uh, Royal Royal Road. No, it comes from Mansfield. Okay, uh, down to Royal Road. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They were just saying the, the property right next to Henley is the church, is the church, I believe, right? That's the back, yes. It, that's got a ton of impervious. That's a big parking lot. Yeah. It's right awesome. next to the grass. Yeah, yeah, this is this is before Correct. that. Yeah. Okay. When, when you come on, um, there's a White House. But they're talking about pa on Pasture Lane. I, I don't know. I, I guess. Yeah, once you, once you go up Pasture Lane where it starts turning. Yep. And the lady that lives behind the church. Mm -hmm. um, She's had some, mm -hmm. some, you know, sheet water across her property issues. Yeah, I'm just saying that could, I would imagine, I it, it could affect even further up on Pasture Lane. Just, it's a ton of pavement, so it's something to keep in mind when you look at stuff. Yeah, it's something I think we can look into. We can do a little research. Yeah, I, I did point out to, to the, the guy that came for the survey, the catch basin. We looked at all those catch basins. <laughs> I pointed out where the right of way is. We actually changed the pipe from the catch basin, the last catch basin on our property, through that right of way out to um, the catch basin on the north side of pasture. Mm -hmm. That that's all. That pipe is seven, eight years old, okay. and we just had everything rotor rooted, mm -hmm. you know, in in uh, November okay. this year. So it's just okay. done. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We're looking to. Okay. Number eight. Update on the construction. Again on the website. The construction manager? Uh, yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, went on Monday. Uh, we have a new timeline for that one. Um, I'll walk through it. Just give me a second, please. Yeah. Gotta go through all these architect answers. But Kate sent an updated timeline. Okay. Uh, we'll send it around. Okay. It's somewhere in here. Um, but anyway, that is up and posted, and we'll be looking for responses next month. So, um, okay. Any questions about that? No. no. All right. Any subcommittee reports? That's most of what we've done tonight. Okay. The only other thing I'd mention would be uh, a meeting <coughs> a gentleman from the uh, P and Z uh, specializing in environmental on Holmes property on the 18th. Um, to basically just have them lay eyes on that Corbin property 
Because there's a stream, there's wetland the, the conditions. Curtis property. Which one? The Curtis property. Curtis, what do they call it? Corbin. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I just want to get out in front of kind of thoughts on existing conditions and, and also that led to some thoughts about um, yeah, if there were options for use of that with regards to the school project, um, what does it mean from like a, an overall zoning and kind of lot combination perspective? I thought it was, of course, you know, naively thought it was just as easy as a couple of process to, you know, Blend this all into one cohesive homes property, but there may be a lot more of that. Yeah, you know, nothing's that easy. Yeah. But whether or not it ends up being diff you know, a singular parcel or, or lot, um, that's just cleanliness. I'm talking about the ability to actually utilize it. Um, I think so there's absolutely discussions to be had. Absolutely. Is there any considerations for where we are right now and what we're doing that? I don't think we've had that conversation yet, but I, okay. I think we can have that conversation. And we need to talk. The town owns right now that Kurtz property and is under yep. the purview of the Board of Selectmen. Um, it is not a property that is maintained by the Board of Education like the schools are, which is what Holmes is right then. Um, so there are conversations that we would need to be having. So it's like a silo thing. It's like the education versus the town, and you know, we're all it's it's just, you well, you know what the I mean. Care and yes. Gotcha. But it's the, the budget thing. thing. BOE owns the property beyond Curtis, correct? Yeah. Yes. The do you have to cross Curtis to get to it, or is there like a little? No, chamber? Curtis is actually like surrounded offset. by BOE property. Yes. Yes. They used to go through the parking lot to get yes. 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 Okay. Right. Really. So the only thing yeah. that's not BOE is Curtis itself. Because the, the vast majority of the land is Curtis is a small yeah, which, component, right? Which, front, which yeah. would make it seem intuitive that it could be pulled be. in. But I, I had not thought about your broader question of if there's a stream running there and there are wetlands issues, what, how much of it is really usable in any way, shape, or form, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Sorry. No. no, I was just gonna say. Uh, even if there's nothing to construct on it, although I know that we had talked potentially about some additional parking on the, what would that be, the easterly Staging. side. Yeah. Um, but also, it's just general, you know, playground, nature's you know, classroom, in a nature classroom, like whatever type of utilization of yeah. basically wooded area there with a stream, that would mm -hmm. be pretty cool. If that was yeah. like a feature of that school, if there's any way of us to be involved in that process. I think we had talked about when we were doing the tour, of yeah. like, mm -hmm. that's environmental science 101, is having right. a living stream there for kids to learn about, and maybe teach that all the way through high school. Yeah. Be something yeah. possible if yeah. there's, if we can't build on there because it's wetlands, then uh, maybe there's an educational opportunity. Smart idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That's a good point. Good point. Yeah. So when the property was purchased, were you on the Board of Selectmen then? You were? When no, you were I was, was, no, I was, it was previous because um, that house was torn down the same time that the Edgerton property senior center mm -hmm. was taken down, which was a few years before then. So yeah. it was a while ago. 2014. 2014. Okay. There you go. See, yeah. he knows everything. But I think <laughs> <laughs> related to the schools. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot. I will there's say a lot there. Uh, there is a lot. Well, a lot, there. A lot of I think your idea of kind of looking at the property first to see what the value, like what would happen if we used it, is is a great one because I think before we try to go and say we'd like to have it, it would be helpful to understand what we're asking right. for. Absolutely. So I think it makes perfect sense to what start this conversation. Anything I need to do on that, or next steps, or no, you guys know the process a lot better. Okay, week, and then we'll figure out. But we should be having the conversation. Okay, yeah. thank you. What should we tell the architects when they kind of conceptualize? You know them; they're going to come with like, the, like you know, we'll put an amusement park here, and we'll do this. <laughs> There's wheel. What do we? What do we tell them? <laughs> Is it open? You know. So, but I, I don't know yet because I don't know. You know, there, if it's wetlands. How much can we use? Like, I think that right. piece of information would be really helpful well, to know. Right? Well, that's coming with the surveyor. Well, you did you did this with the auctioneers. Can you just say to them, uh, just tell them the truth. There is this other little bit of land. Yep. We don't know, you know, if there are restrictions because of the wetlands, mm -hmm. but it might might be available. So mm -hmm. think about it as you scheme. And I think honestly, if it's if it's we find that it's usable for traffic for traffic, and that's the best use of it, then it makes sense that it goes within our project. If we find that if it's an outdoor classroom, it probably is honestly beyond the scope of this building committee, and so we wouldn't necessarily handle it. 
So I think let's find out um, if it's usable for our purposes, and then okay. if not, it, it may go beyond what we do. Okay. Okay. Um, agenda review. Uh, we, we just came up with, we need to talk about the traffic, study. the traffic study next week. Anything else that we want to make sure we include next week? No? We're good. All right. With that, may I have a motion to adjourn? Mr. Martin, second. Mr. Geraldo, all in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This matter began about a year ago when the RTM approved a project to review the charter and code for these references and recommend appropriate changes. The items that are to be changed were originally identified by a service bureau, Municode, and their report has been reviewed by the Town Government Structure and Administration Committee, that's, that's TGSNA for short, and Town Council. Notice of this meeting and a virtual meeting tomorrow evening was published in the Darien Times on March 17th and on the Town's website, www.darien.ct.gov. The support materials and actual text of the changes is available through a link on the top page of the town's website, www.darienct.gov. In addition to these two public hearings, the public is invited to email remarks to darienrtm at darienct.gov uh, through the month of April. The support materials that appear on the town's webpage uh, consist of several pages of explanatory materials and then uh, followed by a 61 page listing of all the detailed changes that are recommended to the code from 450 changes found within more than 150 sections of the code. Um, this evening's uh, small four-page handout that you have um, is drawn from that larger document. It contains a general description of the project and a two-page Q&A that is intended to answer some basic questions. Although there quite well may be changes to the document before it's presented to the RTM, the TGSNA committee and town council are in general agreement that this report fulfills the mission that we were assigned. Tonight, there are members of TGSNA here and assisting in this process, taking notes, and are appreciative of your time. If we do not appear to be taking detailed notes, which we will try to do, it will be because uh, the meeting is being reported on Channel 79, and that file will be up on the town's website as early as tomorrow. Um, 
So for the purpose of a public hearing is to hear your remarks and not to respond to any but the very basic questions. So rest assured though that the points being raised during the evening will be reviewed by TGSNA as the resolution is finalized for conclusion for consideration by the RTM. I'd like to note that we should set a limit on the length of comments and that limit is uh, two minutes. If you believe that your remarks will take longer than two minutes, you're invited to send your full remarks to the TGSA committee at this email address, DarianRTM at DarianCT.gov. Also, if you wish, you may send a copy of your prepared remarks to the committee using the same address. Comments will be received by the committee for the next several weeks until the end of April, April 30th. I should note that these meetings um, are public and they're open to all the public. If, since their changes are under consideration that are to the charter and code documents of Darien, we'd like to first hear from the residents of the town, followed by everyone who would like to speak, as long as there are people waiting to speak. So now the public hearing is open, and we call, are looking forward to receiving your remarks. As you are called on, please come on up to the microphone and talk to us. So we begin. First on the list is a Amy uh, Sarah. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Amy Zerby. I support the proposal to remove references of gender from the town charter and code of ordinances. I am surprised how antiquated the current charter and code are because the terms and pronouns are all masculine, despite having so many women serving in elected positions. I applaud this proposal to make the aforementioned documents inclusive of all genders. Gender neutrality has been working its way into our public social consciousness for several years. In fact, in 2019, Merriam-Webster declared they as a word of the year. According to a 2020 Harvard Business Review article, quote, more than 12% of U.S. millennials identify as transgender or gender nonconforming, and a majority believe that gender is a spectrum. Gen Z's views on gender are even more advanced. In the U.S., 56% know someone who uses a gender-neutral pronoun, and 59% believe forms should, be, should include options other than man and woman. As we speak, our Board of Selectmen are discussing a community value statement. I believe that inclusivity should be included in the statement as well as a plan to work towards inclusivity. The gender neutralization of the town charter and code of ordinances fits nicely into this plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anne Reed. Talk to us. Uh, I'm happy to. Uh, my name is Ann Reed. I'm here to represent the Darien League of Women Voters um, to highly recommend the gender neutralization or de gentrification, not gentrification, de um, you know what I mean, <laughs> of the town code. Gender neutral language avoids bias towards a particular sex or social gender. This process was started last year and hopefully will come to fruition at the RTM meeting on June 6th. The town government committee of the RTM headed by Frank Kemp used a service called Municode to identify gender specific language to review. Municode flagged changes and offered language substitutes, but the committee made their own changes. The committee did a vast amount of work to look at these identified items as well as terms and language in the town charter that might have been misspelled or otherwise incorrect. Our town council has also reviewed all these proposed changes. Last I knew, the changes encompassed 160 plus sections of the town code and something like 477 edits. I want to thank Frank and the members of TGNA committee for their hard work and dedication to this process. It is long overdue and it brings Darien into the present day. We at the league are very enthusiastic about these changes and we support this effort wholeheartedly. Well, thank you very much. Sue Oakey. Uh, 
Thank you. Glad you're here. I am Sue Oakey. Um, I grew up in town and ha raised my family here. I'm a realtor and I've been served on the board of the League of Women Voters for over 40 years. I am in favor of uh, having the town update the town the language of the town charter and the code of ordinances by removing gender references. We would follow the state and federal governments as well as other municipalities modernizing the language of our official documents. I urge the RTM to help us join the 21st century and vote to have this positive provision. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Short and sweet. <laughs> Lois Schneider. And uh, Tiffany, if you have uh, another few names. Okay. It's, it's Lois and then Jean. And then I've run off the list. Can I get to shake your hand? Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Lois, talk um, to us. Hi, I'm Lois Schneider, and I'm a member of the RTM and have been a member of the RTM for more than 20 years. Um, I support the removal of the references to gender in the town charter and code of ordinances. Our town government is made up of tremendous number of volunteers, of women and men. And I think the documents that run our town should reflect the nature of the people that are actually doing this. Um, it's also the, the, ta the times are, this is going on all over the place and I we function as a very current and up-to-date town, and I think it's essential that we have our, our laws and our um, structure to reflect that also. I want to thank Frank and TGSNA um, for all the work and all the recommendations that you've done taking on this initiative, and I look forward to this passing through um, the RTM and anyone else that needs to sign off on it. So thank you all for your work. Thank you, Rosh. Uh, Jane, Jane Sweeney. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a seat. Thank you. And talk to us. In two minutes. <laughs> Um, my name is Jean Sweeney. I'm married to David Malouf. We've lived here for 25 years. Um, I think I thank you so much for the RTM and all the work they've done. I think we should go back to Mini Code and say to them, we see that these foundational documents do not honor and respect women through the language used, and we want women to be reflected in these documents. We want them to say that we are human beings and we are male and female. We do not want women erased in law, language, and policy. And why do we want biological sex to be reflected? Think about it. We are taking old documents that are based on the male sex, on male pronouns, nouns, and the assumption that women are an afterthought, subordinate and voiceless. We're taking those documents and basically hopscotching over women and inserting language that is, quote, gender neutral. So the new documents do not honor and respect the female. She's erased. Our history is documents on the male morphed into documents that moved to an unsexed humanity. Women are not included. Where are we in the history? And why do we need foundational documents that reflect our humanity as women and men? Because the stripping out of biological sex undermines the protection of women's human rights and ultimately undermines the protection of all human rights. Erasing women as a sex class is a part of an integral system. You can see this now in the attempts to strip Title IX of the protections set up for women in sports, locker rooms, housing, etc. And you can see it in the prisons in California as men gender ID into women's prisons. In fact, inserted into the infrastructure bill is, quote, non-discrimination for actual or perceived gender identity. This strips out the rights, privacy, and safety of women and girls. Women exist as a coherent biological and legal category. The Equal Rights Amendment says that the government cannot discriminate based on sex. If women cannot name themselves accurately
sex, they cannot challenge sex-based discrimination. I ask that you delve into these issues as they are worldwide and you reconsider the gender neutral changes made by an outside company which is making a profit by stripping the humanity from us all. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Tiffany, do we have the... Anyway, is there someone who would like to speak if I don't have on my list? All right. Going once. Going twice. Hearing uh, no more uh, volunteers, I would like to note that this evening has been recorded for Channel 79, will be available on the website, and again, urge anyone who is viewing this procedure to forward their remarks to Darian RTM at DarianCT.gov, where they will be gratefully received. If there's no one else waiting to speak, this hearing is closed. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and welcome to a public hearing in regard to a matter that will soon come uh, before the town's representative town meeting, or RTM. Uh, it regards a proposal to remove reference to gender from the town's charter and code of ordinance. The town charter requires that whenever a change to the charter is proposed, uh, that there be a public hearing 60 days before it is voted on. And this is that public hearing. My name is Frank Kemp. I'm a member of the RTM and I'm chair of the committee that has researched and prepared these recommendations. This matter began about a year ago when the RTM approved a project to review the charter and code for these references and recommend appropriate changes. The items that are to be changed were originally identified by a service bureau, Muni Code, and their report has been reviewed by the Town Government Structured and Administration Committee, that's TGSNA for short, and Town Council. Notice of this meeting was published in the Darien Times on March 17th and on the Town's website, www.dariencct.gov. The support materials and actual text of the changes is available through a link on the top page of the Town's website. In addition to this public hearing, the public is invited to email remarks to DarianRTM uh, at DarianCT.gov. Olivia, could you show the panel? There we go. The support materials that appear on the town's website consist of several pages of explanatory materials, including two pages of a Q&A that's helpful, followed by a detailed 61-page listing of the over 450 actual changes that are recommended within 150 different sections of code. Although there quite well may be changes to this document prior to presentation to the RTM, the TGSNA committee and town council are, are in general agreement that this report fulfills the mission that we were assigned. Okay, tonight as members of TGSNA, uh, uh, Tiffany and I will be taking notes and are appreciative of your time. If we don't appear to be taking detailed notes, which we will try to do, it's because the meeting is being recorded by Channel 79 and that file will be up on the website as early as tomorrow. Uh, thank you to all the support systems involved in running our town ch Channel 79 and thanks to this evening's supervisor and camera operator, uh, Olivia, uh, name only. So the purpose of a public hearing is to hear your remarks and not to respond to any but very basic questions. Rest assured though, any points that are raised during the evening will be reviewed by TGSNA as the resolution is finalized for consideration by the RTM. I'd like to note that we will set a time limit on the length of comments, and that limit is two minutes. But if you believe that your remarks will take longer than two minutes, then you're invited to send your full remarks to the TGSNA committee at the email address uh, that, uh, that we have up on the screen again. And if you wish, uh, you may send a copy of your prepared remarks to the committee. 
at the same address. I'd like to uh, uh, hear uh, from residents of the town first, followed by anyone else. And now the public hearing is open. We look forward to receiving your remarks. Uh, please uh, just raise your hand, this crowd. And so we begin. Uh, Carmel, uh, the floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you guys for holding this uh, forum for public comment. And thanks to everyone behind the scenes um, who are putting it on and making it happen. Um, I, hopefully I will not take up uh, two minutes. And I'll apologize if you can hear my two-year-old. It's bedtime and she is M-A-D. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I really just want to say thank you guys for uh, the work that you guys have done trying to move this forward with what you say, Frank, was your mission. Um, I just want to voice my support publicly for um, removing the uh, gender terminology or um, up, I want to voice my support for updating the town charter and any other um, important governing documents um, that use language that is dated, non-inclusive, um, and, um, uh, you know, just gendered. <laughs> it doesn't need to be that way. I think we can sort of w move beyond um, putting things in uh, he, his terms uh, that don't necessarily have to be. So um, just here to voice my support and say thank you guys very much for your work on all this. Well, Mel, thank you very much. Uh, very nice to do that. Now, Dan, uh, you have the floor. Um, I will. I will be short. I'm Dan Guller. I'm an RTM member, but speaking as an individual, and I see this proposal is all upside. There's, there's just. I keep looking at it, and I see no downside. So, uh, thank you, Frank and Tiffany. Thank you, everyone on the committee. Um, also, want to thank uh, uh, former RTM member Michael Cortese, who I know helped uh, birth this uh, project. Um, I'm anxious to continue moving Darian into the 21st century. Well, thank you very much for both of you. And therefore, not to be rude, but hearing no other testimony and seeing other, no other testimony, uh, with many thanks to you all, this hearing is closed. Thank you, Olivia. This is Jack Davis. This is the um, RTM Finance and Budget Committee. The time is 7.33, and I call this meeting to order. Um, we have four things on our agenda. Three of them really deal with the same thing. So I'm just going to go through a couple of things. We have some members of the Three Musketeer Building Committee um, here. That's um, Holmes, Royal, and um, Henley. You know, all for one, one for all. Um, so um, to answer any questions that we have, but basically there are three separate bonding resolutions. So if I go back a little bit to um, how this came about, the Board of Ed in May did their education specs in um, May 21. Um, August 21, the Board of Selectmen authorized the uh, forming of three separate building committees, one for each school and an umbrella committee, the HHR. And then we followed the same in September, doing three separate committees and HHR. Part of that was at the time, 
the board of uh, the state department of education and the people who do the reviews had advised us that we need three separate um, building committees and i'll get more into that later so um we will be doing um bonding and appropriations separate for each of those because even though they now said that we might not have needed three separate committees they do need to look at each of these projects individually because part of our reimbursement will be calculated based upon the number of students what the future enrollment is what the square footage of the schools are and all these other little metrics that are individualized to each of the three schools so it's very appropriate that we could end up with three different reimbursement rates the state also has to figure out whether or not we're a renovation or whether or not we're an expansion or whatever else it is and there's differences on whether or not um, we do that if it's a i believe a renovation i may get them mixed up um, if we're putting something up in the tiles and we're taking down the tiles and we don't put those same tiles back up, they may not be considered part of the reimbursement rate, but that the committee can figure out and we'll know more about that later. The important thing to know is that this is nothing more than seed money. Um, they got the original seed money in for 121,000 from the Board of uh, Finance from their capital reserve. That was so that they could go out and hire a grant writer and start some preliminary work we um will do this on our meeting on the 18th 10 days later they'll have the full amount so that they can start to go and negotiate some real salaries so that they can meet their timeline of coming back to the board of finance and the board of selectmen in the latter part of may and to us in june for the real cost of these projects um right now um we're going to do three appropriation and bonding resolutions at our june 9th meeting each of those three will be amended for the full amount so um while there's a methodology for how they did their calculations um i'm going to say it really doesn't matter because they just need enough money to carry them through um to june so that um, they make the june 30th cutoff um the importance of the june 30th cutoff is we're not allowed to start on the schools until the department in the department of education for connecticut has reviewed our plans and said here's what the reimbursement rate is going to be so if we don't make the june 30th date we end up delaying the project for a year which isn't necessarily good because if you recall one of the portables from i believe hinley is scheduled to save us some money and move to the um, fire tower so getting all this stuff done is um good so let me go and um i have to print one thing out and then we can it, it, are there any questions on this while i'm yammering away Do you want Chris to just take a minute to introduce himself? I bet a lot of the folks on the call have never met him before, and we're lucky to have him. Well, I don't know if we're lucky to have him, but he can introduce himself. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. It's probably too early to tell. Um, <laughs> anyway, hi, I'm Chris Price. Um, this is my first experience in town government. Um, I'm very very pleased to be working with this committee and i'm really really pleased that i have jill mccammon and david martin by my side helping me um these guys know their way around and they've been super for the you know for a couple of months that i've been involved so far um but you know we have a big project we have um three three schools that are going to be significantly renovated you know in really really round numbers each school is about a twenty million dollar project, um, and we've got a really compressed time frame to get our grant package together. Um, as Jack was saying to the state, that has to be submitted by no later than June thirtieth. Um, it's got to be three separate grant applications, as Jack noted, um, and they're 
could be be real variations um, between each of the, among each of the three, right? Depending on whether they're deemed to be alterations and expansions or renovations. Um, as he was saying, the formula for square footage will impact the reimbursement rate. So each one needs to be looked at carefully. We think we have a good grant consultant helping us. Um, so you know, when we had a, a very productive um, meeting with the state, a virtual meeting with the state yesterday, Dr. Adley arranged that, and our grant consultant was on that, and that was we got a lot of information from the state. So um, and it sounds like there's going to be a, an open communication line with them as we, um, you know, as we proceed ahead. But you know, please, if you guys have any questions about the methodology for calculating the amounts we're asking for, you know, as Jack said, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty educated estimate, but it's an estimate, right? And it's really bridge appropriation so that we get the authority to sign up the actual architect, the actual construction manager, some of the, the more high dollar consultants like traffic consultants and folks like that, that we're going to need. Um, so um, we kind of backed into it using now one year old estimated budget numbers from Northeast Co uh, Northeast Cooperative Architects. And you know we'll obviously sharpen our pencils and have a lot more uh, you know a lot more clarity, a lot more precision when we come back in uh, you know in June for the for the full appropriation. So Chris, you're gonna find that when I give the report to the RTM, um, I'm going to sort of not talk about the numbers because my experience will be that even though we say, oh, these are good estimates, but they're estimates and they could be higher, they could be lower. If they come in as in, in higher in June, somebody in the RTM is going to ask you to reconcile between the numbers that we are giving them in April and the numbers we're giving them um, when it comes back. So I spoke to Jen about it, and I'm going to say that they use some basic philosophy, put an in inflation rate of 7.5, which is what the administration is using, and they added 10% contingency. And the only number I'm going to give you is the combination of the three schools will fall someplace between 70 and $80 million, and leave it at that. Um, so I think that that eliminates when we when you come back I'm, I agree that it was very scientific and your approach was really good but for the RTM for this first round of initial funding it, it's, that's, um, fine. that's fine with me credit to Dave Martin on the methodology and the calculation but um, but yeah that's um, you know that's fine with me yeah I just want to make it a lot smoother the, the last time I had already spoken to Dave about the madness of how we're going to try and get it through. But are there any, thank you, Joe, for having, um, reminding me that Chris should be introduced. Everybody knows Jill at this time. Um, and David being a former alumni is, um, in good shape. Um, uh, so I think we're in, um, overall good condition. Are there any other questions, um, for the building committee? If not, then um, I need somebody to move consideration and action on an appropriation of $1.4 million for planning, design, construction, and renovation slash extension or um, alteration of the Holmes Elementary School in the town of Darien and authorizing the issuance of bonds and notes in the amount of $1.4 million to meet said appropriation. Uh, moved by Beth. Seconded by Peter. The good thing about having kids is that you have crayons still around. Um, okay. Um, do I have any no votes? Do I have any abstentions? Um, seeing none, this is unanimous. Okay. Second resolution consideration and action on an appropriation of um, 1050000 for the planning, design, and construction for renovation, extension, or alteration of the, uh, oh, the... I'm sorry, the first one was Hinley. Sorry, 
Inley was one point uh, four million. This is Holmes. So uh, we're, we're going. Can I have a motion to adjust the motion for the following one to say the one point five was for uh, one point four was from Inley. I have Beth. I have uh, Louisa. Everybody is in favor of it. Thank you. So now we'll go to Holmes. Um, <clears throat> construction for the Holmes Elementary School for the Town of Darien, authorizing the issuance of bonds and notes in the amount of one million fifty thousand to meet said appropriation. Do I have somebody move it? I have Beth. I have uh, Martha raised her hand before, so I'm going to take it from the last time. So I have Martha seconding. Um, do I have any no votes? Do I have any um, abstentions? None. It's unanimous. And finally, the last resolution is consideration and action on the appropriation of one million two hundred fifty thousand for the planning, design, and construction for renovation, extension, or alteration of the Royals Elementary School in the town of Darien, and authorizing the issuance of bonds and notes in the amount of. One million two hundred fifty thousand to meet said appropriation. I have Barry is moving it. I have Louisa is second. Um, do I have any no votes? Seeing none. Do I have any abstentions? Seeing none. It's passed unanimously. Thank you all, um, Chris, Jill, and David. And I'll see you on um, Friday. Um, I spoke to Ed. He's out of town with his family, so um, he won't be joining us. All right. Well, thank but, you uh, all very much for your time on this. Um, really, really appreciate your consideration um, of this so we can get moving. And we'll, I guess, meet with the Rules Committee on the 4th and then with the whole gang on the 18th. Sounds April. good. Thank you, guys. Much appreciated, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on to the budget. Um, I'm interested in any comments um, on the deliberation so far at the um, Board of Finance um, budget deliberations. Last night they covered um, Parks and Rec, um, Public Works, and um, the Board of Ed, I was a little surprised with the direction on the Board of Ed and the questions that were asked versus what wasn't asked, um, because some of the questions that asked really have more to do with the um, contract negotiations that will be starting shortly, um, but we're out of control um, once you have a contract of the administration as, um, or the Board of Finance. So, but it was interesting information, but nothing budget related, in my opinion. Um, but is, are there any comments on the budget so far? Is there any comments of what? Go ahead, Beth. Well, the only thing I wanted to just highlight is the um, apparent difficulty. This is probably going to come as a surprise to nobody, but the apparent difficulty there is in obtaining vehicles that we've already budgeted for. Um, vehicles last year that we had um, appropriated money for one of them they just got and the other two they're still waiting for and so it means that vehicles that were in the Board of Ed budget for this upcoming year we are needless to say anticipating similar issues because there just aren't any cars on the lots anywhere and you know they want a Suburban to transport kids but it's hard to put, get your hands on a Suburban. Well, that, that, that was the only thing that I was I, interested I, to note. And, and I sort of, and I apologize to uh, Mr. Palin, I sort of put him on the spot um, um, because they, they have a couple of options here. Um, they could have, I forgot the meeting also on Thursday, but they can meet on Thursday, move to get those vehicles and take them from the general fund, have a memo written by the Board of Ed and submit it to Seth by Monday when we're meeting on rules. And we can put it on the agenda. It'll go to the Education Committee and ourselves. Um, 
and we can get them approved so that if we meet on the 18th, on the 28th, because it's 10 days afterwards, they would be able to put in the order for that, which really moves it up by almost two months. All right. The other, and in fact, they could then remove those vehicles from the capital budget when they're voting on it on the 5th. Or they can choose on the 5th to go and make that motion. And then when we go on the budget night in May, we could vote on that separately. But on a night that we have so many other motions going on, it's not one that I would prefer because it just complicates things. Or they could do nothing and then um, effective um, July 1st, they can put in the order for for the um, for the vehicles. And since I don't think anybody's discussing whether or not we shouldn't have those vehicles, I would only hope, and, and when I spoke briefly to Jen, Jen um, agreed with me, it just makes sense for them to address it at their Thursday meeting, um, move it on to rules on the 4th, and let us just deal with it on the 18th so that we can get out ahead of getting it so that you're right, Beth, especially on the suburban, they get it sooner and it saves them and the town money. So, David, I, I was just going to tell you, I, I have the agenda for Thursday and there's a, a transfer from the Board of Finance contingency to allow that to happen. So, it should be this stuff. It should be tomorrow night. Okay, so you're doing it from contingency? That's what the transfer reads, yeah. But just then for the Suburban? $62,000 for the Suburban, yeah. That's an interesting concept. Well, that allows them to do it. No, the reason is if they have the money, all right, then... Um, if it comes out of the contingency on Thursday, then on Friday they have the appropriation. The it, They don't have to wait for the RTM to meet and the 10 days following, so um, they can order it the next day. So they can order it on Friday. So it does pick up about, um, you know, 30 days or so sooner. So no problem with that. At least it's being done. But it's just in suburban. By the way, while while we're on, one of the things that I should have mentioned earlier was um, Sarah Newman is on uh, this call. Sarah is the board of uh, selectmen representative on the HHR umbrella committee. So I just want to recognize that Sarah's here. Thank you, John. And you're welcome. Um, and Ed has joined us, and unfortunately, Ed, we've already gotten done with the um, resolution on um, the three bonding. Um, is is uh, there any other comments on this budget? Because if there is none, um, I think we have a meeting scheduled for the six that I might have to change, but I just assume that if there's no desire to make any modifications to, you know, beyond what the Board of Finance may do, um, that we meet early in April and approve the budgets um, and, and move forward and go from there. So, you know, unless anybody wants to wait around to the latter part of April to do this, I'm willing to take advice from anyone. Eric, you're saying we wait for the Board of Finance at this point to tell us what they're doing, and then we meet. Right, right. I mean, okay. one of the things one of the things that I've asked from um, Jim Palin is to give us um, that he has to be able to give some direction. Um, you, you went before the town and said, you know, two and a half percent, three percent. Now I think we can all agree that the 3% based upon the rising healthcare costs and some of the other fuel costs um, are, you know, made life a little bit difficult. But 
um, the concept of, uh, I was thinking about it after one of the um, individuals spoke last night in um, the public um, comment part of the Board of uh, Finance meeting. Um, it's real nice to say inflation's at 7%, all-time high, but it's worthwhile to look at how the inflation number is comprised. A good part of the inflation is based upon the increased cost in cars. Well, the operations, the basic operations of the town and the um, Board of Ed isn't buying cars. So that inflation factor should come out. When we're doing vehicles, yes, I would expect in the capital side there's going to be some increase. The other big increase is on fuel, but the school is locked into their fuel um, throughout um, 2023, so that's not going to be affecting their budget. And the other thing is food. And that might affect the cafeteria prices of what the kids are paying, but it's not the running of the schools that are affected by inflation. So while it's nice to say, oh, inflation is horrible, um, the fact of the matter is, is some of those same drivers aren't really um, affecting the school's budget. Uh, a lot of it has to do with their adding um you know, eight or nine FTEs. And that's, you know, at 100000 a shot, that's 900 to a million dollars right there. Um, I had a private conversation with one of the Board of Finance members whose name I'm not going to be mentioning, but in that conversation, they said that the Board of, Fi uh, the Board of Education spent more time talking about DEI and um, open choice than they did about the budget. And I added in bring your own device, and it's true. So when somebody said that, oh, speaking that they did a deep dive into the budget, I was wondering if I missed certain Board of Ed meetings that they attended and I was unaware of, because I personally didn't see that. That being said, we'll wait for the direction to see where the Board of Finance is coming out, um, I don't think they're happy with um, a 3.75 increase, but whether or not it should be a 3.5 or 3.25, you know, they're the ones who are going to have to determine and also then reconcile with how come you come and say 3% to us and three months later it it's like goes out the window. You know, next year, don't bother telling us what the guidance is if you're not going to live by it. So um, just my initial reaction to that. But any other comments on the budget? If not, um, can I have a motion to approve the minutes of our last meeting? Um, I have Barry, I have James. Um, do I have any no votes? Seeing none. Um, do I have any abstentions? Seeing none. Uh, minutes are approved. And once again, we're going to try and get this done in less than 30 minutes uh, for the second meeting in a row. Uh, that we should keep on this roll for, for a while. I like these type of meetings. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Um, I have Peter. I have too many hands raising at once. I'll take Bird as the second. Um, all those in favor, I don't care about no's and abstentions. Have a good weekend, all. See you soon. It's um, Tuesday, March 29th, and it's a regular meeting of the Board of Darien Board of Finance.
I'd like to call the meeting to order at 7.33. I appreciate all your patience. We're just having some members um, get situated here. The first item on tonight's agenda, as it always is, is public comment. We had two folks sign up this, morning, uh, this evening to speak. First one is Carolyn Kennedy. Just a reminder, public comments approximately three minutes, and just speak into the microphone, and although you can't hear it in the room, Channel 79 will record. Pick it up? Okay. Yep. Um, good evening. My name is Carol Kennedy, and I live at 19 Stephanie Lane. I am one of the co-chairs of the Middlesex Parent Association, but tonight I speak to you as a parent of two boys in the Darien Public School System. I speak in support of the Board of Ed approved budget. I have also attached a six-year historical analysis of the school budget and four future models. Please take a look. Prior to making the choice to stay at home to raise my children, I built, implemented, and managed budgets for large retail corporations. And I believe that the way we all speak about the school budget is incomplete. We need a better way to understand how cuts will directly impact our students. Dr. Adley and his team have dutifully explained that the majority of the school budget is fixed. The only flexibility is within operational dollars which amount to just over 19 million of the 110 million proposed budget, or about 17% of the total. However, within those 19 million is approximately 12 million in special education dollars. We are, rightfully, legally mandated to provide special education to all students who need it, which means those dollars are also effectively a fixed cost and cannot be lowered. This means we have only $7 million, or 6.3% of the total, that are flexible in the 22-23 Darien school budget. I like to call these 7 million general education dollars because these are the dollars that go directly to each and every one of our students. These are the dollars that pay for curriculum, technology, music, art, libraries, and more. These are the dollars that will be impacted if you, the Board of Finance, choose to make a cut to the school budget because they are the only place the Board of Ed will be able to make changes to meet your cuts. I personally believe that the way we need to discuss the impact of any cut is to look at average general education dollars per student which have been consistent over the past six years with an average of approximately $1,444 per student. At the beginning of the budget cycle, guidance was issued that the school budget should not exceed two to two and a half, half percent. Well, how would that work in a budget with so many fixed costs? Let's take a quick look. With a school budget increase of only 2% over prior year, the average general education dollars would drop by 374, which equates to a loss of over 26%. So in other words, if we use your guidance, we end up cutting general education dollars by 26%. I don't know about you, but as a parent and taxpayer in this town, I do not accept any drop to the dollars that will go to my students, let alone a double digit decrease. A decrease like that would impact student materials, access to technology, curricular efficiencies across the middle school and high school, and more. It is important to note that what the Board of Ed has proposed is a modest 4.6% increase to general education dollars in an environment where inflation is much higher than that. Dr. Adley and the Board of Ed have presented you with a school budget that covers their needs without padding. In fact, the Board of Ed already cut about a quarter of a million dollars. I urge you not to cut further. Our town value is directly linked to the success of our school system. I ask you to please protect our schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Amy Zerby. Good evening. My name is Amy Zerby. I live at Nine Morehouse Drive. I support the proposed Board of Education budget for the 2022-23 school year, and I hope that you will support it as well. During Board of Ed budget discussions, the board members combed through line items weighing the importance of the line items to taxpayer burden. I attended those meetings and can attest that they did a very thorough job of vetting the most important line items. If you are considering a cut to the school budget, which I do not support, please take into consideration that a cut to the budget could have a meaningfully negative impact on our students with only an immaterial benefit to town residents. And I think that is a bad trade-off when it comes to our children's education. Please support the proposed Board of Ed budget. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else in the room that hasn't signed up that would like to speak? Thank you. Okay. If you could just state your name for the record. Hi, I'm Lorene Bora. I live at 38 near Water Lane. I'm the chair of the Parks and Recreation Commission. 
Um, I'm also a former member of the Board of Finance, having served with Murray Stegelman and Liz Mao, so understand what you do. Um, I'm here this evening on behalf of the Parks and Recreation Commission and ask that you support the Parks and Recreations Department fiscal 23 budget without further reduction. During the pandemic, as usage of our town parks skyrocketed, the Commission drafted and adopted standards of care to serve as the guiding principles for our work. The standards of care document, a copy of which I will leave with you, states, the Commission strives to maintain Darien's parks and recreation facilities in a high uniform standard. Utilizing the developed standards in conducting our annual parks tour in October, as well as individual Commission member and RTM parks and rec committee members personal visits, we set out to quantify and rank how the parks currently stack up against the established standards. While the first round found that many of our parks overall meet the standards of care, areas of concern were identified. The parks that were identified which need work or significant work were Cherry Lawn, both the natural areas including the pond and the gazebo, the Maguan Playground, and Pear Tree Point Beach, both its natural and landscaped areas, the tree canopy, and the building itself. The proposed operating budget includes funding to address both enhancing the visual appeal of our parks and a growing threat to our parks habitat, invasive species. The concern over the invasive species taking over some of our parklands is significant enough that the Commission has formed a committee to develop both short and long range plans to address it. Invasives refer to plants, insects, and pathogens that are not native to our area. As these species establish and spread, they are replacing native plants and altering our natural habitat, often with disastrous consequence for the plants and animals that depend on them. Habitats are being damaged and sometimes completely destroyed. Several tours of Cherry Lawn Park, including as recently as this past Saturday with subject matter experts, have identified numerous invasive species that will threaten the environment of the park, and to put it bluntly, they're starting to kill our trees. If not soon addressed, it mu they must soon be addressed. I'll provide you with a few pictures, as well as a description of some of the identified invasive species provided to us by Laura Mosier, a Yukon Master Gardener, Darien resident, and former RTM member, who has graciously agreed to serve on this committee. The funding to begin addressing this problem is crucial, and I expect this will become an annual request. I'd also like to make note of the Commission's disappointment the requested funding for painting the Weed Beach concession and paddle buildings was deferred from this year's coming budget. The winter months have really taken a toll on the building's exteriors, and we are concerned that exposing shingles to the harsh seaside elements for yet another year will cause further damage to the buildings. Simply put, the condition and appearance of the buildings do not meet our standards of care. I'll provide you with pictures and would really welcome the opportunity to meet any or all of you down at Weed Beach to take a look at it with me. And in fact, in future years, we would really welcome you to join us on our annual parks tours to really get a good sense of what we're looking at and what we're thinking about firsthand. The RTM Parks and Rec Committee members join us and it's, it's turned out to be a really great, great annual event. Meanwhile, we will work with the town staff to see if there's any way to find alternate funding for the painting. The Commission is very appreciative that our parks will be the beneficiary of significant ARPA funding and we commit to using the funds thoughtfully. We are in the process of establishing a playground committee with representation from each elementary school to develop a comprehensive plan for our inventory of playgrounds. During the last two years, Darien Parks have been rediscovered by our residents. With over 400 new apartments coming online in the next few years, the Commission expects that demand on the parks will be greater than ever. We are incredibly grateful for the hard work of our parks crew as well as many community volunteers, including the Friends Groups, that do the physical work to take care of our parks. I hope that we can count on the Board of Finance to support the department with the funding needed to both maintain our parks and provide diverse and exceptional programming to our residents. Thank you. And I will leave you with some pictures. Okay. Thank you. Is that it? That's it. I, I will say on, on your point about the tours, uh, I think it's, it's well taken. Most of our board, as well as some of the RTM all, for the first time in many years, did a firehouse tour to see all three other firehouses plus the training facility at the transfer station. It was very helpful. So right. so I do think it, it might be a good idea for us to join it. Super. Yeah. Thanks.
Okay. The, uh, the the next three items on the agenda all relate to um, the bond authorization for the Hindley Homes and Royal School Editions. Um, this has been talked about at our last meeting significantly. It was talked about last night at the Board of Selectmen meeting. Um, Chris and the, and the committee presented there. So I know we have a lot of people from the Board of Ed today here tonight, but I was going to say we'll continue with this as the next item on our agenda. I think it'll be relatively quickly and then we'll move on to discussing the budgets. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, I'm Chris Price. I'm the chairman of the Hindley Homes and Royal School Building Committee tasked with renovating those three elementary schools. Um, as you noted, Jim, last night we presented to the Board of Selectmen uh, a request for what would have, what, what are needed to be three separate appropriations and three separate resolutions uh, for the next phase of funding for that building committee for those three renovations. Um, we have to do them as three separate appropriations and three separate resolutions um, by state requirements uh, in terms of how we present our grant applications to the state. Those like, likewise have to be presented as three separate applications. Um, Dave Martin, Martin can go into the specific methodology if people would like him to as to how we calculated the numbers that we came up with. Um, important to point out that these numbers, this is kind of a bridge request, if you will. A few weeks ago, Board of Finance approved 102,500 to allow us to <clears throat> have the authority to retain certain outside experts, a grant consultant, land surveys, hazmat surveys, things like that. This is the next phase which will allow us to actually retain architects, retain contractors, um, hire some of the more high dollar consultants that are necessary to get the grant consulting, the grant submission together. Um, and understand that these numbers are, that we come up with, that we're coming to you uh, with this evening, are educated estimates, right? We don't have final plans as we get into the process of hiring architects and then having the architects develop charrettes, which are basically very preliminary mock-up plans, we'll be able to put a finer point on the numbers. Um, we also learned today in a, uh, in a meeting with the state, uh, the state organization that handles the grant approvals um, that Dr. Adley coordinated, that the reimbursement rates and the items that could be subject to reimbursement or not subject to reimbursement are all going to you know, still move around based on whether this is determined to be, our projects are determined to be um, a renovation or an alteration and also based on certain formulas, statutory formulas driven by enrollment and size of school and things of that nature. So those numbers are all still subject to moving around. Um, but bottom line, uh, and I refer you to the memo that our committee put together that Dave Martin really drafted uh, for the Board of Selectmen that I think you guys have, which is we're, rec we're asking for three separate um, appropriations, three separate bonding resolutions to allow us to hire, um, hire architects and engineers, hire construction managers, do hazardous material testing, traffic studies, et cetera. Um, the specific numbers that we're asking for uh, are 1.4 million for Hindley, 1,050,000 for Homes, and 1,250,000 for Royal. Again, three separate appropriations, three separate resolutions. And as I said, if I want to get some more detail into how those numbers were arrived at, I would defer to Dave if you'd like him to, to go through that. Mm -hmm. I mean, does the rest of the board have any questions? I know last night, I listened to the meeting last night, and I know you went through some of it then, but did I? I watched it yeah. last night. I mean, I'm just assuming if we don't use all the money, it rolls into like the pot that we can use later, right? Like there's yeah, the, the, these monies will replace the money that was approved last time. Basically, with the money last time, uh, we engaged uh, the um, the, the uh, surveyors and the asbestos and liability testing. We've got the RFPs out for the architects for narrowing the process. But the next phase will be to engage th 
three of the architectural candidates to produce the charrettes. We pay them for that, and in the meantime, uh, the RFQ for the uh, construction manager and others are in process, so depending on when those things happen, there needs to be some monies uh, allocated. We are anticipating receiving the charrettes from the architects from the three finalists on the 9th of May. Uh, which creates a pretty tight window because with those uh, charrettes we get fairly detailed cost estimates of their designs, right? And then between conversations about which design we're going to pick or which elements of which designs we're going to pick, we will pin down what we believe to be the best number to use uh, on a go-forward process and then uh, these resolutions, and my understanding from Jen is, these resolutions end up becoming amended to represent the larger amount that will include the, these amounts. So it gets rolled into the, the number of Basically it all gets now, rolled, it gets rolled, rolled in, in. All gets rolled larger, in together. What effectively becomes the final number that we then go to the state with. And likewise, what we're requesting tonight replaces the 102,500 Right. that you guys approved a few weeks ago out of the um, contingency fund. So that more that more broad resolution accompanies your final cost estimate and that all has to be in place before you submit to the state by the end of June? Correct. That's correct. Same process with Oxridge. That's the $63 million number for Oxridge. And uh, we, we, we hope to be uh, as on budget as the Oxridge project has been. And similar to the Oxridge, the ultimate bond resolution that, that the RTM passes in late May or early June will be for the gross number, not net right. of the state fee, because you need full, fully baked plans right. and you need sort of a full bond resolution to pay for the gross amount, not the net amount, right? Right, and you have to be able to show the state how much has been approved at the town level before they back into the percentage that they would be reimbursing. And, you know, Technically, we'll have the charrettes, but we won't have architectural renderings, right, until after the RGM approval occurs. So we won't, even, you know, have the final, final plans. Okay. Yeah. And then, as a matter of process, assuming you all approve what we're requesting tonight, we then go to the RTM Rules Committee on the fourth of April to get this appropriation, these appropriations and resolution proposals on the RTM board for the 18th, which is, I think, their next meeting for approval. Got it. So, so that step of going for the smaller appropriation is sort of necessary because this is more money than we have in our capital contingency account? We wouldn't be able so, to, 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 to fully contract with the architects yeah, right. if we didn't. Yeah, we, <laughs> and the, yeah, the construction manager and the architects, in order to actually sign those contracts, which are going to be um, substantial contracts, we need to have the, the full amount of the funds appropriated. Okay. That's not a matter of just amending the other resolution, because it's coming from a different place? Or? Well, yeah. Coming from a different place. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think the 102.5 was actually a resolution. That was more approval by just the board yeah, out yeah. of your capital yeah. contingency mm -hmm. right. fund. So, yeah. And so this gets it's it in place so. before we actually receive any invoices yeah. to make any The 102 jump-started this process. This effectively jump start the larger sort of $72 yeah. million. Dollar and then I believe the 1025 goes back into your capital contingency fund. So, um, yeah. coming from a different place. Okay. Well, I don't have any questions. No. Okay, so Jen, the only question I raised was did Don Council have any comments before we send the resolution to the RTM about the ability to go to 30 years with the language that's in there? Or is that okay? The language that's in there allows you to bond as long as allowed. Okay. And because school projects are allowed are allowed to go 30 years the language that's in there allows you to do that if you choose when we go to issue. Okay. Okay, well, we could do a three or we could just do one motion to approve. Can we do one motion to approve all three resolutions? I would do all three separate. I think last night okay. the Board of Selectmen did okay. three separate motions. Okay, so can I have a motion? I have a, mo a motion to approve a appropriation and bond authorization for Henley Elementary School renovation in the amount of $1.4 million. Taylor, Dan seconded. All in favor? It's unanimous. I have a motion to approve the appropriation bond authorization for Holmes Elementary School renovations in the amount of $1,050,000. Taylor moves. Paul second. All those in favor? Unanimous. 
Can I have a motion for the appropriation and bond authorization for the Royal Elementary School renovation in the amount of $1.25 million? Taylor moves. Paul seconds. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Chris, thank you. Dave, thank you. Okay. So the next item on the agenda is going to be our part of our sort of budget workshop, if you will. And we have three areas that we're going to focus on tonight. The first one is the Board of Education. Um, second is Parks and Rec. And the third is Public Works. So I think since the Board of Education is representing 80% of our occupancy in here, we'll let them go first. Um, so, you know, we sent across a handful of questions to Duke and Allen and Rich over the past, um, you know, earlier this week and, um, and last week. And so I know you had prepared some answers to that. I do think just given the timing and given the fact that we added some of the questions as recently as this morning, do you want to take a few minutes to kind of walk us through, through those? Or Rich? Okay. The only thing that Channel 79 requested is if you're talking we just need you to walk to the podium so they can hear you. And uh, do you have the, the Yes, we do. Yep. I think the final one's And, and, and I, I would say, Rich, on some of these, you know, the, the answers are much simpler. Sure. Um, I think, you know, if you could walk us through and give us a little bit of background on the health care. I think as some of the speakers pointed out, personnel and personnel related costs that's it's 80 percent of the budget yep so i think as you'll see from in terms of themes of questions that we've had you know throughout the process and tonight a lot of them focus around that 80 percent yep in terms of what it is and how fast it's growing sure. um so just to start there was just a question whether or not we anticipated any movement on the health insurance uh, rate increase uh, we're still expecting it to be that 8.75 percent um, what's really driving that renewal rate is just uh, high claimant dollars uh, we do have a large amount of uh, cancer claims primarily, uh, which are driving up those uh, those rates. Um, along with that, um, it was asked, you know, who is our current provider? Our current provider is Anthem. And we've been with Anthem since uh, fiscal 21, July 1st of 2020. Um, we've talked about it in the past, but um, in 2020, uh, 2020, we joined a consortium of a bunch of municipalities and board of eds. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily to pool our claims together, but to essentially provide a large purchasing block to a provider and say, look, we can sell you a book of business of almost $70 million in exchange for a more favorable rate. Uh, and so including Darien, uh, Regional School District 7, which includes uh, New Hartford, Winstead, Colbrook, and Norfolk is in it. Uh, the town of Thomaston, uh, the town board of ed of Naugatuck, uh, Lipson, the town of Old Saybrook, uh, the Stratford board of ed, uh, the town of Weston, uh, the town of Winchester, the town of Holbrook, and then New Hartford, uh, the town of New Hartford. Um, so for the last few years, it's been pretty favorable. If you remember last year, uh, we had Connecticut as an option. They actually came back with a 34% renewal rate. Uh, we looked at some other options. Those were also double-digit uh, renewal rates. And kind of leading into the other question about the state plan. Uh, so the state plan right now is looking at approximately an 8% uh, renewal increase. Um, it was expected actually to be about 12%, uh, but the state government is using ARPA funds to kind of lower that premium cost um, to, uh, to municipalities and board events who are part of the state plan. Uh, one of the concerns that we have and our insurance consultant has with it is the loss ratio associated with the state plan. So for every $100 they collect, they're essentially paying out 101. Uh, so the question about solvency uh, regarding the state plan is certainly a concern. It's one of the reasons Westport is actually looking to leave it for the next fiscal year. Uh, I'm talking to Fairfield, they're looking to leave it as well for the next fiscal year, and then Weston as well is looking to leave it in the next fiscal year. Um, the state plan is a PPO plan, so it's a much more generous plan in terms of benefits for employees. Um, so a lot of the municipalities and board of eds who have gone there have had to negotiate it with their unions. And given a PPO typically has a higher uh, cost of the plan but no HSA contributed to it, a lot of those school districts have actually had to negotiate lower premium cost shares for their um, employees. So you actually lose a little bit of revenue because the plan is a little bit richer. And a lot of districts have also seen what's called adverse migration. So right now, Darien has about 200 employees who waive health insurance. Um, given that it's a PPO and not a high deductible health plan, it looks a little bit more favorably to an employee who might want to go on to a PPO plan. Um, and so when talking to our insurance consultant and the districts that have moved 
um, in Fairfield County, it's been about five to 10% of that population has actually migrated back onto the health insurance plan. So if you couple that um, with the lower PCS share, there really isn't a savings for the Board of Ed to look at the state plan. Um, there was a request on how we break out um, different health plans by the different bargaining units. Uh, so we did include that. Uh, the cost of the plan is the same. Most of the bargaining units pay 21%, with the exception of the parish and the secretary, they're at 20%. Um, as I mentioned, we have about 200 employees who waive. Uh, the majority, obviously, are the teachers. They're our biggest bargaining unit group. Um, and then within the health insurance account, obviously, is the HSA account uh, that the board uh, contributes, dental insurance, vision insurance, life insurance, things like that. Um, there was a question about student activity accounts that are not considered donations. Uh, so we do have items that are not considered donations going in the student activity account. Um, a good example would be ticket sales for Theater 308. Uh, so the plays that go on in the schools, there is funding uh, that's raised through ticket sales that get collected, and those ticket sales really pay for the, the cost of running the play. Um, a small amount in terms of library lost book fees, typically what happens if a student loses a book, they're charged a fee, that fee is a check that, that's collected through student accounts, written to the Board of Ed, and then the replacement book is purchased. Uh, we do have some voluntary athletic fees, music attire fees, um, those are all within the student activity accounts as well. Uh, Rich, on, on the student activity account, things such as ticket sales for theater versus the cost to run those, are any of these significantly net positive, like sure. the, 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 what you collect for lost books versus what you pay to replace them, or what you collect for the music attire versus what you pay for the uniform. So for the library books, we probably collect less than $1,000 across the district as a whole, and we spend pretty much close to $1,000. It's usually a wash. Um, we do have a policy that we sweep the accounts at the end of the year. Um, so that small amount of money could you know, maybe be a, you know, $20, $30 a school. Um, in terms of ticket sales, it depends on how well um, you know, they're attended. But for the most part, it's typically a wash. They might end up, you know, positive a thousand here or there, and then it gets reinvested whether it's in like set construction or costumes, things like that. Um, but there really isn't a lot of money that sits in those accounts. It's not one of the ones that we typically sweep a lot out of. Um, and then the music attire fee, they pretty much know what they're going to have to charge for, whether it's a tuxedo or a gown or something like that. So again, there really isn't a huge spread there as well. Okay. So were the biggest sort of contributors really the gate receipts sure. and the parking revenues because the the costs of those were really born inside the budget and the revenues were going or a portion of the revenues. So for the most part uh, in, in the past, gate receipts have been collected in the student activity account and it's been one of the primary areas that we actually sweep the money and it goes into the district account. Uh, so there is a recommendation in next year's budget to put the gate receipts um, in the Board of Ed's budget. Um, typically, you'll see in a lot of communities, whether it's uh, New Canaan, Richfield, uh, Weston, Wilton, usually you see a, like a contra account, so you see that revenue account hit. And gate receipts typically pay for you know police or campus monitors that you might have in an event. Um, and then the parking fees, um, we spoke about this at a Board of Ed meeting. A portion of it in the past had gone to the Board of Ed's budget, about $11,000. And then another portion of it was used to essentially fund like senior events, like a senior day or things like that. Um, so some districts choose to levy a fee. It could be you know twenty-five or fifty dollars, and that's collected. And then you have the senior event. Um, so instead of using that parking fee, there is a recommendation to put one hundred percent of the parking fee in the board of ed's budget. Um, the district does have you know approximately seventy-five thousand dollars in the district student activity account, which represents the money that we've swept over the last few years. <coughs> um, so our recommendation would be before actually levying a fee on parents students that we start dwindling down that account because we obviously don't want to sit on that money for no reason and no purpose so that the kids and the students can still have those senior events. Okay. And in terms of parent donations, in terms of other accounts that are sport specific and so forth, those still sit in those accounts until they're used? They do. So within athletics, we have sub accounts for you know, football, hockey, soccer, whatever the sport is. Um, so if a parent makes a donation of $100 to the baseball team, it sits within the baseball team account, and usually that donation might be for, you know, a special helmet or gloves or things like that. Um, so usually it's a bit of a wash. We do end up sweeping a little bit of athletic money, um, but not a significant amount. And those dollars all lapse. So they, they stay in that account, right? They do, yeah. Okay. I think just back on the, on the health care, um, on the cost, this is the district cost or the total cost of the premium in that fourth column there? 
Uh, that is the, the, the total cost, the gross cost. Okay. On a, on a sort of per employee basis, right? Correct. So if somebody has a single plan as a teacher, um, the cost overall is $12,000. If it's a family plan, you're looking at about 33000 Got it. And I know, this, you know, in, in the budget, just because some of the adjustments that the Board of Ed made at the end and so forth, it, it, it seems as though what you're budgeting for new employees or the average employee is about twenty-two, twenty-three thousand dollars So typically, because we don't know what the average employee is going to have, we budget the employee plus one figure. Um, assuming, you know, some might take the employee plus one, some might take family, some might take single, and in the end, it should be relatively close. And some may take none, right? Some may take none. I, mean, I was going over some old notes and the out of district transportation um, it was COVID concerns that were like limiting number of kids riding in a vehicle but has any of that changed uh, so there's still a, uh, a difficulty in a driver shortage throughout the state and really throughout the country um, so we used to do what's called ride shares where if you know Stanford had kids going at the same location, uh, our kids would go in the same uh, van with the Stanford kids and we'd split the cost. Uh, we found it increasingly difficult to get those. Um, that coupled with the fact that uh, bus companies are offering bonuses to employees, fuel costs are going up, um, you know, we're seeing rate increases you know, north of four or five percent uh, for a lot of out-of-district placements. I mean the sharing would actually help with the shortage of drivers, I would think, right? It would, but a lot of districts, um, given the lack of buses, have kind of been hoarding them. And then in some instances, you have you know parents who don't feel comfortable having uh, their student because of COVID concerns with another student. Or is most of the special or out-of-district transportation, is that generally associated with, with students with sort of higher cost programs that the ECR then kicks in? Yep and reimburses 75 Typically. or 80 percent. So yep. it's the right way to think about it. If if they're going out of district, it's probably at that, at least the incremental costs over 100 and so, yeah, I mean, it was about 103 this year. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you typically for someone getting transportation, they're usually an, an ECR student. Um, so you would submit reimbursement for those. Okay. But it's in the 75 percent range, right? For next year, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you still pay, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, Just kind of continuing through some of these questions. I know one of the questions we had were, were there any items in this budget that you felt like if you don't order them until 10 days after the RTM vote, you know, sort of late in the season, yeah. are you at risk of actually being able to acquire those assets to use come late August. So I think the biggest concern are probably the ones in the capital budget, the three trucks, so the Suburban and then two of the facility trucks. Um, so if you recall back in September there was an appropriation to replace some of the flood trucks. We've only actually got one of the three trucks. We're still waiting on production for the other two. Um, so receiving the trucks is probably going to be the biggest concern. Uh, the one that would affect negatively the operating budget would be the Suburban. And so if you could order that today, I mean, is that something that, given that you haven't received the other two trucks yet that we approved mm -hmm. six months ago, five months ago, when do you actually expect to receive that truck? I mean, are so we, we were already looking in, at it. So originally we were hoping in March. We got the first one actually a couple weeks ago. Um, we're hoping the other ones will be maybe May or June, um, but no guarantees, they said. Um, we were quite lucky to get the third Suburban that was in the budget for fiscal 22. Uh, but even that, you know, we placed the order, I think, in July. We didn't get it until about Thanksgiving. Okay. Any questions? We discussed the health care consortium, not consortium, but um, committee that you suggested. Like, has that been discussed at all? But looking at it. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I sent the email to both to Duke and Monica and about setting up as <coughs> really as soon as possible, I think, just given the, the sheer increases in the costs here, <coughs> about setting up some type of committee between the Board of Ed and the Board of Selectmen and to look at other options, including <coughs> whether it's a consortium, whether it's self-insuring against some level of loss, just given that we have AAA rating, we have solid reserves and so forth. I 
think given like just the sheer increase of both in the town and the Board of Ed side, and I appreciate that you're doing a lot of things to try to to work on it, but I do think it's 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 increasing at a rate that's fast enough. If you look at just the increases in the grand list this year, above and beyond the normal swimming pools and additions, just the tax revenue from some of the big developments, you, you'll see that will begin to come into the budget, this into the grand list this year. Just the taxes from the, from $100 million worth of real estate will be more than eaten up by just the increases on the Board of Ed and the town side and the health care. So I think that's why we, we think it's fairly important to, you know, Alan and Rich, we talked about this, you know, trying to get something set up after we get through budget season here to really get our, put our heads together and look at sort of the art of the possible on this. For the following year? How does it work with a consortium? If, if we're increasing by 8.75, if you look throughout those 10 different schools in the consortium, what were their experiences? Uh, so it ranges anywhere from some got about 5%, uh, some got 12%. Uh, it really depended on their claims. Uh, the bigger districts um, and municipalities like Naugatuck really helped out um, because they actually have very low claims, and so that purchasing power. Uh, so all these districts are fully insured. So they're making the, the insurance company is making a bet that what they're charging you for insurance is going to be more than what the claims actually end up being, and then they kind of end up winning out. In our case, it's been the reverse. They kind of haven't won out. Um, because our claims have been higher, and so what they look at is you know that total block of communities and how does that look, and then they look at the claims and then they kind of aggregate out you know what would a renewal rate be for a Naugatuck, what would be for a Darien, what would be for a Weston, a Stratford, and that's really kind of how they get those rates. So, the, so the, the the rates are set for each individual town based on the pool performance pool for performance. each specific town yes. or the aggregated pool across each specific the town. town. Uh, so if the, if the rates are set based on each specific town, how does participating in a consortium help because you're effectively getting a rate that's based on the, on the pool performance of the town only, whereas the idea behind a consortium is you provide a larger pool to the insurance company so that the, the loss severity gets spread over a broader base. So for them, it's the book of business. They want $70 million up front. It allows them to corner the market. Um, the state partnership plan is also Anthem. So if you kind of look across Connecticut and the 169 municipalities there in Connecticut, you're gonna see an overwhelming majority of them with Anthem. Um, what they don't wanna see is those starting to chip away. Um, and so, you know, there is, you know, small metrics that say, um, you know, because there's a small book of business, you're gonna get a little bit of a lower rate than you would be if you're on your own. Um, because they want that large purchasing. It guarantees them, in this case, $70 million of cash flow every year, each year. So is that another way of saying that your relative change is based on your specific performance, but the absolute charge is subsidized to some degree by participating in the program? And is there any way to measure the degree of subsidy by participating in the pool? So if we were to go out to market individually, we'd be looking at a double-digit double digit increase for next year. And do all the towns in this consortium have a high deductible plan? Yes. Solely high deductible yep. plans. I mean, they have different funding mechanisms, yeah. whether it's you know 50% or 40%. Um, and then obviously they have different premium cost shares, but it, it is they're all high deductible. And do any of them self-insure inside of those? I believe they're, they're, they're all fully insured. Rich, with respect to excess cost, how many move-ins occurred during the summer that resulted in students being uh, in excess of the ECR threshold? So for this year, we had six. Okay. And for next year? I know you have your roster of students. Are there uh, X number of students you allowed as possible move-ins? Uh, so not necessarily move-ins, but we have what we call watch lists. So kind of people that are on our radar, mm -hmm. whether it's somebody that you know has intended to say they're coming to Darien next school year, or you know somebody who's currently here and then we're expecting something to happen. So we have what's considered a watch list. Okay. Thanks.
And in terms of our systems and so forth, I know there's a lot of time and energy and money invested in those over time. In terms of tracking and reporting, you know, every dollar. Yep, so every dollar, um, everything gets stamped with, uh, you know, an excess cost eligible student. Um, we have every, everybody on the list, and even if we think they're gonna come close, you know, we'll track them just in case we can submit. Um, obviously the kids we can submit, we track, and then we have the chance to update it again for the March 1st submission. Um, so we pick up everything from whether it's salaries to salary and benefits to staff, related services, whether it's you know, speech, PT, OT, transportation, if it's an out-of-district placement, the tuition, if there's a parent associated with the student, um, if there's software associated with the student, you know, any, any cost associated with that student that we can submit for. And in terms of the audit that they do every year, has, you know, I noticed, I mean, there are small amounts, I know that sort of flow back through our, our end of year, is it ECS yep. grant? So typically what happens is you make that submission for March 1st, and your March 1st is your, um, you have your actuals, and then you have what you're assuming is gonna happen from March 1st to the end of the year. Um, so obviously some things can change between March 1st and June 30th, and so then when you kind of have that chance to update and everything gets audited, you typically have some small minor adjustment. It could be maybe a student didn't attend all the days that they were supposed to attend, maybe they left, maybe they got a little bit more services, some less services, um, and so then there's an excess, co excess cost adjustment that gets tied to the ECS payment in the following year. I think those Jen, those have been relatively small, I feel like in the twenty to $30,000 range. Uh, I would say like 40 to 50, okay. plus or minus, sometimes get additions occasionally there's a subtraction. And I think the, the ECR is built in as a sort of revenue to the Board of Ed budget, but the ECS flows into the general town fund. Um, okay. You just remind me, how are you guys ultimately handling the BYOD program? I read that, how does that work? Sure. Um, so we, I mean, I'll let Dr. Adley talk a little bit. So we still have the iPads. Um, with the exception of the 12th grade iPads this year. Um, they're all functioning iPads, they're in good quality, we're expecting to retain those iPads. So if a student doesn't have a device, whether it's they forgot it for the day, um, the parent doesn't want to give them a device, you know, whatever it might be, they have that option to get that iPad in the library. But then there was, if there was financial need, then it was yeah. a MacBook Air? Correct, yeah. And why the difference? Why the difference in well, we want to make sure that if someone can't afford a device, that they're not given the worst device or the, the lowest common denominator of the device. So the replacement for a BYOD if somebody needs is, a, is not an iPad, it's a MacBook. Yes. And are you purchasing those in anticipation of that? Or are those going to just be response? So we'd likely purchase a handful to have, and then if more come throughout the year, then we purchase as we go. I'm sorry, can you define what you mean by a handful? Are you talking about like four or five, or are you talking about? Like about five. Okay. In, okay. And those are built into the next year's budget? Correct. Okay. And are we phasing in then for like, in the future, when someone doesn't have a device, are we gonna, it's gonna be all MacBook Airs eventually? No, because the, stu the, the students have the choice to bring you know, whatever they want to bring to, to, uh, to school at the high school level. We're not going to change the, the model through the middle school. That's uh, not necessary, nor I don't think development may appropriate to do that. Uh, but at the high school level, uh, the students ultimately will have their choice of what they, ultimately what they want to bring. And hopefully that, that Right. I mean, in, in the case where someone doesn't have a device yes. right now, they're getting the iPads because we have those. But in the future, we're going to be stocking like backups as MacBook Airs instead of well, we, we, we're going to give them the MacBook Airs. That's what we would do as we move forward. Our hope is that that'll dwindle uh, as time passes. And we, uh, we'll have fewer and fewer of those cases, but we'll certainly make sure that the, those students who don't have that device will, will have one. Currently, everyone gets an iPad. Correct. So this, this current the high school, year, yes. everyone gets yes. an iPad. Next year, if, when it's BYOD, if they don't have a device, they can come to you and you could provide them. And, and we also are, are keeping some iPads for this is a transition, right? Um, so there are some subjects that will use uh, iPads. Could be music, could be another department for a specific purpose. Uh, so we'll keep those on hand. We also use them for some testing opportunities that, that are required. Uh, so, we're, so we're not completely throwing the baby out with the bathwater in terms of certainly utilizing those resources. We're gonna make good use of those resources that we have. And I would say that 
I'm just wondering if there's a change in policy as we go forward since we've, we're shifting now, like are we gonna keep, keep going with that? Because these are obviously gonna age out, the ones that we have. The, which ones? The, like, the broad, the iPads that we yes, have. Yes, yes, yeah. So I, I guess on, in terms of the current iPads, you're assuming you were going to sell three to four hundred of them at essentially at, the senior class. Yeah, yep. I think I had spoken to Kate, or I think spoke to Jeff Adams about if we could, rather than recycling some of them, I think some of them could be could be used. I think a handful they could they were going to look to you to see if they could transition to the senior center, Mather. Senior the Mather Center sort of you know loaner program. Mm -hmm just to expand that, but I think that was a handful. I do think, you know, one of the things I had mentioned before, and I think I had such guys an email, I think it would be, to the extent they're just gonna be recycled, I think to the extent the board offered the community the ability, or the, the seniors, if you will, the, the ability to, to purchase them for the same price that you're going to sell them for. I think that's something you could perhaps consider. I think if the board approved. Yep. Yep. I wonder if the MacBook Air is the new backup plan if people don't want to purchase one. I mean, are they, do you think we'll see that rise, like by changing devices going forward? Will we see? A rise in number of, I mean, it's, is it an opt-in, opt-out? I'm not really calling it an opt-in, opt-out. It, it, it sort of plays out like that, I guess. If, if someone, the bottom line, if someone cannot or does not bring a device, we will provide them with one. We're not really calling it an opt-in. Budget control that was lowered, I think, during the, the board of ed deliberations from three to two. Correct. So we do have two in the budget. Um, we do have three elementary sections within three uh, three students of tipping. Uh, we have Royal Kindergarten Tipping first and Holmes third. Um, so it has been the practice of the board to budget in flexibility for those class sections that are close to tipping uh, within three or four. Uh, so that's that is how the budget is built. Do you have any sections that are possible to break the other way? Uh, we do have uh, one that is one student uh, shy that could go the other way, isn't sure. yeah. Richard, one of the questions I had, and, and to Alan and the board, is you know, when we did the student tour, like what, what I guess what I think about, or maybe what I've been taught to think about in terms of flipping is when it drops below the minimum or goes above the maximum of the board class size 21 or 24, I think it is, 25 on some of these. But just going through the tour of these schools, you know, it was mentioned or became apparent that some of these classrooms you just can't fit the maximum in. So when you're thinking about the tipping and what you may need budget control for, are you not only factoring in just, you know, where is it between 21 and 25, but where is it relative to the actual utility we can get out of those classrooms? Because it, you know, in, in connection with the excess capacity that we have in the schools, I had went through and done some initial calculations just looking at average class size versus maximum times the number of units to try to figure out how much room, but it seems like it's actually less than that. So that particularly was highlighted during the time of COVID. Uh, where we had additional sort of social distancing. Now we're talking about over the past two years. Uh, so uh, within the buildings, the administrators, principals had to move. They like to sort of cluster each grade level together, but in some cases we didn't do that. We moved them all over the place a little bit uh, because of the actual class sizes themselves. Without that social distancing, for the most part, we can, uh, we can certainly accommodate our class sizes. Now, do, do some of the class sizes are they to provide a wee bit more space than others? Yes, and hence one of the priorities of the board when looking at those three elementary schools was one of the priorities, first of all, to safety, get rid of the portables, and the second one was to right size some classrooms uh, to, to make sure instructionally uh, those children have the same sorts of, of experiences. Uh, so on and on. Do, does it work now? Yes, it does. Uh, but it's not optimal, uh, the space, and that's why we're actually right sizing some of the classrooms. And the third reason was to redo the libraries, but. So you're living within the existing classroom sizes, even though some of them are not optimal. Yeah, but the principals in general, though, will make accommodations. If it's too tight, they will, but they will still, even in a normal non-COVID environment, uh, move a classroom around to accommodate it. So you're saying all, each classroom can accommodate the maximum class size, right. but that may not be necessarily when you determine it's a, it's a break if the classroom right. is too small.
In terms of the detail on the salary increases, I appreciate you kind of putting together this graphic. It, it was actually, I thought it was quite helpful. Um, you know, it, it, it actually shows that the, you know, the, the largest portion of at least teachers are receiving between four to five percent. Yep, so the majority are kind of in that, <coughs> excuse me, the middle of that uh, TEG. So you see the majority between that four and seven percent. Uh, 270 and plus 36 between five and seven. And those that are all presumably between zero and three. So those are typically, for the teachers, those are typically the teachers on the top step. So all they're getting is GWI, there is no step. To them. Which was 1.5% in the last contracts. And what causes that 10% plus? Oh. Uh, so there's quite a large gap between step 18 and 19. Um, so typically what happens over time is if you have either no GWI or a small GWI between steps, you know, four and 18, and then you have a one and a half percent GWI or sometimes even higher at the top step, essentially you start to have a gap between those two steps. Uh, and that's how you end up getting a 10%, you know, relatively 10% raise between going to 18 and 19 because you're getting the GWI plus the step. What's GWI? General wage increase. General wage increase. Thank you. That's the amount of sort of one step if you were to hold step constant for year over year. Has any thought been given to resizing the grid to do away with that? So I mean, typically when you have uh, negotiations and you have that kind of like a bubble at a top step, mm -hmm. you look towards breaking that bubble and maybe inserting right. a step between. Obviously, teachers aren't usually amenable to that, um, so it is like a give and take. It might be that you end up, you know, reducing a step at the bottom of the grid, and then you kind of break that bubble at the top of the grid. Um, but it would have to be done through negotiation. Okay. And can you talk a little bit about turnover? I mean, I, it, you've been been fairly consistent in terms of how you've been estimating. I know this past year there were so we did have 54, which is rather large. Um, we had about 30 that kind of fit the normal turnover, uh, where we actually saw you know roughly like $20,000 of savings between the person who left and the person who was hired. Um, we did have the, that balance of 24, where the spread was either um, quite small or actually inverted, where it actually cost more to hire the teacher, and it really depended on the subject matter. Um, so when we built the budget for fiscal 23, we kind of took out those individuals where it was either inverted or the spread was small. So we looked at essentially 30, which was what our typical turnover was. Um, and the savings is typically, if you look at fiscal 21 in that $20,000 range, obviously if the teacher grade increases every year, you should expect a you know, relative increase to that spread as well. Uh, so that's what we looked at. But you, you, I think you indicated in the budget book there 20 or 30 or so that were generally on the lower steps? Correct. Were these relatively, were these teachers that were relatively new to school? Uh, they were, I mean, they were relatively new. They were uh, under step 10 who left. Um, and so what happened in, you know, some of them left to go to, you know, places closer to home. Uh, some of them went to Westchester where the pay might be more. Um, so in those instances, and depending on the subject matter, uh, it might be that we lost a teacher at, let's say, master step eight, and we ended up hiring a teacher at master step 12. Um, so those were kind of like those 24 that we put aside that were kind of out of the normal realm of turnover. Have we seen, I forget now, have we ever seen like a comprehensive over time study of, you know, number of teachers that have left, average change in salary and all that? Just to know, I mean, I'm curious, like how, how random is it? Or is, is there, are there trends? Like, is that, is that a report we could get on an annual basis to kind of start to feel what you feel? So I've only been tracking it since I've been here. Um, and I would say, you know, your Darian's typically been in that, you know, 25 to 30-ish range. I think we did see more people leave this year because people were burnt out and didn't want to teach anymore given the circumstances of the previous year. I think a lot of people valued being closer to home given what happened. So we definitely saw a, a spike in the number of teachers that left. I would say in the last, you know, three years or so, we've really been in that, you know, 25 to 30 range. On a percentage basis, so have, there's 470, 480. There's about 488 teachers. That, that's a characteristic that's happened around the nation, uh, uh, locally, but also around the nation in terms yeah. of people making professional decisions, um, and then compounded with 
perhaps some, you know, get tra they can travel. A lot of our staff travel as well. Uh, so all of those factors are are also they're also competitive factors. I talk to my right. colleagues. Everybody's short of staff. Uh, all over the place. Um, but I think that applies to a dishwasher, to a teacher, to, to someone else. Uh, it's a sort of a, an indication of kind of where the economy is right now. But um, we have the traditional March track shows. We have the traditional reasons that challenge people. Uh, we live next to New York, uh, so they attract also. Um, so we have that, and then you have on top of it COVID. Uh, you got sort of a perfect yeah. storm, so to speak. As a percentage, how many are retirements versus how many are resignations? I probably have to look that up to give you an accurate yeah. number. I'd probably say, you know, a third is probably just resignations and the other okay. two thirds are retirement. Is that something we could get a report on on a, on a go forward basis to know, you know, kind of if we are, you know, if we're going to hear during a contract negotiation that we're not competitive, right? It would be good to have that data to know how many people left for another district versus yep. how many retired. Yep. Um, so we will typically we'll know when somebody's going to start collecting on TRB. So that means they're retiring. Um, whether or not they'd share where they're going, um, I would defer that. I think, yeah, I think I'd like a, you know, probably a further discussion about that in terms of like for respectfully for the purpose of it or otherwise um, because of contract negotiation. I don't want to yeah. think out of contract yeah. negotiation, even anything tonight, to be honest with you. Um, but I'm certainly happy to have the discussion yeah. about the, the request. Well, uh, there's a question I have and wonder if you could sort of like he hear us a little bit of discussion on. One of the, you know, I think this year was a great example. I mean, every year there's new programs that are proposed, right? Whether it's a language, whether it's a idea program, sport, there's always sort of new new programs percolating through. I think in this year we saw you look at at least one program, the the one-on-one -on -one device, where you decided to change that, and obviously, and there were savings associated with that. We're just, you know, we're buying 400 less units. One of the things I guess I would like to see, just as we look at the overall budget, I mean, 80% of it is teachers, or I should say, staff and benefits. So, it's really, it's price times quantity, right? That we have some type of control over, and then we're really. And then we have the, the concept of benefits, which are about 18 of that of that 80 percent that we're really a price taker on. And so I think, as one of the speakers talked about, that doesn't leave a lot of other cash to look at sort of new programs and other things that are not employee related. How do you think about managing like your portfolio of programs? How do you think about every year? Here's a new idea, because I don't know that on this board we're really will able to discern, and maybe as a parent I have opinions, but as a board member, like how a new language compares to or is better or worse than moving away from one-to-one -one device and allowing them to bring their own. How do you think about it? How, what is the process you go through every year in terms of reevaluating the portfolio of what you're offering? Should we be adding a language and subtracting a language? Should we be adding a new a psychologist but removing some other type of program that we have because if we if we do have a small amount of non-personnel related dollars in this case 20 percent of 106 million how do we make sure that we're that you're getting the the highest roe roi on that well i think that i think that the community i would take this opportunity to say i think that the community gets a wonderful return on investment here um, uh, uh, from an educational point of view I think it, it, there's a variety of things, uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that, that go into that. that. One would be the board goals. Two would be the strategic plan. Uh, there are programs that are regularly reviewed by the board, whether it's a new program coming in, such as a math program, whether it's a present program, such as uh, a talent and gifted program. Uh, our, there's another question here about the department heads and so on and so forth. Those, those people are invaluable, uh, instructionally and curricular-wise. They're also part of the, uh, those discussions. Uh, so we, we do those, we have those discussions, we look for efficiencies. This year, as you say, uh, actually the reason to go to one-to-one -to -one wasn't necessarily for the efficiency. 
in fact it wasn't for the efficiency, it was time to do it, the right time was to do it now, given where we are, that realised efficiency. We have two other efficiencies, small as they may be in the budget, the uh, solar and also the shift to the out of district transportation to save money. So we're always looking at other ways that uh, uh, are reasonable ways to realise some efficiencies as we go forward. Some of those are from the strategic point of view, I've mentioned the board, board guide documents, board requests, um, others are administrative in nature. Uh, so the budget process really, at this point, is really nearly a full year process. It starts right away in September. Uh, we've moved that process up earlier and earlier, in many cases, to look at programs. Uh, and we also look at the personnel. Um, we, have, we have let go uh, quite a few staff last year, over the last two years. Um, so it, it includes looking at, at staff and other different ways to do things and so on. So all of those things are on the table. Some of them are more strategic in, in the process. Others are organic in process. Um, and um, evaluating some of those programs, some go through a complete evaluation process. Others are uh, based on the uh, professionalism and professional input for, uh, from our standard staff. You know, in, in terms of overall personnel, I know we've, when you say we've kind of let some go, I don't think we've, it's generally you've managed all of that through attrition, right? Uh, not necessarily. No, not necessarily. No. Or reassignment, no? No, we, we, we have let some positions go. Not necessarily an attrition, no. Well, following on what Jim said, his prior comment, when you, when a department head or chair or a teacher or a principal comes up with a new program and the administration, the, the school administration and the district administration thinks that's a good idea, is there a corresponding dialogue of how are we going to pay for it? Uh, for example, if, if, you, if you, Mr. and Mrs. or Mrs. Department Chair, you want to spend $25,000 on this initiative, can you help us figure out where we can find $25,000 in the budget or some amount in the budget to either help pay for it or to pay for it. Is that a dialogue that occurs kind of regularly when new initiatives are bubbled up? Or is it or is it more in the budget process, just efficiencies kind of independent of these new programs? So it's not it's not just a mutually the idea of uh, <coughs> suggesting new programs, new, new initiatives, whatever you want to call them, right? Um, new programs for kids or otherwise. It's not just a mutually exclusive event from well, it doesn't matter how much it costs. I mean we we were not we wouldn't be that cavalier or, or that disrespectful to the process, but, but I have a responsibility to bring back to the table what I think our district needs and what does the students need um, for the next year and years, years moving forward. The board then engages with me in that, uh, in the oversight of that. And some of those charges could be, uh, those, some of those charges be, could be given a year before or something to look at something, but it, it's their responsibility then to look at that and have a dialogue with the administration that's, and then take ownership of it. And, of how to pay for it or how not to pay for it. Um, <coughs> I, again, it's just this, it's, it's not, we don't sit down and have a discussion about a new program without talking about finances, of course we do. Um, but I guess maybe, I, I think what, at least what I'm trying to say, I think what Dan was getting at is, as you think about sort of new programs, I mean, yeah. listen, all programs and staff are valuable, okay? And they all sort of add to the, I'm sure, to the educational experience. But I guess when you're looking at adding new programs, are you thinking about this new program by adding it, we're going to get substantial value out of it. So let's look at other programs. While valuable, maybe delivering substantially less value, and by shifting resources from one to another, you know, you can continue to enhance the overall educational experience, but do so by sort of re you know, redirecting funds. Reallocating the portfolio of programs. Yeah. Right. And by the way, there's no one suggesting that you're cavalier. And oh, no, 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 I am sorry. Okay. No, I, I just want to make sure everyone watching doesn't think that. <laughs> that again, they're not mutually exclusive uh, ideas that uh, I would not align one with the other necessarily, right? Um, but if, if there are programs that have run their course or if there are experiences or activities or, or programs that does uh, need to be reevaluated. Re you can't do it all at once, obviously, right? Um, uh, we would engage in that particular process, but uh, we look to see, in the budget process, we look to see if we can make trade-offs for certain resources, I'll call them, right? Um, and that, that is an actual part of, of, of uh, the budget process. 
before I bring the board to uh, the, the administration for recommendation. So, so all those processes go on interchangeably and ongoing. I think too on the in my time on the board, the the administration comes to the board and we actually look at all the classes, all the electives, and we look at what the enrollment is in those classes and have the conversation as to there's less and less enrollment in this elective. Why are we continuing to do that elective? And the board and the administration has brought to us other options to maybe wind down that elective. There may be a reason to keep it based on students or a need, but that's a continuous process. I think the addition of Mandarin is a is a perfect example of really the community wanting to increase the overall world language offerings and bring it down to the middle school. So I think that process has been worked on for years in terms of how we're going to expand our language, what does it look like, where does it start, and that came to fruition over the last year. So I think in my almost eight years on the board, we look at that every year in terms of electives and classes and class sizes, and when they do their curriculum review based on changes that are needed through state mandates or just updates to the overall curriculum, it is, it is just part of that process that the board goes through. Yeah, I, I think, listen, as one of the speakers pointed out, right, there is a small set of dollars outside of personnel costs. Our personnel is very valuable, but I think we need to, it's incumbent on both sides. On the town side, as we're thinking about services, whether it's Parks and Rec or other things, and on the Board of Ed side, I think to continue to make sure we're, we're, we're always redirecting funds in the, to the best, um, you know, to the best programs. I'm actually a little bit less concerned with the programming. Um, I mean, I'm glad to hear that you're re reviewing it for enrollment and need. I mean, as the world evolves, I think it's great that we're adding opportunities like this, like Mandarin. Um, certainly, if you know something has, like you said, grown out of its need, then we, we should be reviewing that. I'm glad we are to get rid of it. But I think it's more challenging on the personnel side because it is such a big part of the budget and because we are adding so many heads this year. Like. It is harder to manage the effect, or to measure the effectiveness, maybe of some of these, you know, management style insertions of department chairs or new vice principals. I mean, how actively are we reviewing the efficacy of those additions to the budget? Because it's far more money than any of the programs we're funding. So I can say to you, if, for instance, uh, the, the assistant principals that we added, have been invaluable. Uh, both in the special education arena uh, and also in the regular education arena. I think if you can talk to our parents who are involved with, uh, with these people, uh, uh, they, they would, they would uh, speak to that. Um, and the department chairs themselves, look, they're involved in everything from instruction, curriculum development, uh, evaluation, supervision, uh, and they also work with all the constituents. They work with the teachers, they work with the students. Uh, and they also work uh, with, with our parent populations. So I think the, the board has asked for and gotten yes. updates on those programs. We got a Correct. recent update on the psychologist that we added. Alan has, uh, and Chris has briefed us on assistant principals. We've asked for more detailed <coughs> overviews of the programs. Uh, and the department chairs also. And there's nothing to say that the board will do a full look at those programs in the future. Um, it's always open for discussion if someone brings it up and wants to be a topic. But I think what you have to understand too is there is a process that we went through to come up with the department chairs and it was vetted thoroughly at the board level, the reasons why and the outcomes and all that type of stuff. So it's not to say it shouldn't be and isn't reviewed on a regular basis. We can decide what that regular basis is. And if the administration brings a thought to us that it is or it isn't working or the changes might have to be made, the administration does that. Well, yeah, I, I, I think it's, listen, I think you guys have obviously looked at a lot of the programs, programs like the assistant principals, like the, like the um, department heads even at the cafeteria, looked at new ways of sort of redesigning and delivering those services to do it more efficiently, right? And right. I sort of applaud, um, and I think so do the 500 kids that are in line at the pavilion every game, I applaud sort of the food service program there. But I think um, so we, there's only a certain amount of dollars. And while I think we can, um, 
there's always room for debate in terms of whether it's prudent for budgets, just town-wide, to go up by 2% or 3% or 4%. We can always sort of have that debate, and, and, a, and a, I think it's probably a little bit more art than it is science. Um, and it's part driven by what's going on in that one year, what's going on with the grand list, and a lot of other things. So it's, it's never just what you're spending by itself, it's what's happening on the revenue side. But I do think when we look at what we spend in, the, in this town overall, whether it's on the town side or the, or the Board of Ed side, we have to first look at what do we want to spend between annual operations and what do we want to spend with capital. And for instance, this year, I mean, we're spending significant amounts. We're, we're just finishing up a, or close to finishing up a 60 million, odd million dollar elementary school and we're about to embark on three more renovations. And on the town side, you know, we've acquired open space. We have a Great senior center. We have, you know, when we decide on how much money we're going to spend every year, we have to decide to allocate that between capital and and um, and operations. When we decide to spend the portion we spend on operations, again, whether it's town or the board's board of ed side, you need to sort of decide what are we going to pay to do what we did last year, and then what are we going to pay to sort of develop something new, a new program that is, you know, no doubt valuable, but. You know, new programs will generally cost more money. So I think we need to think about, as a town, both on the school and the town side, how do we sort of allocate between capital and operating? How do we allocate between sort of, you know, keeping what we, what we had last year and new programs that we want? And then how do we allocate between, you know, sort of new programs, you know, the cost of personnel, the quantity of personnel? It's, I just think, given that, you know, there is, there are not unlimited funds. We're not the Federal Reserve. We don't have the ability to just, you know, as they say, print money. I think we, it's incumbent on, on all of us to really think about how we're going to spend what are ultimately limited dollars and or limited increases every year. But certainly, I, as Chairman, I certainly respect that. And um, <coughs> uh, again, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive uh, ideas. And I applaud all the public officials, all of those who have gone before, and all of those who are in place now, uh, up and down the system for supporting education and the, 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 the building projects and so on that you've, you've just mentioned. I think that's terrific. Um, I don't mean to be patronizing about it at all or trivialize it, uh, but we know why people moved to our town, right? They moved to here because of the quality of education, and that's what they have come to, to expect. And, um, it's important, particularly when we, when we just reflected on a question about te teachers making decisions about moving to different places and so on and so forth. Um, uh, one of the biggest resources we have here, and the quality resource, uh, I've said from day one, since I said it here, is the quality of, of, of the, the staff, both teaching and support staff, uh, that work in the system. So, so it's, 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 it's a, I don't need to tell you, it's a hard line to thread, but uh, uh, the quality education also gives back again in terms of the, the Taxes, so on and so forth, property values, you know that and all that stuff. But that's why people come here too, so it's. Yeah, I mean, no doubt. And I think, you know, close to 80% of our annual budget goes towards education, and the other 20% towards services. I think we do great jobs on both sides. I think we have great schools, we have great fire, we have great police, we have great parks, um, and we have low taxes. Other questions on the board of ed? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Rich, one of the things I've asked you to keep us up on, just because we generally factor that into how we, you know, put all the ingredients into the mixing bowl and mixing bowl and determine the uh, the mill rate uh, on the fifth. How are things looking with the current budget in terms of surpluses? Where do you think? those could be going in terms of up, down, what are the risks in, around the current surplus? Uh, so the last finance committee we had, and actually the last board meeting we had, um, we reported just over about a $600,000 positive balance for the current fiscal year. Um, <clears throat> we did budget a 67.5% reimbursement rate for ECR. Um, while the rate's not final, we're probably expecting it to be closer to 80%. Uh, so that's going to be, you know, a half a million dollars right there. Um, you know, the non-special education accounts are running about a positive $100,000. Um, not a lot of positive areas, but we're, you know, north of 600000 So does that north of 600000 include the benefit of, or the, the recalculation of going from mid-60s to 80s? Yes. yes. Okay. So you just said the 600000 includes that 500000 It does, yes. Yeah. 
anything, so any, any risks about that? Like whether energy prices or other things? So we have a locked in uh, energy rate, so we don't really have any concerns about energy. Um, you know, the, the type of things that can fluctuate a little bit um, on a smaller scale could be substitutes. Um, that's not going to be a huge driver if it does fluctuate. Um, and then obviously special education costs, um, though given that we're you know, end of March, even if something were to happen where we have a new outplacement or something like that, you're really looking at an outplacement for a couple of months. So even if it's a significant outplacement, you're only paying in this year those few months. How far forward are we locked in on energy? Uh, so we're locked in through June 30th of 23. Yeah, because that was one of the questions I had in the, in, the, in the budget book. You talked about that we are locked. Yep. So any of what we've seen over the last few months won't really affect. Yeah, so we locked, uh, we floated the rate for a little bit. We did lock in at about two dollars and thirty cents for um, heating oil and then diesel fuel for the buses. Uh, so it has spiked obviously quite a bit in the last month or so. Um, and then we also locked in propane because the new Oxridge building will be heated on propane. Uh, so we locked in, I believe, it's a dollar seventy nine. Um, so we do have pretty favorable rates for the next, at least the next year. Uh, and we'll see what happens for the following year. And, you know, given what happens, we'll probably float for a little bit and we'll see, you know, where rates are, whether or not to lock in or not to lock in. Okay. And then maybe lastly on the capital, you know, we, we took the tour of the schools and, and looked at all the different capital items. The, um, I think the three largest are really the redo of the high school of track and field and, um, pole vault pit and all of that and the, and the three different elevators. Are there, is there anything going on in terms of the, um, the supply chain and or cost related to those projects that could dramatically change those or, or push out when you could actually, when it would be smart to, to undertake those? So in terms of the track, we think we'll be able to do it um, you know, this year. Um, the one area in facilities, but it's not necessarily for this coming budget, is the roofing materials. Uh, so the royal roof that is slated, that was approved for this year, that's slated to start in the summer, that could be a concern, um, whether or not we're able to get that um, done in time. Uh, the elevators is part of a program through Kone, so we wouldn't expect any supply chain issues. The vehicles will certainly um, be a supply chain issue. And is there anything we can do to change that, or is it just a matter of waiting for them to come in? Uh, so for the two that we've already ordered, it's a matter of waiting for them to come in. Uh, for the two, or the three, excuse me, that are proposed for the next year budget, obviously the sooner we order them, the better. Um, I mean, if we look at the Suburban from this year, we ordered in July, we got it around Thanksgiving. Uh, so if we do the same, if we ordered it, you know, earlier, you know, maybe we get it in September uh, instead of Thanksgiving. You know, it's really the cars that are still proved to be difficult. There's not a lot of cars on any lots in the area. Um, we actually had to go to Long Island to get the car that we got for the Suburban. Um, so those would be really the one, the, the one area. The, the roof supplies were from Mr. Lynch that I said that they had the roof supplies and were able to do it, we'll be able to do it, so we're hopeful for that. What about the impact on paving costs for doing the uh, Middlesex? Uh, so typically we piggyback off the rate from uh, uh, Public Works. From public Works. <coughs> one, one of the things that the Oxridge Committee did was encourage the trades to procure materials well in advance. And I know we stored some steel because it wasn't needed, but they were it was purchased and acquired and therefore on site and ready to be installed when when ready. So I don't know if any of the projects lend themselves to that, but that was like a great practice that was done on that committee and I don't know if, again I don't know if it's applicable to any of the capital projects going forward but which is there anything you can do now to order those people? Uh, well, we would need we would need an appropriation. I mean, we can't issue a purchase order without money, um, so you would need an appropriation. Uh, so does it make sense to you? Something to think about. I think based on the current schedule, the RTM it's available ten days after the RTM votes right. on it. So I think they vote on the eighth. I think it is. So it'd be like the eighteenth. But if you wanted to, just if you wanted, Jack, could you? I like tight. If you wanted to. If you took action today and got a memorandum to rules on the 4th, we could put it on our agenda on the 18th, and therefore they would have be able to order it by the 28th of April. That at least moves it up uh, two months. If you wait to May, you're only picking up a month. Up to you. But 
you know, I can shepherd it through rules. Um, it's going to come basically to my committee anyway. So we could handle that, but it's up to you what you guys want to do. You know, we'll, we'll talk to Jen. We have another meeting on Thursday night, then another meeting like the following Tuesday night, night, and then Thursday night. So Okay, but if it's to get yeah. it on to the 18th, it would have to be on the rules agenda, which means the memorandum would have to be to set on April 4th, because that's when we meet. We have that's the time frame, <coughs> just if you wanted to expedite it. We one meeting. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that could potentially move it up by three or four weeks, but yeah. Okay. Any other questions for the board? You, you, you hear this every time you're in front of us, but hopefully you don't tire of hearing it, that you're reporting and the quality of the answers is just really outstanding. Yeah. So thank you. the monthly reporting packages and then how quickly this was turned and the detail that was provided. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the reporting packages, I would say, in the 7, 16 years I've been doing this are the best that I've ever seen, and it just leaves a lot less questions around um, what's going on. So it's, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So the next two things that we're going to talk about are Parks and Rec and Public Works. You guys are all welcome. I don't think there's any, I don't think we're going to have further discussion on, on board of other questions. So. David, thank you. David, you're doing Public Works. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I better, did it last year with Rob. I, I better since Rob isn't going to be here. It's not 100% yeah. if he'll be able to be here on Thursday. Uh, okay. So it's in Boston right now. They're really working. Oh, that means I'm doing police on Thursday. I know. So okay. I, I can check with him tonight. Bye, Joe. I, think I promise this won't take us. Okay. Bye, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Abby. No, that was really good. That was what the, that's what we needed the last couple of years. This yeah. was a real exchange, which yeah. I don't think we had. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, Parks and Rec. First. Uh, uh, all right. So, um, Parks and Rec expenditures are budgeted at 1.7 million for fiscal 23, which is down 425,000 from 2.1 in fiscal 22. But this is due to the establishment of the Recreational Program Fund and transition of related expenses and revenues to that account. On an apples to apples basis, at least on my math, the Parks and Rec budget is up about $68,000 or 4.3%. The principal driver of that increase is a $61,000 increase in spending on grounds, fields, and maintenance spread across the maintenance facilities repair and facilities maintenance materials subaccounts, as well as $18,000 to fund the standard of care initiative we heard a little bit from Lori earlier. Recreational facilities maintenance is also budgeted to grow by about $17,000, while admin costs and security service accounts are each budgeted below last year's levels. Beach and court facilities revenues are projected up 18% to $540,000, driven by a fourfold increase in boat permits and a 67% increase in projected paddle court revenue. The new Recreation Programs Fund was established to eliminate the need for the town to continue seeking additional authorizations to accommodate increased program expenses in direct correlation to greater than anticipated program participation and revenue. For fiscal 23, expenditures in this fund are budgeted at 675,000 against budgeted revenues of 950,000, yielding a projected $275,000 surplus. Last year's revenue budget was set at $665,000, while the town has experienced 745,000, that's 90, $80,000 in excess of the full year um, budget we've already achieved through the last financial report, which was probably a month ago. The budgeted revenue figure is up 43% over last year. Post the ARPA authorization, there are just three capital items in the park and rec budget other than small capital. 
The first is an additional $100,000 to complete the resurfacing of the Cherry Lawn Tennis Courts. The sizable increase of the original figure of $250,000 is due to the widely known rising cost of building materials. It also informed the comment I just made with respect to capital. The earlier we can ask our trades to procure materials, generally in this rising inflation environment, the more we protect ourselves against those increased costs. The item, other items include $10,000 to replace irrigation valves at Baker Park. Those valves are over 20 years old. And $15,000 to install a ductless air conditioning unit at, at the Weed Beach concession stand. <coughs> the, current, um, the current environment there is not conducive to the working condition of our equipment, let alone the staff. All three items are warranted. I'd also uh, uh, was going to recommend, uh, as I've heard other, two other folks recommend this evening, that we participate, the Board of Finance participate in a parks tour. Um, whether it's done, in the, it's probably best done as close to the budget season as possible, but since that's generally the winter, maybe October, uh, when the commission does it with the RTM members would make a lot of sense. We've had some discussion about the, the best scheduling of that. Um, October is really tight on the planning that Pam is doing for the budget. Um, we found August and September are very difficult as people are getting back from vacations and such. We've had some discussion of maybe doing it twice a year, a spring and a fall. We're going to look at what's the best, the best way to do it. But we would really welcome your, your participation. I know it's hard for folks who are working and volunteering to necessarily get out in the parks and, and having the experts there. They really can point out things that you might just not readily right. notice. The other observation I would make is I noticed the $15,000 removal of the painting of the Wheat Beach Paddle and Bathhouse um, from the capital budget. Um, I was curious, maybe Jen, as to whether that item might or should be a operating expense. So the painting doesn't necessarily have a long life, and if it is considered an operational expense, then there's some discretion on behalf of the department head to fund that expense by moving money around if that money is available. Great, okay. it, could, it could be um, operating, it does meet our requirements for capital, which is $5,000 or more in life of two years. Um, but the um, pear tree bathhouse was repainted using the facility maintenance and repair money in the department, so that is an option. Thank you. That's all I got. Questions? I think, yeah, there were, I think you, you touched on a little bit of the capital. There were, there were sort of two large projects, right? Well, there's one large project and two small projects. There's the $100,000 tennis court resurfacing in addition to the two fifty that was authorized last year. Then there's the $15,000 in um, air conditioning at um, at Wheat Beach concession stand, and then ten thousand dollars in the uh, irrigation valves, and they, they and had, then five thousand in small capital. Yeah, and they had proposed one seventy five for the which was funded by our bond. Yeah, yeah. So the other large items, both in this year and in a number of them in future years, were funded by our bond. Right. And then follow this one as closely as some other parts. Wasn't there a walking path at some point? Like what happened? There was a walking path at some point, but that was um, removed from the proposed budget. Um, I think before the board of selectmen voted. Right. Do you want me to address that at all? Nope. No. <laughs> but thank you. I mean, Can I just want to put the selectmen's thinking and discussion was. I mean, sure. Go ahead. You can do it quickly. Sure. That's yeah. fine. Uh, the commission had put that forward in the, in the budget. However, uh, and based on our selectmen with the discussion, and, and Jen, you were there, the feeling was that the numbers that we had were somewhat old. They were pre-pandemic, and they weren't really firm enough that we could real feel it, feel comfortable that that was the right amount. So the feeling was that the commission, and we've got a working group, should tighten that up and really get a better handle on what the numbers would be and then come back sort of outside of the annual budget process. And I so it's the not DAF is, remains part of that conversation? We are continue to have conversations with them, yes. Um, there, there seems to be some level of interest, but we don't have any firm commitments into what level that would be. So it, it was just, um, 
it all wasn't firm enough to feel that we wanted to put it, you know, that, that we should be putting in this year's budget. Is that a fair representation? I would agree. Discussion, but it's not that it's off the table that we don't want to do it. We very, very much do want to do it. You know, the property was purchased many years ago. Um, it has been sitting unusable. Um, there are problems on that property with invasives as well. Uh, so we really do need to um, get moving on something. I think, so. I think projects of that size, I think the process is, you know, should probably include you know, sort of more discussion at the at the at the commission and sort of at the staff level, and I think more bigger understanding of uses and and, and views. And, exactly. You know, so people can sort of understand what it is before I think it, it gets brought forward. Which, right. given its capital, can be done during a budget process or any other time. Right. Exactly. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay. I don't think any no more questions on parks and rec. It, going back to Dan's point, I would like to see money come from somewhere to do the Weed Beach painting, whether it be how the operating budget or we allocate some sort of money from our reserves to do that because I don't believe uh, those structures should get run down just for basic preservation plus the look of the town. Well, I think the standard of care initiative, which is there's a, there's a minimum level of care that all of our parks, parks should um, <coughs> should exceed. And um, I think, I agree with you. Can, can you provide any more detail on the standard of care initiative and how we're measuring that? Um, I did provide one copy. Um, I can certainly email it out to you um, and pass it around. Um, but the, the standards of care, um, if, if, you, the, if you could email that to me, I'll send it around. Okay, I will do that. Um, but, but the standards of care was really, it's, it's about a two-page document that really the commission agreed on to provide a framework. So as we look at the parks and think, think about, you know, where the priorities should be and how we think about them, that we had a uniform way to, to think about that and look at one park versus the other. So when we did our parks tour this year for the first time, uh, we had a little like checklist for each, you know, that we had one for each park. And as the commission members and RTM members went around, they would say, okay, um, you know, how are we doing on, you know, the natural beauty and the invasives in this park? And, you know, Cherry Lawn, it's like, well, this is a hot mess. And then other parks were like, gee, this is pretty good. So it was a way for the commission to kind of benchmark um, how, you know, how we were feeling about the different parks. And I can find this and then uh, one of our commission members kind of collated it all and put it together like in a little you know chart you know by you know by each park so for each park you know cherry lawn you know was green in some areas and yellow in others pear tree was pretty much yellow all along the way um, but we're, we're just trying to, to create a better framework um, as opposed to just saying you know we know this needs to be done or whatever so uh, we really just have gotten going on this in the last you know six months or so and we think we can further develop it out. And does that identify current costs. needs or does it project sort of like a five-year forecast so we know what things are coming up? It should get us there. That's yeah. the plan. Right now we're really looking at them and saying, you know, how do things look and seem? But, but the idea then would be to help project, for instance, when the invasives, we have this working group I've mentioned, uh, we spent started time at Cherry Lawn, but we want to get to out to each of the parks and really assess how much of an issue the invasives are in each of the park. I mean, Laura Mosier has told us the school properties have big problems too. Um, and, and it's something as a community we need to be very, very concerned about. I, I didn't know a lot about it. I have to admit to you that till um, Jenny Schwartz reached out to me about a year ago and asked to introduce me to Laura and walk Cherry Lawn and she started pointing out things. And um, as I've learned more about it, I mean, we, we will lose a lot of our trees, a lot of the trees will die if we don't take action now and I think you will understand the implications of that. Are those, are those pests or what it's plants. Of? It's a lot of plants and vines that are creeping up the trees and they choke them off. There's ones that they, they just create an understory so that the trees can't get nutrients. Some of them host bugs. I, I actually uh, attached to that a little write-up that Laura gave to us that she sort of has identified <coughs> four or five of the invasives that we have in our parks and sort of what, what they do. So. Um, yeah. In next year's budget season, I would encourage us to get away from funding this as a separate line item and having this exercise inform how much we're budgeting in each park, in each subcategory per mm -hmm. park. 
Yep. Right, so this should be rather, because this is integrated with everything. It's yep. not like a separate program, yes. right? Yeah, and we want we want to get to that point, but we're yeah. all just really we're just learning about it and really learning about the magnitude of it. But even if you just pass those pictures around, just yeah. cherry lo it's it's it's. Just, I mean, Patty was with us. It's 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 really terrible, and it's it's much more than a group of volunteers could ever even begin to deal with. And we had professional landscapers with us. You can't just go whack them down, and then you're done. I mean, it's it it, it will take multiple years of of attention to remove to remove some of these. Chris Filmer was with us. I hope some of you know him and all of the work that he's done yep. over at Selix Woods over the years. And he's uh, the chair of Friends of Selix Woods. He's got quite a bit of expertise. Um, he was there with us, and he's like, this is a multi multi year project. But well, then, given it is multi year, I, I think it it really begs begs for sort of a multi-year forecast. Yes, so I think it, and when that we're is our plan. It, then we know this is what we're approving, but you know, you, you don't want to approve it one year and then not be able to do it for the next. So we, we need to know, like, yes. this is a five-year program where, where each park is going to take three years. Right. This is how we're going to do it. I think we need to think about it as a, you know, sort of as its own real operating line item. What capital will it require? Yeah. Are there any large investments we can make to kind of decrease mm -hmm. the you know, the need to do this in the future, and I'm not suggesting that we turf right. every park. And that's what we're, we're educating ourselves on yeah. now. And luckily, the, one of the things my husband always says is the wonderful thing about living in town of Darien is you have so many intellectual resources that you can draw on. And, you know, we're really grabbing people like Laura and Chris Filmer and other folks in town who really, the, the, the people from the pollinator pathway who really know a lot about this stuff. And um, they're, they're helping guide those of us who aren't plant experts. And Sorry. how do the findings from the uh, Park and Rec Master Survey inform the uh, standards of care uh, for each of the facilities? Because the, the, the uh, master plan had fairly specific uh, uh, resident input in terms of the items that they considered to be the highest uh, priority items. So how is that incorporated into the development of the standards of care? Yeah, well, as you did, and we actually referenced, you'll see when you get the document, uh, the, if you look on page 54 of the master plan, um, it, it did say that one of the top areas, um, if addressed by the town of Darien, which would increase utilization of parks and recreation facilities, is the condition and maintenance of the facilities. So that okay. was called out in the plan. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Just remind if you could send that around, I'll pass it I will do to that. everybody. Thank you. Okay. But look at the pictures. Yep. So, Public Works. Ed, are you ready? Yeah. All right, last but, last but not least, uh, Public Works. We all know uh, what they do. Uh, road, sidewalks, sewers, storm drains, public buildings, waste disposal, parking, uh, basically anything that makes the town run, it's Public Works, and they do all the engineering for all the projects uh, that occur in town. If you look mathematically, uh, absent, to, absent uh, some things like debt service and employee benefits, Public Works is the second largest department behind the police uh, department. Uh, and uh, the on the expense side, it looks like expenses were up about um, uh, 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 four point seven uh, million dollars, at least in proposed in the budget, which represents a three point nine percent uh, increase. Uh, if you go through the departments. Um, the s couple of departments are basically effectively flat within uh, public works, management and engineering, parking operations, uh, expense wise those are uh, basically uh, flat. Uh, the ones that show some increase are the public building uh, management, the road and walkway maintenance and the waste management. In the case of the public building management, uh, total expenses are up $48,000, but 33000 of that is, uh, is due to contractual obligations from full-time salary. I forgot to mention there are, are no headcount changes uh, within the Public Works uh, uh, budget request. So these, uh, all of it, when I mention salary in a couple of these departments, it's just the contractual uh, negotiated salary increases that are uh, built into the uh, existing contract. So, and, and this is the second year, Jen, of that Public Works contract? Yes. Yeah. So public building uh, management was up 48,000 or 6.7 percent. Uh, Full-time salaries were 33,000 of that, uh, and uh, the next material item was 10,000 increase for uh, electricity, uh, which is in part due to the HVAC systems and the increased circulation and uh, and air quality uh, issues within the uh, within the uh, public uh, buildings. All other items don't really amount to 
uh, any material amounts in terms of uh, changes or anything like that. Uh, the single biggest uh, area uh, for increase were uh, road and walkway maintenance, which is up uh, $147,000. I apologize, I didn't write down the percentage increase there. Uh, but of that 147, again, uh, salaries represent uh, 64,000 of that amount. So, uh, you know, close to uh, half of that. Uh, uh, and uh, lubricants and materials uh, are up uh, uh, 69,000. So basically, you know, fuel, petroleum, lubricants to uh, uh, maintain and take care of the machines and uh, things like that. And those two items uh, together pretty much cover the bulk of it. There's a $10,000 increase in paving services. And honestly, I'll apologize. I don't remember what that, what that segment of that department uh, is. That, um, all paving items, drainage, any repairs. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. It's the ancillary things to any paving related stuff that they do. Like if they change, if they have to do anything related to the drainage as part and parcel of repaving a particular road or anything uh, like that. What was the forty-five thousand that the board of selectmen added to the uh, parkway and maintenance line item? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was. 45000 after we um, settled our fuel contract. Prices were higher than originally anticipated, so they had to add in 45000 to the town administrator's budget. Uh, and the last department here is, uh, is waste management. Um, and that was up $45,000 or 3.6%. And that's basically because the city carding contract has a CPI escalator uh, built into it, which is the primary driver. And as Ed always points out that during the time of COVID, uh, people seem to throw away a lot more stuff. Um, uh, so the, the volumes have been up at the at the uh, transfer station uh, in general, and uh, I don't know what it, this number is for the uh, park and rec uh, area, uh, given the volume of programming that they have and the. Uh, applications and everything the way that people pay but it, I, I will know it's not it's not material to the aggregate of the uh, public works department per se but from a town-wide uh, uh, budgeting perspective uh, credit card fees uh, represent $21,850 and that is uh, the non reimbursed interchange fees from people buying their dump stickers uh, online and we don't pass that through to the consumer. So uh, that's a broader discussion for other areas of town as well in terms of you know the board selectmen reviewing and establishing a policy to pass that through for, for all areas. But I suspect if you add, if you looked at that number for park and rec, it would be larger than uh, public works given the volume of revenue. Uh, that flows through there and the likelihood that people pay by credit card increasingly uh, these days. Um, so that's really it on the uh, operating side. Um, on the capital side, uh, the single, um, uh, uh, it, was, it was ranked as, a, sorry, I have to have it in the right up here. Is ranked as a high priority. There, there are some items that are recurring items, uh, such as paving. Uh, that was a priority one uh, item. Uh, Ed is including uh, $1.2 million uh, unchanged from the prior year. And is expecting to pave uh, a little over six miles uh, this year, up slightly from uh, last year. Uh, there's some uh, uh, variability there, depending on uh, you know the aggregate cost of the of the. Um, uh, asphalt um, uh, when they, he gets around to uh, paving uh, so that the actual mileage number may change. It could be less than the uh, six, uh, six and, and change miles that he's planning for. And then sidewalk rehab is budgeted at $750,000, which is also unchanged. It's clearly a priority one uh, uh, item in line with the goal to make the town more uh, pedestrian friendly. Uh, rising oil prices could have some effect here because uh, Ed's policy is uh, around schools and uh, places like that and major highways and, and state roads. Uh, it's concrete, uh, but you know in a lot of areas throughout town, the sidewalks are asphalt. And so depending on what that price turns out to be could impact the amount of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of linear feet that he is actually able to do. Uh, as far as new items, uh, capital, the, the largest uh, single uh, item is a replacement of the, uh, one of the large trucks 
Uh, it's a Freightliner truck. It's a $225,000 uh, item. Uh, it's listed as a Priority One uh, item in his uh, listing. Uh, the vehicle is uh, nearing the end of its useful life and parts are becoming difficult uh, to get uh, for that uh, vehicle. Ed has a very well thought out and planned out sort of sequential program for replacing all of the, the large uh, vehicles and this is uh, uh, one part of it that's uh, included for this year. Uh, there are another $120,000 uh, labeled as Priority One uh, for uh, new sidewalks, uh, and that's in line, you know, with the town goal of trying to make things uh, more accessible and more uh, walkable throughout town. I will say I don't. I, I listen to it, but I don't remember the exact areas that they're going to be located. So, if somebody needs to know that, we'll have to uh, uh, leverage uh, Ed's uh, experience. Um, uh, with that, and there is also um, $100,000 in the budget for uh, transit station drive and curb replacement. Uh, this item is listed as a priority three item, but my understanding is that it has been deferred in prior years. Uh, it's actually broken into multiple years. So the first, uh, this coming year, would be anticipated to pave effectively the roadway that runs up to the transfer station building and the curbing that runs in between in the middle there uh, because that has been you know, damaged over the years from snow plowing and potential, I'm assuming occasionally a carter hits the curb and you know, uh, does some damage. So that is, uh, that is included uh, in there. Uh, as well. The second phase would be an additional $150,000 uh, that would uh, uh, basically repave the lower area in and around the uh, building and the entryway and those type, those uh, uh, types of things. And Ed had some specific language which I think was uh, uh, lower drive in C and D area with drive to antenna area in fiscal 25. Um, so those are those are coming up, um, you know, uh, with the cost of petroleum and paving and those types of things. That might be something for us to have a conversation about uh, going forward. Uh, I also thought that if the the the, uh, the fire commission is thinking about uh, paving up by the uh, training facility to accommodate the placement of one of the portable buildings, uh, that we may want to have a, a broader conversation about the aggregate of these projects timing, putting them together, cost, incremental cost wise, is this something uh, that we should um, uh, think about? So th those, were, those were my main elements uh, from, the, from the public works. I guess one thing I'd point out just in terms of the sheer volume of sidewalks we're doing, I think we've, we've received a few public comments about back when we were approving the ARPA, like why not, why you're not taking care of sidewalks. I think in this year's budget, there's, there's on the town side about $870,000 worth of either new or rehabilitated sidewalks. And then if you look inside the Board of Ed budget, I don't know the exact number, but there's about 460 for that sort of loop, that road and path that connects the middle school down to the, what used to be the old senior center. Right. And it's about $450,000 there. Now that's both a road and a whole sidewalk, but that's a, that sidewalk is really only used for the community and or teachers. So there's, you know, there's well over a million dollars of new sidewalks. And I, um, uh, I did check with Ed on the Edgerton property. Uh, he has plans to, uh, to get to uh, do some of that uh, work this summer, I think was what you uh, had said. And I asked him specifically, uh, you know, how would that impact the uh, Board of Ed plans for paving and that type of stuff. And he didn't think it would have any negative uh, impact on their uh, plans to do that, uh, that project. Because I wanted to make sure we didn't, you know, uh, run heavy equipment over freshly paved turf. I have a question for Ed, I guess. Um, the parking lots that are in the parks, is that a parks and rec capital item or is that a public works capital item? Parks, you say parks and rec? Yes, the parking lots. Parking lots and, and, and parks and rec. In our and parks. roads that are in our parks, is that public works um, scope or is that parks and rec scope? It would fall under the scope for parks and rec. Okay. But generally, I'll, I, I used to work with Jim Flynn to let him use the contract that I have with a paving company already, and we'd get them out there to do the work. So he'd use our prices, basically, 
that we bid out for the whole town. Okay, thank you. The transit station curb, is that the, like when you, after you go in and you're turning up? Yeah, so both of those roads that go up, curbs on both sides and all the way up to the um, dump off where the large trucks go into the building, that whole section is gonna be redone with the, the, the 100,000 I've asked for. So you're talking about the curbs on the sides? Um, the sides and the middle island. And the middle. Yeah. Because I was thinking and the middle island, like could we like, put a barrel there instead or something? I mean, is it just so that you separate the traffic? It, it, it's, it is, I can tell you it's decorative, but it's also a good, the larger trucks that go up and down, I like to keep them separate rather than a yellow line down the center. As you see, as you get closer to the scale house, how um, difficult it is sometimes to maneuver down there when it's busy. This larger area kind of keeps it wider. We have a nice wide area to go yeah. up there, and I think it's important, especially when it starts to back up on Saturdays too. And um, yeah. we're going to do those in uh, concrete, right? Is concrete curbs. Yeah. Asphalt uh, right. surface. Oh yeah. Please. And then in terms of the curbing and all of that, there <coughs> is there anything that we need to think about in terms of just given the flooding that took place on that granted 200, 500 year storm, in terms of how we direct water coming down there. And I, feeding I, into I have to say that the the, um, the one thing I want to do is that there's a, a curtain drain if you will up by the leaf area that I'm probably going to either replace or repair but as far as drainage that goes there um, going downhill to the low area it makes its way into the stream anyway from down there I don't think any improvements are needed but of course we'll take a look at the structures before we pave like we always do okay how about the rehabilitation of roads that have been <coughs> disrupted for uh, insertion of gas lines what is how does that process work um, usually I have to wait at least one um, winter season before I'll pay I want the settlement done well we take those we take the contribution from the utility company <coughs> and I work it into our paving program mm -hmm. so that we're only paving during one time of the year I don't have the utility companies and their contractors the water company their contractors um, plus I get a better and product because I pave curb to curb, but generally speaking, depending on the age of the road, the utility company owns half of it right out of the gate. And then I balance the rest of the portion based on the age. Because they're responsible for kind of repairing a road that they tear up. Yeah. I, I kind of make them responsible, but they do know they have restoration responsibilities. And I think this is, ends up with a better product for the town. You don't have half a road done. Right. Avoid Christy Hill. <coughs> <coughs> Any other questions on public works? Thank okay. you, Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. So in terms of uh, one thing I guess I meant to bring up during the Board of Ed discussion, Jen, you, know, you had said that as our board begins to develop consensus around certain things, you could begin to integrate them into the, mm -hmm. uh, the master model. You know, the, the uh, the one piece is the, that we, we've talked about this for like a year now about collapsing the special ed reserve mm -hmm. that has been touched for um, 12 years or 13 Decades. years that nobody really knew about. Um, <laughs> what is the, what's your suggestion in terms of how to kind of recycle that and whether or not it should be going into the general fund and popping back out? I think that, so to do anything with it, you need approval all the way through the RTM. We know that. I think the most efficient way of doing it is to make it a budgeted revenue line as a contribution from the special reserve, the special ed reserve, into the general fund in the budget because that goes through all the approvals anyway, and then it's done, and we just close it out. It supports the fiscal 23 general fund budget, and we never have to speak of it again. Got it. And so. But you think it's best to be used now? Should it be used directly towards capital, towards operating, or it doesn't matter just into the general fund? I think it should just go into the general fund. It's $100,000. It's just going to support all of the, it's going to be $100,000 less that we have to tax. Got it. So I, I think if people are generally supportive of that, Jennifer, you could maybe just kind of begin to build that into the, uh, the model so we can see what the, the overall mill rate's beginning to look like. So I guess just finishing up on budget here in terms of um, Thursday. 
to do something in business or are we still starting? No, with this, I guess we're kind of finishing our budget that okay. day here. So for tomorrow we have, um, oh, sorry, for Thursday we have police, we have fire and emergency services and library. And I think you had reached out, this Kira, is Kira going to be here on? I think she said she's coming. Okay, well, let's make that. And then, you know, David and I will be going through debt service. So those are the four kind of what about budget. And then the bottom line. Yes. Yeah, those are the four budget items. And on the revenue side, we're going to run through fund balance, um, other revenues, excess costs, and other grants, and um, in the reserve fund for capital. So I guess, you know, Jen, in connection with that, does it make sense? Can you, can you help us put together sort of where we think fund balance will be at the end of this year, given what we heard from the Board of Ed. It sounds like there's 6 six fifty that they're, they're running now as a surplus. Yeah, what I did last year was I gave you guys a, it was a full projection on the town side for all the departments, um, expenditures and revenues. And then there was a summary that looked at um, surpluses on the town side plus surpluses on the Board of Ed side and gave a projection for fund balance um, and then I also provided to you um, capital closeouts and what your Board of Finance capital reserve is projected to be. So we'll make an adjustment because we all know that the HHR is going to pass, so we'll assume that the 1025 is going to come back. And then I have um, capital closeouts. I'll know the number. We won't do the actual closeout until our regular meeting on the 5th, but we'll know what the number is so that we can discuss it on Thursday. Um, Will that include the couple, I think, Board of Ed projects, or is that already baked into there? Yeah, it's going to include, like, um, their library carpet, yep. that sort of thing that they're not doing. That'll be coming back into your Board of Finance Capital Reserve. Um, so we'll have those two numbers, a general fund projection, as well as your capital reserve projection on Thursday. Okay. <clears throat> um, on Thursday, could we also have kind of a general discussion of anything that's been proposed, see if we have consensus on it, because I will put anything that we do have consensus on, there, there have been a couple things thrown out there that haven't been discussed yet. Um, anything we do have consensus on, I will put it into the model and send it back out on Friday so that everybody has time to look at it before we meet on Tuesday. So can you circulate uh, the list of open items. I don't think it's extensive. It's not. There hasn't been much right. proposed. You know, I think which is the, not to say it's it can't be added to, but it's not so far. It's not right. Extensive. Um, I think the only things that we have on the list right now are um, David had a proposal to reduce contingency by fifty thousand. Taylor um, floated the idea of do we want to take another look at investment income. Um, I have a proposal out there on debt service that will go through on Thursday, and that's really it. Uh, what I heard today was um, we want to think about fifteen thousand dollars for the Weed Beach painting, and the hundred thousand dollars for the special close out of the special ed reserve. Um, but if you have anything else, I mean, even if we haven't mentioned it here, you can let me know. We can put it on the list so that we make sure that we do cover it and at least have a discussion on it. And can we add a capital item back? Yes, you can do whatever you want. The board of has excluded. Yes. For, Thank you. <coughs> for the painting of the uh, we. Well, that the point I was making was if you, if it's an operating expense, maybe they can find the money within their operating budget. But if we can actually discuss funding it as a capital item, then we should discuss funding it as a capital item and a adding it to their budget. Well, it sounded like they painted the Pear Tree building out of the operating budget last yeah, year. But I'm not, so yes, but it's not clear that they have the money to allocate 15. Maybe they do. I don't know. Well, look, let me ask a question. We can, can have we, that conversation. Can we maybe ask, is it a matter of the, both the money and then there's the time of when they can do it? Right. If they want to be doing it now, is it something that given we're near the end of our year, the Board of Ed's running a surplus. We have a couple surplus with the Board of Selectmen side. Is it something we should be thinking about using out of our operating contingency so they can get started on it? Yes, now that would be my As a matter recommendation. Of fact, that, that was the recommendation that I heard from some of our RTM partners, which was to get the money authorized now so that they can do it before the summer starts. 
and and rather and then we can then it can be right, it can be refunded out of the budget, right? We can authorize it now out of contingency account. No, no. I think so if, if we transferred it at the board of selectmen would need to bring it to us if they want a, a draw from. So the board of selectmen would need to say we want this thing painted. Then they could come to us, and right. we could either fund it out of our operating reserve, yep, or operating contingency, I guess. Okay. Or we Sorry. could call it capital and do right. it. Right, right, right. And honestly, it it is a it is a type of activity that could go either way. If they were only painting a room, absolutely operating. But because they are painting the whole building, it could be capital, but it can also be operating because it's. So to get the authorization, though, to do it now, the Board of Selectmen would actually have to say, do it. And they actually chose not to, or the town administrator chose not to. You would need to have an item come before you requesting a transfer from some source. In order to Saying fund we want to do it now. the budget. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll have a conversation with, with Kate and, and Monica and just kind of... Yeah, because I, I think that... If you feel, and we can certainly talk about this when we go over the projection on Thursday as well, um, but there's going to be a, a surplus on the town side. I think you can absolutely fund it out of the current year contingency. Um, so I think maybe the conversation with Kate and with Monica is you've, you've heard that there's a desire to do this. If they are interested, why don't we fund it with existing dollars that we have rather than put it in next year's budget and have to tax for it. Yeah, and then therefore, therefore that doesn't have to be part of our budget calendar. It Correct. Be done. Right. At a why did they meeting. remove it? Um, Kate removed it at her level, um, just trying to you know get to a good an acceptable number. She thought that some of their other requests were more of a priority. She deferred it. She did. Right. She deferred yeah, it to like, next, we'll year, next year, and Board of Selectmen did not put it back in. Right. Okay. They left it in fiscal twenty four. Um, the other thing for Thursday, if you do want to consider um, taking the Board of Ed Vehicles out of their budget, we should talk about that on Thursday um, because we could get an item running simultaneously through you, Board of Selectmen, and RTM. What, uh, is there anything like that on the Board of Selectmen side? I mean, the only trucks... Did they ever pick up Andy? That was a Freightliner. And the, and the, the, the Freightliner. The Freightliner. Um, well, well, the fire trucks. The fire marshal's office, I think, has a vehicle request. Um, there weren't many vehicles this year. Yeah, I think the fire marshal had another vehicle they wanted. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think what's what's a little bit different on the Board of Selectmen side yeah. is oh, yes. yeah, yeah. their replacement vehicles. So we can get, we have a vehicle that we can use until we get one with that suburban. That's an addition. So it's not like they have a vehicle that's filling that need right now. Was that the only cap? Was that the only item they were proposing to accelerate? That's the only thing. That's he the had. only thing that was on their list. Yeah. I asked. Well, other than well, okay. All right. Well, there's other capital items. There's nothing in the other capital items on the Board of Ed side that that want to accelerate to get ahead of raising material costs. I asked anything on the operating or capital side, including iPads or any of the other, or, or MacBooks, whatever it was, and the only thing Routine they... materials. Okay. All right. So the... For grant income, should we expect anything different next year than we had this year? Or? No, the, the, I would say what's in the budget right now is the most current information that we have from the state. We haven't mm -hmm. received notification of any other um, adjustments. Um, we don't have a lot in there, so we don't have a lot of risk <laughs> if yeah. they don't fund those things. Any percentage of zero to zero? Yeah. <laughs> I would say you can't cut zero, but they've tried to do that before with <laughs> teacher pensions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess so I think unless you find something else, if you want to talk about whether or not we could get a bond resolution going on Thursday for that. A bond resolution for what? To start the two trucks on the 
that's not a bond resolution. We don't want to bond oh, the suburban. I take that back. I take that back. Yeah. Um, you mean just a, an appropriation request? Yes. Yeah. Um, I can have something. I'll, I'll draft something, um, and then. Or would we have enough in our? You would have enough in your capital reserve um, with what we're going to close out on the fifth. It's a few hundred thousand dollars. So at least the suburban you could fund out of your capital reserve, um, and then they could order that immediately. Not even have to wait until it goes to the RTM. Maybe I will um, follow up with Jack just to see if, and add to see if they or the if the ed, ed committee or the F and B committee had any thoughts on that. If they were all very much for that, then maybe an option is use. I think it's sixty grand. 70 grand out of our capital reserve yeah because we're gonna have more come back on the fifth and then yeah i you know it it is one of those where technically it should go to the rtm but because of time sensitive items before we've coordinated with our team and they've been okay with you just funding it directly out how of much time are we saving by doing this what how much time are we saving by doing this um close to a month but no more than a month. No, because if RTM meets on the 18th, it becomes effective 10 days later. And they, so could, they could then order the vehicle immediately there, 10 days. They could order the vehicle on April 29th. Um, alternatively- if we voted on it on Thursday, yes, they so. can. Right, if you vote on it on Thursday, they can order it on Friday. So they're saving yeah, just under a month. Yeah, so I'll ask Ed and I'll talk to Jack. Yeah. And does it make sense we should maybe ask Rich Rudel or Mike Lynch, do they actually have a truck they can hit <coughs> that they've identified that they could order? Yeah, we can ask them, but um, if they don't have one identified right now, I would say it's still worthwhile to get them the funds right away. So as soon as they do, you yeah. know, I, I'm sure they have relationships with vehicle sellers and would want to jump on the opportunity when one is they available. Tell people to go look for one for them. <laughs> Everybody go look for a suburban. Okay. Well, I think that's it. I don't have any other remarks. Is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, I'm going to do other business. You got to tell me when you're talking about other business. Yeah, we're still on budget. <laughs> are, are we concluded? Okay, we're done. I, I think I said. Is there any other business? Okay. Two o. Oh. Nine. No, come on. And how many seconds? Fifty. All right. And okay. adjourn. Well, there, there are no chairman's remarks. I wasn't even on the agenda. There were a lot of remarks. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> David, so moved. Second. Taylor, second. Dan, second in. Yeah. All in favor? Uh, all in favor. That would be four seconds after the other business. All in favor? <laughs> Unanimous. We're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>
This is the fourth Board of Finance meeting since the public hearing and we have not heard any discussion of a possible reduction or an estimated target mill rate. If the board is considering a reduction, but does not intend to tell parents about the reduction until right before they vote on it, there will be no chance for the public to comment. Thank you. Okay, any other public comment in the room? Okay. Next item on the agenda will be to our normal sort of what we call like the budget work session here and we currently have really eight different topics of the uh, of the budget that we're going to talk about tonight a few sort of operating aspects of the budget including police fire emergency services library and then we're going to go into our five other sort of revenue um, pieces of the budget which compiled together with all of the expenses in the both the board of ed and board of selectmen budget allow us to really start to determine the mill rate um, so the first item up is um, is going to be the police and we have a few of our few members of our police force, including Chief Anderson here, um, as well as members of the, the police commission. On our board, you know, Rob Cardone and Dan Baumgartner sort of took lead on um, on this part of the budget. Thanks, Jim. So, so I'll turn it over to, to Rob to kick it Sorry, off. Please. Um, so the police budget this year, pretty uneventful, $165,000 increase in total, 1.89%. Majority of that is a new IT professional full-time. The actual title is Public Safety Hardware and Software IT Professional. I think Dan and I have done this for three years. I think for me on top of that was it three other years. Um, every time I think we did the budget, we always talked about this day coming, Chief. Yes. Um, just a lot of, um, what do I want to call it, IT software related items. One of the things I, I thought was really interesting, when you have body cams, you actually have to edit out certain parts of the of the video, and I'll call it regulatory reasons. One of the things that was really interesting that we learned was Los Angeles has two people that do this full time. The only thing they do all day is basically, I'll say, modify the tape to make sure it's in regulations. And so the, the, the job that we have that we're proposing here is partly that, along with a slew of other things. There has been a long time uh, person who's doing the job, evidently incredibly well um, qualified, I guess I'll put it that way. And um, this is also a bit of secession planning, just in case, you never know, right? So this job, I think this particular ad has been on the agenda for at least I think in Chief's mind and my mind, I think Dan, you've seen it too. Yeah, and to be clear, this is a uniformed officer that's performing this function. This is a, a patrol <coughs> sergeant that does it in addition right. to his patrol duties. In addition to his patrol duties, and he, and he also is, has a very successful business doing this, and so he continues to perform this function for us, and if for whatever reason he should decide to leave, there really isn't anyone that could um, fill that very large hole. That is correct. If you would just give me a 30 seconds to kind of expound on Sergeant T.J. Moore. And he's been here 20 years or thereabouts. And he's done yeoman service for us, both as an officer and as an IT uh, person. Put this in perspective, you know, we have uh, Taser Axon body camera and in-car cameras. He developed a software portal that allows our officers to just simply dock their body cameras at the end of the shift and not have to actually manu uh, manually collate and, and tag the data. So that saves us overtime of probably 15 minutes per officer per day because he wrote that software program that allows us to do that. Um, Central Square is our CAD and RMS vendor. Actually, all our data, call data is all in Central Square. He's at the Central Square, I think he just returned from the Central Square Conference. He's an instructor at the Central Square Conference. He teaches their technicians on how this stuff is done. And lastly, uh, we have uh, Kronos Telestaff, which is our scheduling software. The board might have heard that they were ransomware and hacked and they were out of business for six weeks or thereabouts. That is a multinational, multi-billion dollar company. The fix for Kronos worldwide was a program that was developed and licensed to Kronos by TJ Moore. So that is the person that we have in place right now doing our IT. Uh, no other police department has what we have. And if he should choose to pack up his tent and move on to full-time IT, 
I'm up the proverbial creek, and this guy can't paddle that boat. So we need to get, to get somebody to hit the ground running that he can kind of bring along so we are not having that big wide gulf if he chooses to retire. So the overall operating budget, this is the majority of that increase. The rest is, I'll call, relatively flat, nothing really to speak of. Questions before I go to Capital or Dan, anything to add? Nothing to add. Just a, a question on the IT. I know we, I think we've talked about this for the last few years. This is really a different skill set than, because the town uses really the Board of Ed technology to drive a lot of our day to day, but this, this is a different type of tech, sort of tech computing. Yeah, this is more software, some hardware, but more software. As Mr. Cardone alluded to, like a, a body camera FOI request. We have to redact significant amounts of information out of that body camera. If there's a juvenile involved, all video and audio of that juvenile has to be redacted. If it's a protected party, like a sexual assault victim or a domestic violence victim, we cannot choose to simply not release the video. We must electronically redact and release that copy. So right now, Captain Shredders was doing it. Captain Hademo will do some of it now that she's taken over for Captain Shredders. Our administrative lieutenant does some of it. Captain Marin may do some of it. But I'm looking for this IT person to kind of drive that car on the redaction portion for the most part. We simply can't take body cam footage and, and release it without viewing it ourselves. Clearly that would not be the best course of action. So if we have, for example, a domestic violence situation and we're there for an hour and there's three officers there and a supervisor, we have four or five hours of body cam footage that someone has to physically sit there and watch to make sure that it's FOI compliant before we release it. So the, the IT person will be doing some of that, hopefully the lion's share of that. This sounds like more than a full-time job for, for this, this individual, but to any degree, does, does uh, would he or could he uh, interact with the other IT people in, in town to uh, learn from each other and, and uh, essentially build a, a, a degree of, of, of uh, skill set? Yeah, I think it goes without saying that this person's going to have to work very well and very quickly with town IT, right, for the hardware end of it. It's, it's not going to be siloed in the police department, I mean, certainly. Uh, in, the, in the event that we come back to this board in the not too distant future, potentially for a new CAD system, if we have a new CAD system, it really needs to be a town-wide CAD system with all emergency services tied to that CAD system. That's the kind of interface that we're going to need with the IT people on the town or the Board of Education side as well. They can do great service for us, but we're not always at the top of their list. That, that's just the reality of it. And sometimes they do updates forgetting that we're like Denny's and we don't close on Sundays or Saturdays. The system will go down and they oh, we're, we're doing an upgrade and they forgot that we're open 24-7. So. Hopefully that's something an IT professional can, you know, kind of coordinate with them as well. And Chief, a potential new CAD is potential in the next couple of years? That is a distinct possibility. The CAD that we have is no longer supported. And, you know, it's going to be a, we, we've been trying, you know, for, for Vision CAD and Vision RMS, which is going to be a cloud-based thing. Because of COVID, everything got topsy-turvy, right? But I think, our current product is sunsetted and, and will soon no longer be supported. We may be getting a new CAD system. And I'm certainly not supportive of a new CAD system that if it cannot hang on all emergency services, uh, streamline in a CAD system. Right. And for fellow board members, if you look at the six year capital plan, it's in there. So just FYI. Um, any other questions before I jump cap? Does this person um, free up? TJ more to do more police work, or is he going to need to be spending as much time training the new person? No, this would certainly free up some of his time uh, to do what he's his main task is is to run a patrol squad on the road. So, and my main my main thrust of this request is that he will be here for a significant significant amount of time or a sufficient amount of time that he can take this new employee and and get he or she up to speed on the things that he does. Because right now, if we need to call our, one of our software vendors on a significant hiccup, no one else can talk the talk and walk the walk of, of what that is. 
right? We can call the tech line and say, our system isn't working. Well, other than go to the black box with the two red lights on it and push, push the center button, right? He can speak to them right away and get it resolved. I'm not sure when he actually sleeps because he seems to always be awake and working on these things. So we're not going to have him forever. That's just the reality of life here in Darien. Trying to get him to stay. Other questions? No. Capital, two items I want to point out. The new camera system in the police um, headquarters, uh, in there for 109, and a drum for $25,000 to help with. Chief, I'll let you, if you don't mind, just kind of a little bit on the drone. I know it's a bunch of police activities, but you're better at this than me. Yeah, I'm not really. We actually um, funded in ARPA. We found oh, was it? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. So I take that back. So just the camera system, if anybody has questions on the 109 being spent on that. The camera system, you know, now is 12 years, going on 12 years old. It was very uh, state of the art at the time it was put in. Uh, the real inconsistencies and the drawbacks of our system was kind of brought to light when someone vandalized the police memorial stone out in front of the headquarters. <coughs> and although we have video surveillance in the front of the building, it was not sufficient for us to make a definitive identification of who that was. In addition, uh, you know, I'll be coming back to the Board of Finance, I believe, next week for uh, a request for transfer for building maintenance. Uh, some of the building maintenance money in our fiscal 22 budget was was taken up by replacing nine cameras in the building that just failed. Uh, these are mission critical cameras. We cannot run a police department without cameras in our booking and cell block. We would be out of accreditation compliance and certainly uh, on, on very thin ice without those cameras, so they had to be repaired under an emergency type situation. So a uh, new system should get us at least 10 years down the road. We'll have additional uh, high definition cameras out in our parking lot. Uh, it's just, that's what's required in the police department today. Pretty much every part of that building needs to be under video surveillance. So you said you had to recently replace some of them and this will be the balance of them? Now, this is nine cameras that we had to replace because the actual cameras failed. And those cameras, the vendor, uh, we're on a state bid for the vendor, uh, they assured us that those cameras would be able to be uh, retrofitted to the new system. So we wouldn't be replacing those nine cameras. But I don't know how many cameras we have in the building. I should know that, but it's probably 40 or 50 inside and out. And are they as good as the ones you're going to purchase with the new system? Yeah, the cameras that they're putting in now will uh, seamlessly interface with that new system. Any other questions, Capital? The only other thing I would suggest it, or ask is, Chief, if you could just speak to the two replacement vehicles in the Capital request, um, which aggregate about 73,000. Yeah, so this year is kind of an anomaly. Because of COVID, we couldn't get police cars. So we kind of got two years worth of police cars at one time. So that's why there's the request is only for two vehicles this year rather than our typical four or five. We are gonna stretch uh, one year of vehicles out an additional year simply because we couldn't get them. Mm -hmm. So I think this year we're looking for, uh, go back and look, is it one mark car and one administrative car? It's 75 cheap, 75,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, these cars are not cheap. Right. The day of a $3,000 police car is over. And they're to replace existing vehicles that, um, that have aged out. Yeah, what we do on the administrator's cars, however, though, to get even more bang for the buck that we repurpose them, either the building department gets them, uh, fire marshal might get them, or they may be hour-wise, maybe not, uh, still functional for a police car because it's hours and not miles. They are uh, still of value to the town above and beyond what we would get on a trade-in. You know, a car that we spend, you know, police explorer that we spend 34, 35,000 on the actual car, we might get 7,000 for it on a trade-in after three years simply because in real use and, and uh, in real world, it's equal to 10 or 50 years worth of uh, use of the car. Whereas you might open your car door three or four times a day, that door gets opened 30 or 40 times a day. Or you might run your car an hour a day, a lot of these cars are running 23 hours a day. So 
you have some wide bodies and the seats tend to break sometimes and we have to replace things that and it's not your grandma going to church when they're driving those cars a lot of times. So they, 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 our guys take good care of them as they can, but they're cars that run 365 days a year. So the admin, we do try to we, tr we do try to get the town more bang for the buck by. If I was going to get a new car this year, when I'm not, the captain would get mine and it would go down, you know, down the, the list. Well, chief, being married to a grandma, I can understand exactly what you're saying. <laughs> In terms of the pricing that you're assuming in here, how recently was that updated? <coughs> what we're seeing on the fire department side and some of the other vehicles, not only is there a backlog, yeah. but there's certainly some of the quotes that are coming in on the fire trucks now are noticeably higher than what we Yeah, ours are, ours are pretty up to date and pretty accurate. And, and what I did over the last 10 years, eight years as the captain, we would um, put a number in the budget, but then we would revise that number for the following year when we found out that we could get the car at a cheaper price point. So every year we're looking at that number and getting an accurate projection based on what the dealer tells us. Sometimes it's 3%, sometimes it's 5%, what, they're, what they estimate uh, they're gonna be going up. But we do, every year, we do amend that number to ensure that we're as accurate as we can be. Now sometimes the issue is that the uh, Say for Ford, they'll change the body style or the interior of the car. And those are the years where ex uh, expenditures are significantly higher when you have to get a new ballistic cage, you have to get a new console perhaps, you have to get a new push bar on the front. So as long as they keep these uh, vehicles in relatively the same configuration, we get a lot more mileage out of the stuff that goes in them. So hopefully they don't mess with them. And they probably won't, being that we need a um, we need a grill for one of our cars that got damaged, and they're talking that there's 19,000 on, on back order. We won't get a grill for at least eight or nine months from Ford. So they're probably not bringing out any new body styles anytime soon. Thank you. Any other questions? Operating or capital. I guess maybe just a question on the operating side. This year we're running a surplus, and I think that's in part due to sort of turnover, just the speed at which um, you know, you've been able to find replacements and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on sort of like going forward, how quickly we'll be able to, you know, in terms of turnover, the, the speed at which you can re find replacement officers, getting them into the academy, all that whole process? Extremely difficult. All police departments in Fairfield County and across the state are really dipping our toe into the same pool. And to be quite frank, we're getting a washout rate of more than 50% of in the background investigation or polygraph. Uh, very difficult to find candidates coming into this job now that don't have something that may uh, knock them out. Uh, right now we have four openings. We have uh, two lateral transfers that are looking to come to us from Burlington, Vermont. We have a couple that were coming from New York, one of which I do not believe is going to make uh, the grade. So it's difficult. On uh, non-certified officer candidates, they're coming to us. The washout rate is more than 50%. And as I told uh, the police commission, and I've told anyone who's listened, I'll go and answer calls or investigate accidents before I hire somebody that I don't believe should be working for the town of Darien. But it's very difficult to get candidates. I think we're gonna be running uh, not at full strength for, for the foreseeable future. I would think out for the next couple of years based on what I know and looking at our, our staff roster and who's eligible to retire that we're gonna be running short. So in, in recent years, we've had one or two vacancies on average as well, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, at least one or two, yeah. And some of those were unexpected. We've had officers that came. Uh, we had one transfer come from the state police. He retired and he came here and he was only here for 90 days because he decided you know, this was not for him and, and he moved on. We had two other officers that were here three or four or five years have left the profession. And I think that's going to continue for the foreseeable future as well. As we think about budgeting going forward, given the persistent vacancy uh, uh, situation, I don't know, it's probably better for discussion at a different time, but I wonder if we should start thinking about that in terms of how we budget for salary. My, correct me if I'm wrong, we budget as 
anticipating that we'll be fully staffed, right? Yeah, we, that's the, we have to do. We, we both are anticipating fully staffed, but historically we've been running a little bit light, and if it's going to persist for a little bit, maybe in future budget cycles, that would be something we would think about to adjust how we calculate that. There's nothing I would like better as the chief to be fully staffed, to have my traffic division Us staffed, too. and Us our too. detective division fully staffed, right. and that basically may not be the reality for the next couple of years. Okay. If anyone knows any quality candidates, please send them my way. We're always looking for quality people from all walks of life who may want to come get in this job. Despite what you might hear on TV, it's still a great job, and it's a great place to work here in Darien. So if anyone has any ideas for good candidates, please send them our way. How broadly do you advertise? We, you name the medium, we do it. We're at job fairs, we're online, we're, we're ubiquitous, we're everywhere. You know, we, there's no, there's no stone that we're leaving unturned at this point because we're, we're looking for, we're looking for quality candidates. You know, we're, we're better off than some other agencies. For at one time, Trumbull had 11 people out with COVID and they had 15 vacancies and there were only 80 sworn. So they're, and we actually took at least one of their officers, which we don't go looking for them, but right, they come looking for us. We're not going to turn them away when they're quality officers coming to work for the town there, work for the town of Darien. Chief, can I ask a question? Made me think of something. When they go to the academy, do they know where they're going afterwards already? Is it that? Is that the uh, methodology, if you want to call it that? Like, if you if we get somebody that's in. Um, Training, lack of a better word. We know they're like they're going to go to Fairfield or Darien or Trumbull, right? Or no, you, you can't attend a police academy in Connecticut until you're already hired by a specific police department, right? Yeah. You can leave that police department as soon as you're trained, technically. But then, if they came to us, we would owe them the training, training expenses, that's right? Some departments waive that. Some yeah. departments want the whole. No, and, back. and figure it out right. to the last nth degree down to shoelaces and these peanut butter and jelly sandwiches while they're training. So sometimes it's a happy, happy medium. The good thing that here in the town of Darien, we, we don't lose, we don't lose officers to other departments. We did, you know, two or three times 20 plus years ago, but we do not have people coming here and saying, oh no, no, the grass is greener over and wherever we don't have that once they're here if they're not getting out of the profession they're staying here at the Darien Police Department. <coughs> I think it's sort of points out the importance of making sure that you guys are that you have all the equipment the training fully funded you know everything that you need to make sure people want to come here and we hear that time and time again from officers that we lateral transfer officers that, that come from other agencies they say I got, I got more in my uniform and gear initial issue than I would have gotten in 10 years in X department. Uh, and that is a testament to the town and this board and the board of selectmen and especially the board of police commissioners, right? This department is known where if somebody wants to be a police officer, this is where they want to work because of the commitment to professionalism, because of the commitment to training and you know, our salary and benefit package is always competitive. If you're going to work in this line of work, this this municipality is still widely regarded, not just across Connecticut, across the eastern seaboard, you know, certainly the tri-state area, as a very, very viable uh, option. And we see that on lateral transfers. They're not leaving us once they get here, once they're getting out of the profession. Okay, Chief, would you introduce the two officers you brought with you? I certainly will. I have my field services captain, Jerry Marin, and my new administrative services captain, Allison Hadema. Congratulations. 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 Allison hit the ground running uh, upon Bob Schrader's retirement. You know, Bob, I think, uh, Allison would agree that Bob was kind of a mentor to her for her career. She's going to do a fine job. Uh, Jerry Marin is number two in charge of the department. He always does a fine job. We work as a team 100% of the time ask for me and I'm not there you can ask for them and you're going to get the same reasonable answer uh, as you're going to get from me so I can tell you that I've been here for 39 years and we have never had a time that we've had a, a better synergy like with, with Bob Shredders now with Allison and our police commission uh, communication between Jen and the finance department the town administrator 
first selected, both past and, past and present. To me, it could not be any of a, a better uh, mix. There's no, I, I, we, we work very, very well together. I think it shows. I got to give Jen kudos because I, as you folks know, I'm not a numbers guy, right? I balance my checkbook and I know enough about a budget that I can keep myself out of IRS jail. <laughs> she, she's, the one, she's the one that, you know, we have the discussion. She always has the right answer and the reasonable answer for us to craft a, a proper budget. And that way we don't have any trepidation when we come before this board. I mean, I think everything is reasonable, and I don't think there's anything out in left field. If there wasn't, we would have caught it by now. Just Jen would have caught it by now. Well, maybe just one question in closing. I know that over the last few years, there's been a couple different capital items that we've approved, like fixing things like the, the ventilation, the HVAC, I know, was always a headache there. Mm -hmm. have, things, have, have those projects been completed? Are, those, are you happy with them? Are they working? The Board of Finance meets Tuesday night. <laughs> Yes. I'll be yep. back in the seat on Tuesday night on HVAC issues. <laughs> Sorry to report. That's the end. Uh, I have more gray hair than I had last year at this time talking about HVAC issues, but no, it is not yet rectified. Good I will have Tony, Tony from uh, DPW will, will be with me to give you the ins and outs and the technical things of why we need additional funds now to, once again, attack the, H, the HVAC issues. We'll see you Tuesday. See you Tuesday. <laughs> well, no doubt what's been a difficult 24 hours for the community, no doubt is a difficult 24 hours for you and your force. And for your commitment to the town, you have our gratitude, and I'm, I'm sure I speak for the entire community. Thank you to all for what you do every day. Thank you very much. I will pass that along to our folks. And as we were saying earlier, right, the police department really is the only department that can't say no. I, that we're not coming? No, we're coming. And our guys and gals do a, a very good job on troubling situations and, and, and rendering the best assistance that we can to the public. So I appreciate you noting that for us. It's a tough assignment and a tough day today. So hopefully tomorrow will be a better day. Thanks, Chief. Okay. Thank you, folks. We'll see you on Tuesday. I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs> we'll pray for cool weather until then. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, they're all merit-based increases. Um, the library conducted a salary benchmarking study that you know helps us understand where we fall against our competitive landscape. And you know it says in their documents that they determined that a three percent sustained increase over the span of five years would prevent salaries from falling too far behind. Um, on a positive note, that health insurance and other insurance for these guys is only up four odd percent, which I wish we could say for the rest of our budget. Um, no COVID expenses are included. Um, let's see, friends, obviously friends are funding all capital investments. They fund all the books and capital improvements on the building. Um, we talk about, I guess, turnover I thought was interesting and Kara, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And uh, kind of as a part of like a follow-up question I have for you, I know we've reached out with a few questions, but you know, as far as turnover goes, 19 librarians have apparently left in the last five years, which is a turnover rate of 63%. Um, obviously, there's a cost to replacing them that we'd obviously we'd like to avoid. Um, I think my question to you is this: year, I mean, I understand the the benchmarking effort. Um, what percentage of our librarians received the three percent increase this year? Um, we call those our green circle individuals. Um, Percentage-wise, um, my math is not good enough to do that in my head. I would say about five or six librarians out of um, 60, or actually out of 30 full-time librarians, uh, received the 3%. So those were individuals in the current fiscal year who were identified as being below um, or underpaid. So only five or six received the full 3%, and everybody else was less? Everybody else was, um, could receive up to two in the current fiscal year. Okay, but the staffing, like the salary percentage was up over 3%. How does that work? For, for current fiscal year, um, it was 2%. So the vast majority of staff members in the current fiscal year this year could only receive up to 2%. There was a very small pool of people who we identified this year. Um, oh, that was last year's budget. Last year's right, budget, right. right. So, so projecting forward, um, I can get back to you on the specific numbers. I want to say that after we conducted the, and that was based on last year or the year before's benchmarking, with the updated information we have, um, I think we're looking at closer to about 15 to 16, maybe a little bit more uh, individuals who fall into that green circle pool. And you said out of 60, is that right? 34 full time. Yes. And, and how are those decisions made? Are those made just by you know, sort of the executive, like your, yourself and the team, or does the board get involved in those decisions? In terms of what percent, what, how much merit increase, um, yeah. that is really their first, primarily their direct supervisor and myself. Um, so it's really merit-based. You know, we're looking at job performance and performance against goals over that, the course of that year, um, and that really determines whether you're getting zero, one, two, or whatever, whatever the percentage is for that given year. So in next year's budget, um, if approved, Individuals will be eligible for up to up to three percent based on that performance. Um, obviously, you know it, we're also considering where they fall in terms of that benchmarking, but there still has to be performance. Um, so that's um, you and know, the two and three percent is that set by the board or? Is it, or no, that's that's set by what what we can get in our budget. So we're looking at you know um, like this this current fiscal year when we were building the budget last year, um, we were very conservative and we didn't really know what the climate was going to be coming in, and we thought you know what's the minimum percentage that'll keep us from falling too far behind, right? And and, and we decided okay, let's do two percent. Let's go in as lean and mean as we possibly can, um, and then. Then last summer, we conducted that updated benchmarking resource. We had a lot of new data from the Connecticut State um, Library Association, which we were able to refine that information. And that analysis showed that although our starting salaries for your entry-level librarian are um, sort of where they should be compared to our local peers, what happens is we fall behind after that five-year mark. So as that librarian progresses in their, in their career, especially with the first five years, most of our peer libraries um, are unionized, which means that you have people who are eligible for uh, cost of living adjustments, salary steps, um, other things of that nature. So what happens at year three, year four, year five especially, is where we're way behind. Um, that's also where we start. 
generally losing people um, is after that five-year mark. Um, so no, the board's not involved in that decision, but we, we craft the budget and, we, and we, it's really with the outlook of what's the minimum we need to maintain to stay competitive. Um, you know, where, where do we need to keep our people so that at that five-year mark um, and before we're, we're not falling, you know, well behind our peers in, you know, in Greenwich and in Westport and in Stanford and so on. Kara, what's happened to your pool of qualified replacements? Are you having trouble finding people? Um, we we have I think one or two open positions currently, but we're um, we've been lucky so far in being able to fill some you know most of the positions um, over the last few years of people that we've lost. Um, COVID I think has definitely like the, you know similar to what a lot of employers are going through. COVID I think has um, you know caused a lot of people to sort of reevaluate where they are and where they want to be and you know sort of think differently about life in general. So you know we've had retirements happen this year and things of that nature because of because of those shifts, um, but we are—we have a very strong rec reputation um, as being one of the very best libraries, not only as in the state or, but in the nation as well. And so we, we really take pride in what we do and the type of culture that we have at Darien Library. That's very unique um, among public libraries, and so we, we really um, are forward in that in terms of our recruitment. Both you, Kara, and, and uh, Taylor, <coughs> commented on the, on the cost of training people, training new people that you bring in and, and uh, the, the, the effort that that entails and so on. But, but there are companies that, uh, particularly large companies, that actually run their, their, their uh, employee pool by bringing them in, training them, keeping them for five years, and then sending them off to do something else. And then they bring in people at, um, at admittedly lower pay grades and trade them and they find that that's an economic trade-off that, that uh, makes sense for them. And are you doing anything like that? Or I mean, it sounds to me as if you're, you're as you say in your, in your presentation, which is a wonderful presentation, by the way, that, that uh, you're, you're very proud of the people that you've been able to send off and, and uh, off to greater things elsewhere. I mean, and we are. So the people that we, you know, graduate, so to speak, who, who leave us um, have gone on to do pretty amazing things, and, and we're very proud of that um, be, because they're out in the world sort of taking the dairy and library culture and spirit with them. Um, but <laughs> we would prefer to really retain these great individuals um, being a librarian, you know, especially you know when you're an entry level librarian, uh, most of the training, although you, you, it does require a master's degree and you learn a lot in school, it's really on the job training. And the longer you are doing the work day by day and getting to know the community and building relationships with the people in the community, with the families, with the children, um, that's really where the magic happens. And you sort of grow with the librarian. You know, you might be introduced to baby story time, and then you're in a teen program, and then they're helping you with you know your children and your grandkids. It's, it's really that lifelong um, sort of relationship and um, many of you who've been to Darien Library you know know some of our staff members um, who've been there 15 20 30 years um, and you know while we know turnover is inevitable and we're going to see people come and go and that's okay and creativity and innovation can happen with those changes um, we, we want to get the best people and, and we hope that they stay because they really enrich I think the whole town and the community um, you know, we, we really see ourselves as public servants. Um, we're helpers. We're, we're a helping profession, and we're really about those relationships and, and making a meaningful difference in the lives of residents. So, um, you know, having too much turnover every five or six years is might work for a big corporation, but it's not the kind of culture that we're really trying to build. In terms of staffing, you know, the overall level, you know, is sort of just over 3%, if you will, but within those subcategories, I think what you refer to as like the administrative mm -hmm. groups, yeah, there's fairly substantial and some and increases in other. Are those just shifting of people from one group to another? Yeah. And are those the same individuals just sort of repurposing their jobs, or did one leave and you hire a different person? Um, most of that. Um for, for this is is reorganizations. We've taken a look at some of it was COVID inspired. You know, we, we took a look at some departments which used to be separate departments, and we thought let's combine these two. Or you know, we really have a need um, for a programming librarian. So you know, they used to be in the the readers advisory doing you know um, book ordering and, and working with readers one on one. But we actually we need more people doing programs and events, and maybe we'll take that FT and move it over here, um, or our technology and unit UX department were separate entities, it made more sense to bring those together. So you see some of those shifts um, as a result of, of some of that strategic uh, reorganization. 
What about, you know, there's a fair amount of investment going on in the school. You know, we're building a new elementary school. We have three new, or three major renovations going on, a large piece of which is to kind of reimagine, redesign libraries to move into the, the 21st century and so forth. And then there's going to be three more school libraries that they're doing. Are you, do you view any sort of future reduction in the demand for your library services or change in the type of services that you need to deliver because of what what's going on at the at the elementary school libraries or, or I mean have you had discussions with the school about that um, you know I think I think it's wonderful that um, the town is investing in, in school libraries the function of school libraries and public libraries though are, are very different. Um, there's some crossover in terms of like we see those kids too um, in our spaces, but school libraries really exist primarily to to um, uh, support the curriculum in very specific ways um, and support the faculty and students in the development of their reading and their research um, literacy. Public libraries um, are really about developing a lifelong love of learning and reading, um, culture and arts programming, technology and skill building, sort of across a much wider spectrum. Um, when it comes to children in particular, the public library serves a role that's more about pleasure reading and reading for fun as opposed to reading for assignments and, and that very specific curriculum. Which both are important. <laughs> right. Well, it can be. But, both, but they're very different um, sort of purposes. Um, and, you know, obviously the public library at Darien Library is, you know, much more than your average, you know, or traditional, I should say, public library. Um, yes, we have books and yes, we love reading and literacy, but, you know, we're also a, a real community center in a very different way. You know, we're open to all from, from cradle to crane uh, to cane, you know, this idea that we're doing um, traditional things like author visits and book groups, but we're also, we host knitting clubs, we host um, Zoom events, we host how, how to, you know, code and learn coding, um, you name it, we, we do it, and we really view ourselves more as that community center as opposed to just books and reading. It's books and so much more. <laughs> okay. How many, how many book clubs do you have? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Dozens <laughs> at any given time. We have 128 registered book clubs who use our book club services, and then we run, um, I think, six book groups ourselves, um, in addition to the 128 patron-based book groups. So we have a, we have a lot of book groups. <laughs> I know it's oh sorry immaterial, but what happened with the life insurance number? That was up over 28 percent. I can double check. Um, I know that the dollar amount is relatively low. It's a little, it's about 4,200. Um, it might just be, um, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll check with our insurance agent. I can't enough. remember off the top of my head why that was so large. Um, yeah, it's about 4,200 um, and change a year. Um, we're with the Hartford. I can find out. Taylor, yeah, I think we can contrast that with the less than 5% increase in, in the medical. Medical and, right. and indeed the incredible bargain they got on their uh, snowplow truck. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I was just curious. Really. I know with the health insurance, um, we've also benefited just recently in, in having more singles than families, things like that. So you know that does ebb and flow, but we've we've sort of lucked out recently with a lot more singles than anticipated families. So. Um, and so is, is that helping to generate the lower overall number? Like if you look yes. at what you need to pay per employee, Ceteris Paribus, family, E plus one, or, or just E, is that up 4% or is the 4 I'm impressed with your language. <laughs> or, or is the, you know, what is the year over year employee or family increase versus what you're showing us here, the 4%? So our our health, if I'm understanding the correct uh, question. So correctly. Let me re-ask you. Yeah, yeah. What's happening to the individual cost of insuring a employee or a family year over year versus what we're seeing, which is the effect of maybe people moving from families to individual employees right. only? So overall, it's about an 8% increase, but because we've benefited from not as many pluses on our employees, not as many families, um, it's much lower. Okay. In the budget for next year, are you assuming the current staff stay in place, so the same number of single E plus one families? Um, that's how we budget, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And I guess just one other question um, I had was, you know, we had discussed, you know, last fall and there had been some discussion around creating actual formal grant agreement such that when we, when we give this $4 million grant, it would actually be legally written down what the grant's to be used for and even just include certain things as if there are excesses at the end of the year, what would happen with that <coughs> grant and so forth. And so I just want to, you know, Jen, do you know if, if somebody's taking the lead yet on? That would come out of the first selectman's office and the town administrator's office, and I don't know if they've had a chance to get started on it. Okay. I haven't heard anything, but obviously we're very, you know, open to the conversation and, and would love to talk more about it. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, to, to me, this is just more of a good housekeeping issue. I think we, when we look at sort of other grant relationships and so forth, even on the Board of Ed, they've taken things that have just historically been, um, say, a handshake or historical agreement, things like the use of the Y, and they've then formalized that in an actual contract that just sort of lays out. I, I feel like just for this size grant, it would be good to have um, a grant agreement in, in, in place. Absolutely. Maybe a last question. Are the Friends of the Library continuing to keep up their end of the bargain and to fund, their need, fund your needs? Yes, so um, every year the Friends, so the grant that we receive from the Town of Darien funds about 77% of our total annual operating budget and the Friends cover the remaining, um, that 23%. So that's through our annual campaign, um, donations to the annual campaign, it's through the revenues we get from several fundraising events that we do every year and also from um, an annual transfer that we make um, from our endowment. So that 23% covers primarily um, what Taylor was describing, the books, the, the technology in the library, all the programs that we do, all the events, all of the stuff <laughs> of a library. Um, in addition, about 20 percent of that friend's budget um, that we use um, to fund our operating budget every year, about 20 percent of that um, we do use to cover salaries and benefits for staff members who do fundraising or any related activities. Um, and as Taylor mentioned, um, the friends also fund any CapEx needs. So when we need to do HVAC or we need a new book sorting system or carpet replacement or whatever it might be, whether it's infrastructure, technology, um, they, they fund that, and that's been about 2.3 million over the last three years, and we're expecting um, 1.7 to 1.8 million in anticipated needs over the next five to eight years or so. But the plow truck is town. That was town, right, um, to offset um, or to eliminate a need for a plow service next year, which we're very grateful for, and thank you again for supporting us in that. Any other questions? The only uh, this maybe suggestion I would say is kind of going forward, I think it would be great if, um, you know, just kind of given the size of this grant and so forth, if you could maybe on a quarterly basis or a semi-annual basis, just keep, keep us updated on the major categories, like the top 10 different categories, how you're trending, you know, versus budget. Just, I think it's, it's helpful, you know, as we, as we fund this grant, you know, just to know if there's going to be a shortfall or a surplus. You know, all of that sort of helps us certainly on the surplus side as we think about money flowing back into the grand, the general fund that we can use to pump into next year's budget and, and or, or shortfalls. I think those would. Uh, Absolutely, I can even do that soon with the current yeah. year's budget Just and give you all an update. Work with Jen directly. Yeah. And we can incorporate that quarterly or so, or semi-annually into our discussions. Be happy to. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Okay, we'll move back to B, which is Fire and Emergency Services. Um, we have a few of the chiefs here. Um, appreciate you guys coming. Um, if you would have been here a couple minutes earlier, we would have uh, we would have kept you in order. But uh, so I, I think you know I'll kick things off on Fire and Emergency Services. Um, maybe just reminding everybody. I will say you know the, the largest portion of like the Fire and Emergency Services budget is is generally the capital. And this year, you know, there's a there's a handful of fire trucks um, that, that are coming up into the you know where their spot replacement cycle has has approached. And I think the uh, I think the tour we found very helpful. So thank you guys again for that. I think it was great to yeah. sort of it was great it, it, it was great to kind of see all that you do and how you do it and all the equipment that you have and care for it and so forth. And to really understand how you use some of it. Um, 
you know, maybe I'll start off by talking a little bit about the, um, the three different vehicles that we're talking about. Um, and just remind everybody, you know, historically we had contributed annually, you know, 500,000 or so to a vehicle replacement reserve. And I think, it, uh, I want to say three budget cycles ago, we decided we stopped making those contributions and drew down that balance to kind of finish up the the, uh, the handful of uh, the couple of vehicles that had been identified and were being funded for. And we moved towards considering <coughs> bonding for, for some of the fire trucks, particularly just given some of their some of their sheer costs. Um, so you know, in this year's budget, each of the fire departments have one vehicle. Darianne has a. Um, I can remember these from, from memory. Rescue 44, which is a sort of rescue truck equipment kind of truck. Um, that was originally anticipated to, to cost, you know, in the sort of $900,000 range. Um, in, in talking with the chief over the, you know, over the last few days, getting an update on where they are in terms of pricing and so forth, you know, that particular vehicle looks as though it's going to be considerably more expensive um, as they've kind of gotten further along in the design phase. And I think also reflecting just what's happening in the acquisition, just the overall cost in, of, of, of acquiring these, these, this apparatus and configuring it and so forth, the supply chain, there's a ton of reasons we've all been reading about. And now that's, that's looking to be significantly more expensive. Um, how much? The the estimate now is that that could be upwards of kind of 1.3 to 1.4 million, based on everything that they're seeing in terms of like the new pricing and so forth. And I think running through, let me just get my. So the next was um, this is going to test my knowledge here. Um, Neurotin has engine 32, right? That's correct. For all those that don't remember, Darien's truck start with four, Neroans with three, and Neroan Heights with two. It's <laughs> one of the things we all learned on the tour. Um, you know, they had a uh, they had a they had a truck identified which was anticipated to cost eight hundred, which we, we had budgeted eight hundred sixty one thousand into the budget, and Neroan Heights had engine twenty three, which was um, a similar amount, eight hundred sixty one thousand. So. I want to talk to everybody about like, the process by which fire trucks are designed, and certainly, you know, Zach, jump in here if I, if I miss misspeak on anything. But when uh, when a truck is identified, piece of, a large piece of equipment that needs to be replaced, there's generally an equipment schedule, replacement schedule for each truck, and it's identified based on its useful life of when they anticipate it needs to be replaced, and then there's then there's the sort of as they get closer to that day, they keep an eye on it and there's sort of large problems at the beginning to see with the truck, but it's not functioning right. They can either get a couple, might be to be replaced a couple years early, or if it's still functioning well, they can get a few more years out of it. But once they identify that a truck needs to be replaced, there's generally a, um, a committee formed within each fire department that'll actually sit down over a sort of three to six month period identify what the truck, what the need is for that truck, you know, identify sort of high level configuration of what the new truck would look like, whether it needs to be any major changes to the, to the type of truck that, do, that they're building, whether they um, need any new equipment on it, whether equipment can be sort of transferred from one truck to another. And they develop, I think, what, you know, what I learned a few weeks ago as I kind of call it the five or 10 page overview of, of the design specs of what they think each truck is going to be. And that's usually where they're coming up with an estimate of um, that they've provided in the budget in terms of what they think that's going to be. When they know that the town is going to support a new truck, that committee then begins to work with one or two or, th or three suppliers to develop, I guess what I call the 100 page set of specifications. And that's detailing everything right down to the type of tire, electric, light bulbs, everything that sort of that needs to be in that truck to um, you know to, to, to meet their needs and 
you know, I, I think the way I think Zach and others and Scott have explained it is the those manufacturers are, are willing and work with us to kind of put together that large hundred page I, set of specs because they know that the, that, the, that the fire departments have an appropriation and that they're going to be moving forward with the truck. And then that's when they get a much better estimate of exactly what that um, what those trucks would be, and then they put it out to bid to one, two, three, four different um, entities which come back, build them, we sign a contract. And then from a funding standpoint, there's a relatively small amount due at the time you place the order, and the majority of it is due <coughs> ultimately when the truck is delivered. So I think you know, in, in talking with the fire departments, each each of these trucks on the on this year's budget schedule is in a I think is in a different state of identifying the need, creating a committee that that sort of fire department committee building out their ten page set of specs and coming up with a cost estimate, and then moving forward into the working with a, a set of manufacturers to develop a hundred page set of specs. So I think on the, if, if I was to, to, to characterize this right, I think Rescue 44 for Darian seems to be very far along in that process. And that they've, they have a committee in place and they're working towards a much more, and they've identified I think the full needs of what that truck is. I think um, Neuro, and I'm waiting for an update from for some of the chiefs, is in the very beginning stages, I think, of, of creating the committee. They've identified the need to replace uh, 32. Committee's in place. We, 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 uh, I apologize if we get you an update today. Sorry. Committee's in place. We've had a few meetings, or had a meeting, uh, but I will have an update for you on timeline in the next few days. Okay. And then I think Neuro Heights, I think, is, you know, in the middle where they've identified the need, they've had the committee, leave right, Zach? So just to, to back up, you know, the committee doesn't necessarily meet when there's an appropriate need for that at that time. They need to decide, you know, can we salvage what we have on the truck, like you said before, you know, the chassis, the body, the equipment that we carry, so on and so forth. We, we've passed that process quite a bit. We're actually probably closer to where Darian's at. Um, today I've been reviewing some drawings from one of the vendors that was able to get some stuff back to us this time. Um, you know, I provided you with the cost that we kind of ballparked it at with prior to any um, increases to the metal such materials. Um, the only correction I would say at this point is that we're, we're pretty far along the process. Our committee's met, we have drawings, we have, we know what the truck's going to look like. And, we know what the need is for our district, and that's all things that the, the committee has met and discussed at this point. So um, really, we, we know that the truck that we have currently in 23, it's a 1989, uh, we purchased it in 2005. It was refurbished for our use in 2006 is when we took delivery of it, and it, it shows signs that it's, it's time. This was what we bought used. This is the one we bought used from uh, FBMI. Uh, it was used as a training rig. Um, served us pretty well. You know, our district has kind of changed quite a bit. You know, if you just take a look at Heights Roads projects, what's going on down there with the apartments and such. The committee's discussed that pretty in depth of, of what this truck needs to look like, what the truck needs to do um, to meet those needs, not only those needs, but of Northern Darien where it's mostly residential. Um, so we, we know what the truck looks like. We have a ballpark estimate of what it's going to cost at this point, and uh, we're waiting to move forward once uh, you know the town moves forward on their end as well. So. And I think that so the next steps for you know, for truck the replacement of truck 23 would be when you have an appropriation, then bringing that out to the manufacturers and working towards what I call the hundred page set Absolutely. of specifications. Yeah, it's a couple hundred pages, and it really defines everything in there from the wiring type, you know, the gauge of the wire. From one end of the truck to the other, it, it defines everything that needs to go into the build. Okay, so so I think you know, in trying to think through these resolutions here, particularly given you know some of the information we um, received back on on the Darien truck, just in terms of the numbers that we have in here, like for instance, like twenty three and thirty two, we have the identical number 
in here. So given that the expectation for these more expensive trucks or that we're likely going to be considering bonding, um, you know, there's one of the things to consider is whether or not the the actual approval of the bonding resolution, because we're not going to issue the bonds. When, when we issue the bond resolution, it's that's going to allow the fire department to go forward and develop the full 100, 200 page detailed plans. They'll have to bid it out and ultimately sign a contract and that process can take six months. It all depends on the vendor. The build process was the question? The build process. To build the full set of specifications, oh. which are then sent Six out to the, yeah. to the various manufacturers and solicited, solicited the bids, and ultimately have that awarded. I mean, that's fair. That's a that's another somewhat lengthy process. Yeah. And so, when when you think through that, and even once you sign the contract, generally we're not going to go to bond the for the fire truck until you know we know if we're doing one to two bond issues a year until we know that the actual we're getting close to the delivery date or in some instances we would pay for it out of the 